by Homer, the Iliad. The fourth battle continued in which Neptune assists the Greeks. The acts of Idomeneus, Neptune, concerned for the loss of the Grecians, upon seeing the fortification forced by Hector, who had entered the gate near the station of the Ajaces, assumes the shape of Colchis and inspires those heroes to oppose him. Then, in the form of one of the generals, encourages the other Greeks who had retired to their vessels. The Ajaces form their troops in a close phalanx, and put a stop to Hector and the Trojans. Several deeds of valor are performed. Meriones, losing his spear in the encounter, repairs to seek another at the tent of Idomeneus. This occasions a conversation between those two warriors, who return together to the battle. Idomeneus signalizes his courage above the rest. He kills Othryoneus, Oseus, and Alcathous. Deiphobus and Aeneas march against him, and at length Idomeneus retires. Menelaus wounds Helenus and kills Pisander. The Trojans are repulsed on the left wing. Hector still keeps his ground against the Ajaces, till, being galled by the Locrians, slingers and archers, Polydamus advises to call a council of war. Hector approves of his advice, but goes first to rally the Trojans, upbraids Paris, rejoins Polydamus, meets Ajax again, and renews the attack. The eight and twentieth day still continues. The scene is between the Grecian Wall and the seashore. When now the thunderer on the sea-beat coast had fixed great Hector and his conquering host, he left them to the fates, in bloody fray to toil and struggle through the well-fought day, then turned to Thracia from the field of fight those eyes that shed insufferable light, to where the Mycenaeans prove their martial force, and hardy Thracians tame the savage horse, and where the far-famed Hippomogion strays, renowned for justice and for length of days, Thrice happy race, that innocent of blood, from milk, innoxious, seek their simple food. Jove sees delighted, and avoids the scene of guilty Troy, of arms and dying men. No aid, he deems, to either host is given, while his high law suspends the powers of heaven. Meantime the monarch of the watery main observed the thunderer, nor observed in vain. In Samothracia, on a mountain's brow, whose waving woods o'erhung the deeps below, he sat, and round him cast his azure eyes where Ida's misty tops confusedly rise. Below, fair Ilion's glittering spires were seen, the crowded ships and sable seas between. There, from the crystal chambers of the main emerged, he sat and mourned his Argive slain. At Jove incensed, with grief and fury stung, prone down the rocky steep he rushed along. Fierce as he passed, the lofty mountains nod, the forest shakes, earth trembled as he trod, and felt the footsteps of the immortal god. From realm to realm three ample strides he took, and at the fourth the distant Aegy shook. Far in the bay his shining palace stands, eternal frame not raised by mortal hands. This having reached, his brass-hoofed steeds he reins, fleet as the winds, and decked with golden manes. Refulgent arms his mighty limbs enfold, immortal arms of adamant and gold. He mounts the car, the golden scourge applies, he sits superior, and the chariot flies, his whirling wheels the glassy surface sweep. The enormous monsters rolling o'er the deep gambol around him on the watery way, and heavy whales in awkward measures play. The sea subsiding spreads a level plain, exults, and owns the monarch of the main. The parting waves before his coursers fly, the wandering waters leave his axle dry. Deep in the liquid regions lies a cave, between where Tenedos the surges lave, and rocky Imbrus breaks the rolling wave. There the great ruler of the azure round stopped his swift chariot and his steeds unbound fed with ambrosial herbage from his hand, and linked their fetlocks with a golden band, infrangible, immortal. There they stay. The father of the floods pursues his way, where, like a tempest darkening heaven around, or fiery deluge that devours the ground, the impatient Trojans, in a gloomy throng, embattled rolled as Hector rushed along. To the loud tumult and the barbarous cry the heavens re-echo, and the shores reply. They vow destruction to the Grecian name, and in their hopes the fleets already flame. But Neptune, rising from the seas profound, the god whose earthquakes rock the solid ground, 
now wears a mortal form, like Calchas seen, such his loud voice and such his manly mien. His shouts incessant every Greek inspire, but most the Ajaces, adding fire to fire. Tis yours, O warriors, all our hopes to raise. O oh, recollect your ancient worth and praise. Tis yours to save us, if you cease to fear. Flight, more than shameful, is destructive here. On other works, though Troy with fury fall, and pour her armies o'er our battered wall, there Greece has strength. But this, this part o'erthrown, her strength were vain. I dread for you alone. Here Hector rages like the force of fire, vaunts of his gods, and calls high Jove his sire. If yet some heavenly power your breast excite, breathe in your hearts and string your arms to fight, Greece yet may live, her threatened fleet maintain, and Hector's force and Jove's own aid be vain. Then with his scepter that the deep controls, he touched the chiefs and steeled their manly souls. Strength not their own, the touch divine imparts, prompts their light limbs and swells their daring hearts. Then as a falcon from the rocky height, her query seen, impetuous at the sight, forth springing instant, darts herself from high, shoots on the wing, and skims along the sky. Such, and so swift, the power of ocean flew. The wide horizon shut him from their view. The inspiring god Oileus, active son, perceived the first, and thus to Telamon. Some god, my friend, some god in human form, favoring descends, and wills to stand the storm. Not Calchas this, the venerable seer. Short as he turned, I saw the power appear. I marked his parting and the steps he trod. His own bright evidence reveals a god. Even now some energy divine I share, and seem to walk on wings and tread in air. With equal ardor, Telamon returns, my soul is kindled and my bosom burns. New rising spirits all my force alarm, lift each impatient limb and brace my arm. This ready arm, unthinking, shakes the dart. The blood pours back and fortifies my heart. Singly, methinks, yon towering chief I meet, and stretch the dreadful Hector at my feet. Full of the god that urged their burning breast, the heroes thus their mutual warmth expressed. Neptune, meanwhile, the routed Greeks inspired, who, breathless, pale, with length of labors tired, pant in the ships, while Troy to conquest calls, and swarms victorious o'er their yielding walls. Trembling before the impending storm they lie, while tears of rage stand burning in their eye. Greece sunk, they thought, and this their fatal hour, but breathe new courage as they feel the power. Teucer and Laetus first his words excite, then stern Peneleus rises to the fight. Thoas, Deipyrus, in arms renowned, and Merion next, the impulsive fury found. Last, Nestor's son the same bold ardor takes, while thus the god, the martial fire awakes. O oh, lasting infamy! O oh, dire disgrace to chiefs of vigorous youth and manly race! I trusted in the gods and you to see you brave Greece victorious and her navy free. Ah, no! The glorious combat you disclaim, and one black day clouds all her former fame. Heavens, what a prodigy these eyes survey! Unseen, unthought, till this amazing day! Fly we at length from Troy's oft-conquered bands? And falls our fleet by such inglorious hands? A rout undisciplined, a straggling train, Not born to glories of the dusty plain. Like frighted fawns, from hill to hill pursued, A prey to every savage of the wood. Shall these, so late who trembled at your name, Invade your camps, involve your ships in flame? A change so shameful, say, what cause has wrought? The soldier's baseness, or the general's fault? Fools, will ye perish for your leader's vice, the purchase infamy, and life the price? Tis not your cause, Achilles' injured fame. Another's is the crime, but yours the shame. Grant that our chief offend through rage or lust. Must you be cowards if your king's unjust? Prevent this evil, and your country save. Small thought retrieves the spirits of the brave. Think and subdue. On dastards dead to fame I waste no anger, for they feel no shame. But you, the pride, the flower of all our host, my heart weeps blood to see your glory lost. Nor deem this day, this battle, all you lose. A day more black, a fate more vile ensues. Let each reflect who prizes fame or breath 
on endless infamy, on instant death. For lo, the fated time, the appointed shore. Hark, the gates burst, the brazen barriers roar. Impetuous Hector thunders at the wall, the hour, the spot, to conquer or to fall. These words the Grecians' fainting hearts inspire, and listening armies catch the godlike fire. Fixed at his post was each bold Ajax found, with well-ranged squadrons strongly circled round. So close their order, so disposed their fight, as Pallas' self might view with fixed delight. Or had the god of war inclined his eyes, the god of war had owned a just surprise. A chosen phalanx, firm, resolved as fate, descending Hector and his battle weight. An iron scene gleams dreadful o'er the fields, armor in armor locked, and shields in shields. Spears lean on spears, on targets targets throng, helms stuck to helms, and man drove man along. The floating plumes unnumbered wave above, as when an earthquake stirs the nodding grove, and leveled at the skies, with pointing rays, their brandished lances at each motion blaze. Thus breathing death, in terrible array, the close compacted legions urged their way. Fierce they drove on, impatient to destroy. Troy charged the first, and Hector first of Troy. As from some mountain's craggy forehead torn, a rock's round fragment flies, with fury borne, which from the stubborn stone a torrent rends, precipitate the ponderous mass descends. From steep to steep the rolling ruin bounds, At every shock the crackling wood resounds, Still gathering force it smokes, And urged amain whirls, leaps, and thunders down, Impetuous to the plain. There stops. So Hector. Their whole force he proved, Resistless when he raged, And when he stopped, unmoved. On him the war is bent, The darts are shed, And all their falchions wave around his head. Repulsed he stands, nor from his stand retires, but with repeated shouts his army fires. Trojans, be firm! This arm shall make your way through yon square body and that black array. Stand, and my spear shall rout their scattering power, strong as they seem, embattled like a tower. For he that Juno's heavenly bosom warms, the first of gods, this day inspires our arms. He said, and roused the soul in every breast. Urged with desire of fame beyond the rest, forth marched Deiphobus, but, marching, held before his wary steps his ample shield. Bold Morion aimed a stroke, nor aimed it wide. The glittering javelin pierced the tough bullhide, but pierced not through. Unfaithful to his hand, the point broke short, and sparkled in the sand. The Trojan warrior, touched with timely fear, on the raised orb to distance bore the spear. The Greek, retreating, mourned his frustrate blow, and cursed the treacherous lance that spared a foe. Then to the ships with surly speed he went, to seek a surer javelin in his tent. Meanwhile with rising rage the battle glows, the tumult thickens, and the clamor grows. By Teucer's arm the warlike Imbrius bleeds, the son of Mentor, rich in generous steeds. Ere yet to Troy the sons of Greece were led, in fair Pedias' verdant pastures bred, the youth had dwelt, remote from war's alarms, and blessed in bright Medesicastes arms. This nymph, the fruit of Priam's ravished joy, allied the warrior to the house of Troy. To Troy, when glory called his arms, he came, and matched the bravest of her chiefs in fame. With Priam's sons, a guardian of the throne, he lived, beloved, and honored as his own. Him Teucer pierced between the throat and ear. He groans beneath the Telamonian spear. As from some far-seen mountain's airy crown, subdued by steel, a tall ash tumbles down, and soils its verdant tresses on the ground, so falls the youth, his arms the fall resound. Then Teucer rushing to despoil the dead, from Hector's hand a shining javelin fled. He saw, and shunned the death. The forceful dart sung on, and pierced Amphimachus's heart, Teatus' son, of Neptune's forceful line. Vain was his courage and his race divine. Prostrate he falls, his clanging arms resound, and his broad buckler thunders on the ground. To seize his beamy helm the victor flies, and just had fastened on the dazzling prize, when Ajax' manly arm a javelin flung. Full on the shield's round boss the weapon rung. 
He felt the shock, nor more was doomed to feel, secure in mail and sheathed in shining steel. Repulsed, he yields. The victor Greeks obtain the spoils contested and bear off the slain. Between the leaders of the Athenian line, Stichius the brave, Menestheus the divine, deplored Amphimachus, sad object, lies. Imbrius remains the fierce Ajaces' prize. As two grim lions bear across the lawn, snatched from devouring hounds a slaughtered fawn. In their fell jaws high lifting through the wood and sprinkling all the shrubs with drops of blood, so these the chief. Great Ajax from the dead strips his bright arms, O Ilius lops his head. Tossed like a ball and whirled in air away, at Hector's feet the gory visage lay. The god of ocean, fired with stern disdain and pierced with sorrow for his grandson slain, inspires the Grecian hearts, confirms their hands, and breathes destruction on the Trojan bands. Swift as a whirlwind rushing to the fleet, he finds the lance-famed Idomen of Crete, his pensive brow the generous care expressed with which a wounded soldier touched his breast, whom in the chance of war a javelin tore, and his sad comrades from the battle bore. Him to the surgeons of the camp he sent. That office paid, he issued from his tent fierce for the fight, to whom the god begun, in Thoas' voice, Andreman's valiant son, who ruled where Calidon's white rocks arise, and Pleuron's chalky cliffs emblaze the skies. Where's now the imperious vaunt, the daring boast, of Greece victorious, and proud Aelian lost? To whom the king. On Greece no blame be thrown, arms are her trade, and war is all her own. Her hardy heroes from the well-fought plains nor fear withholds, nor shameful sloth detains. Tis heaven, alas, and Jove's all-powerful doom, that far, far distant from our native home, wills us to fall inglorious. O oh, my friend, once foremost in the fight, still prone to lend or arms or counsels, now perform thy best, and what thou canst not singly urge the rest. Thus he, and thus the god whose force can make the solid globe's eternal basis shake. Ah, never may he see his native land, but feed the vultures on this hateful strand, who seeks ignobly in his ships to stay, nor dares to combat on this signal day. For this, behold, in horrid arms I shine, and urge thy soul to rival acts with mine. Together let us battle on the plain, two not the worst, nor even this succor vain. Not vain the weakest, if their force unite, but ours the bravest have confessed in fight. This said, he rushes where the combat burns, swift to his tent the Cretan king returns. From thence, two javelins glittering in his hand, and clad in arms that lightened all the strand, fierce on the foe the impetuous hero drove, like lightning bursting from the arm of Jove, which to pale man the wrath of heaven declares, or terrifies the offending world with wars. In streamy sparkles, kindling all the skies, from pole to pole the trail of glory flies. Thus his bright armor o'er the dazzled throng gleamed dreadful as the monarch flashed along. Him, near his tent, Meriones attends, whom thus he questions. Ever best of friends, O oh say, in every art of battle skilled, what holds thy courage from so brave a field? On some important message art thou bound? Or bleeds my friend by some unhappy wound? Inglorious here my soul abhors to stay, and glows with prospects of the approaching day. O prince, Meriones replies, whose care leads forth the embattled sons of Crete to war, this speaks my grief, this headless lance I wield, the rest lies rooted in a Trojan shield. To whom the Cretan, enter, and receive the wonted weapons, those my tent can give, spears I have store, and Trojan lances all, that shed a luster round the illumined wall. Though I, disdainful of the distant war, nor trust the dart, nor aim the uncertain spear, yet hand to hand I fight, and spoil the slain, and thence these trophies, and these arms I gain. Enter, and see on heaps the helmets rolled, and high-hung spears, and shields that flame with gold. Nor vain, said Morion, are our martial toils. We too can boast of no ignoble spoils, but those my ship contains. Whence distant far, I fight conspicuous in the van of war. What need I more? If any Greek there be who knows not Morion, I appeal to thee. To this, Idomeneus, the fields of fight have proved thy valor, and unconquered might. 
and were some ambush for the foes designed, even there thy courage would not lag behind. In that sharp service, singled from the rest, the fear of each, or valor, stands confessed. No force, no firmness, the pale coward shows. He shifts his place, his color comes and goes. A dropping sweat creeps cold on every part. Against his bosom beats his quivering heart. Terror and death in his wild eyeballs stare. With chattering teeth he stands, and stiffening hair, and looks a bloodless image of despair. Not so the brave, still dauntless, still the same, unchanged his color and unmoved his frame. Composed his thought, determined is his eye, and fixed his soul, to conquer or to die. If aught disturb the tenor of his breast, tis but the wish to strike before the rest. In such essays thy blameless worth is known, and every art of dangerous war thy own. By chance of fight, whatever wounds you bore, those wounds were glorious all, and all before. Such as may teach, t'was still thy brave delight to oppose thy bosom where thy foremost fight. But why, like infants, cold to honor's charms, stand we to talk when glory calls to arms? Go, from my conquered spears the choicest take, and to their owners send them nobly back. Swift at the word, bold Morion snatched a spear, and breathing slaughter followed to the war. So Mars Armipotent invades the plain, the wide destroyer of the race of man. Terror, his best beloved son, attends his course, armed with stern boldness and enormous force, the pride of haughty warriors to confound and lay the strength of tyrants on the ground. From Thrace they fly, called to the dire alarms of warring phlegians and ephorian arms invoked by both relentless they dispose to these glad conquest murderous rout to those so marched the leaders of the cretan train and their bright arms shot horror o'er the plain then first spake morion shall we join the right or combat in the centre of the fight or to the left our wonted succor lend hazard and fame all parts alike attend not in the center, Idomen replied, our ablest chieftains the main battle guide. Each godlike Ajax makes that post his care, and gallant Teucer deals destruction there, skilled or with shafts to gall the distant field, or bear close battle on the sounding shield. These can the rage of haughty Hector tame. Safe in their arms the navy fears no flame, till Jove himself descends, his bolts to shed, and hurl the blazing ruin at our head. Great must he be, of more than human birth, nor feed like mortals on the fruits of earth. Him neither rocks can crush, nor steel can wound, whom Ajax fells not on the ensanguined ground. In standing fight he mates Achilles' force, excelled alone in swiftness in the course. Then to the left our ready arms apply, and live with glory, or with glory die. He said, and Merion to the appointed place, fierce as the god of battles, urged his pace. Soon as the foe the shining chiefs beheld rush like a fiery torrent o'er the field, their force embodied in a tide they pour. The rising combat sounds along the shore. As warring winds in serious sultry rain from different quarters sweep the sandy plain, on every side the dusty whirlwinds rise, and the dry fields are lifted to the skies. Thus by despair, hope, rage, together driven, met the black hosts, and, meeting, darkened heaven. All dreadful glared the iron face of war, bristled with upright spears that flashed afar. Dire was the gleam of breastplates, helms, and shields, and polished arms emblazed the flaming fields. Tremendous scene, that general horror gave, but touched with joy the bosoms of the brave. Saturn's great sons in fierce contention vied, and crowds of heroes in their anger died. The sire of earth and heaven, by Thetis won to crown with glory Peleus' godlike son, willed not destruction to the Grecian powers, but spared a while the destined Trojan towers, while Neptune, rising from his azure main, warred on the king of heaven with stern disdain, and breathed revenge, and fired the Grecian train. Gods of one source, of one ethereal race, alike divine, and heaven their native place. But Jove the greater, first born of the skies, and more than men, or gods, supremely wise. For this, of Jove's superior might afraid, Neptune in human form concealed his aid. 
These powers enfold the Greek and Trojan train in war and discord's adamantine chain, indissolubly strong. The fatal tie is stretched on both, and close compelled they die. Dreadful in arms, and grown in combats gray, the bold Idomeneus controls the day. First by his hand Othryoneus was slain, swelled with false hopes, with mad ambition vain. Called by the voice of war to martial fame, from high Cabesus distant walls he came. Cassandra's love he sought, with boasts of power, and promised conquest was the proffered dower. The king consented, by his vaunts abused. The king consented, but the fates refused. Proud of himself and of the imagined bride, the field he measured with a larger stride. Him as he stalked, the Cretan javelin found. Vain was his breastplate to repel the wound. His dream of glory lost, he plunged to hell. His arms resounded as the boaster fell. The great Idomeneus bestrides the dead. And thus he cries, Behold thy promise sped! Such is the help thy arms to Ilion bring, and such the contract of the Phrygian king. Our offers now, illustrious prince, receive. For such an aid what will not Argos give? To conquer Troy, with ours thy forces join, and count Atrides' fairest daughter thine. Meantime, on further methods to advise, come, follow to the fleet thy new allies. There hear what Greece has on her part to say. He spoke and dragged the gory course away. This Asius viewed, unable to contain, before his chariot warring on the plain. His crowded coursers to his squire consigned, impatient panted on his neck behind. To vengeance rising with a sudden spring, he hoped the conquest of the Cretan king. The wary Cretan, as his foe drew near, full on his throat discharged the forceful spear. Beneath the chin the point was seen to glide, and glittered extant at the further side. As when the mountain oak, or poplar tall, or pine, fit mast for some great admiral, groans to the oft-heaved axe with many a wound, then spreads a length of ruin o'er the ground, so sunk proud Asius in that dreadful day, and stretched before his much-loved coursers lay. He grinds the dust, disdained with streaming gore, and, fierce in death, lies foaming on the shore. Deprived of motion, stiff with stupid fear, stands all aghast his trembling charioteer, nor shuns the foe, nor turns the steeds away, but falls transfixed, an unresisting prey. Pierced by Antilochus, he pants beneath the stately car, and labors out his breath. Thus Asius steeds, their mighty master gone, remain the prize of Nestor's youthful son. Stabbed at the sight, Deiphobus drew nigh, and made with force the vengeful weapon fly. The Cretan saw, and stooping, caused to glance from his slope shield the disappointed lance. Beneath the spacious targe, a blazing round, thick with bull-hides and brazen orbits bound, on his raised arm by two strong braces stayed, he lay collected in defensive shade. O'er his safe head the javelin idly sung, and on the tinkling verge more faintly rung. Even then the spear the vigorous arm confessed, and pierced, obliquely, King Hepsinor's breast. Warmed in his liver, to the ground it bore the chief, his people's guardian now no more. Not unattended! the proud Trojan cries, nor unrevenged lamented Asius lies, for thee through hell's black portals stand displayed, this mate shall joy thy melancholy shade. Heart's piercing anguish at the haughty boast touched every Greek, but Nestor's son the most. Grieved as he was, his pious arms attend, and his broad buckler shields his slaughtered friend, till sad Mesistius and Alastor bore his honored body to the tented shore. Nor yet from fight Idomeneus withdraws, Resolved to perish in his country's cause, Or find some foe, whom heaven and he shall doom To wail his fate in death's eternal gloom. He sees Alcathous in the front aspire, Great Esaites was the hero's sire, His spouse Epodemia divinely fair, Anchises' eldest hope and darling care, Who charmed her parents and her husband's heart With beauty, sense, and every work of art. He once of Ilion's youth the loveliest boy, the fairest she of all the fair of Troy. By Neptune now the hapless hero dies, who covers with a cloud those beauteous eyes, and fetters every limb. 
yet bent to meet his fate he stands nor shuns the lance of crete fixed as some column or deep-rooted oak while the winds sleep his breast received the stroke before the ponderous stroke his corslet yields long used toward the death in fighting fields the riven armor sends a jarring sound his laboring heart heaves with so strong a bound the long lance shakes and vibrates in the wound fast flowing from its source as prone he lay life's purple tide impetuous gushed away then idomen insulting o'er the slain behold deiphobus nor vaunt in vain see on one greek three trojan ghosts attend this my third victim to the shades i send approaching now thy boasted might approve and try the prowess of the seed of jove from jove enamoured of a mortal dame great minos guardian of his country came deucalion blameless prince was minos heir his first-born i the third from jupiter o'er spacious crete and her bold sons i reign and thence my ships transport me through the main lord of a host o'er all my host i shine a scourge to thee thy father and thy line the trojan heard uncertain or to meet alone with venturous arms the king of crete or seek auxiliar force at length decreed to call some hero to partake the deed forthwith aeneas rises to his thought for him in troy's remotest lines he sought where he incensed at partial priam stands and sees superior posts in meaner hands to him ambitious of so great an aid the bold deiphobus approached and said now trojan prince employ thy pious arms if e'er thy bosom felt fair honour's charms all cathois dies thy brother and thy friend come and the warrior's loved remains defend beneath his cares thy early youth was trained one table fed you and one roof contained this deed to fierce idomeneus we owe haste and revenge it on the insulting foe aeneas heard and for a space resigned to tender pity all his manly mind then rising in his rage he burns to fight the greek awaits him with collected might as the fell boar on some rough mountain's head armed with wild terrors and to slaughter bred when the loud rustics rise and shout from far attends the tumult and expects the war or his bent back the bristly horrors rise fires stream in lightning from his sanguine eyes his foaming tusks both dogs and men engage but most his hunters rouse his mighty rage so stood idomeneus his javelin shook and met the trojan with a lowering look antilochus deiperus were near the youthful offspring of the god of war merion and apharius in field renowned to these the warrior sent his voice around fellows in arms your timely aid unite lo great aeneas rushes to the fight sprung from a god and more than mortal bold he fresh in youth and i in arms grown old else should this hand this hour decide the strife the great dispute of glory or of life he spoke and all as with one soul obeyed their lifted bucklers cast a dreadful shade around the chief aeneas too demands the assisting forces of his native bands paris deiphobus agenor join co-aids and captains of the trojan line in order follow all the embodied train like ida's flocks proceeding o'er the plain before his fleecy care erect and bold stalks the proud ram the father of the bold with joy the swain surveys them as he leads to the cool fountains through the well-known meads so joys aeneas as his native band moves on in rank and stretches o'er the land round dread alcathous now the battle rose on every side the steely circle grows now battered breastplates and hacked helmets ring and o'er their heads unheeded javelins sing above the rest two towering chiefs appear there great idomeneus aeneas here like gods of war dispensing fate they stood and burned to drench the ground with mutual blood the trojan weapon whizzed along in air the cretin saw and shunned the brazen spear sent from an arm so strong the missive wood stuck deep in earth and quivered where it stood but enomaeus received the cretin stroke the forceful spear his hollow corslet broke it ripped his belly with a ghastly wound and rolled the smoking entrails on the ground 
Stretched on the plain, he sobs away his breath, and, furious, grasps the bloody dust in death. The victor from his breast the weapon tears. His spoils he could not for the shower of spears. Though now unfit an active war to wage, heavy with cumbrous arms, stiff with cold age, his listless limbs unable for the course, in standing fight he yet maintains his force. Till faint with labor and by foes repelled, his tired slow steps he drags from off the field. Deiphobus beheld him as he passed, and, fired with hate, a parting javelin cast. The javelin erred, but held its course along, and pierced Ascalaphus, the brave and young. The son of Mars fell gasping on the ground, and gnashed the dust, all bloody with his wound. Nor knew the furious father of his fall. High throned amidst the great Olympian hall, on golden clouds the immortal synod sate, detained from bloody war by Jove and fate. Now where in dust the breathless hero lay, for slain Ascalaphus commenced the fray. Deiphobus, to seize his helmet, flies, and from his temples rends the glittering prize. Valiant as Mars, Meriones drew near, and on his loaded arm discharged his spear. He drops the weight, disabled with the pain. The hollow helmet rings against the plain. Swift as a vulture leaping on his prey, from his torn arm the Grecian rent away the reeking javelin, and rejoined his friends. His wounded brother good Polites tends. Around his waist his pious arms he threw, and from the rage of battle gently drew. Him his swift coursers on his splendid car, wrapped from the lessening thunder of the war. To Troy they drove him, groaning from the shore, and sprinkling, as he passed, the sands with gore. Meanwhile fresh slaughter bathes the sanguine ground. Heaps fall on heaps, and heaven and earth resound. Bold Afarius by great Aeneas bled. As toward the chief he turned his daring head, he pierced his throat. The bending head, depressed beneath his helmet, nods upon his breast. His shield reversed o'er the fallen warrior lies, and everlasting slumber seals his eyes. Antilochus, as Thoan turned him round, transpierced his back with a dishonest wound. The hollow vein that to the neck extends along the chin his eager javelin rends. Supine he falls, and to his social train spreads his imploring arms, but spreads in vain. The exulting victor, leaping where he lay, from his broad shoulders tore the spoils away. His time observed, foreclosed by foes around, on all sides thick the peals of arms resound. His shield embossed the ringing storm sustains, but he impervious and untouched remains. Great Neptune's care preserved from hostile rage this youth, the joy of Nestor's glorious age. In arms intrepid, with the first he fought, faced every foe and every danger sought. His winged lance, resistless as the wind, obeys each motion of the master's mind. Restless it flies, impatient to be free, and meditates the distant enemy. The son of Asius, Adamus, drew near, and struck his target with the brazen spear fierce in his front. But Neptune wards the blow and blunts the javelin of the eluded foe. In the broad buckler half the weapon stood, splintered on earth flew half the broken wood. Disarmed, he mingled in the Trojan crew, but Merion's spear o'ertook him as he flew. Deep in the belly's rim an entrance found, where sharp the pang, and mortal is the wound. Bending he fell, and doubled to the ground lay panting. Thus an ox in fetters tied, while death's strong pangs distend his laboring side, his bulk enormous on the field displays. His heaving heart beats thick as ebbing life decays. The spear the conqueror from his body drew, and death's dim shadows swarm before his view. Next brave Deipyrus in dust was laid. King Helenus waved high the Thracian blade, and smote his temples with an arm so strong the helm fell off and rolled amid the throng. There for some luckier Greek it rests surprise, for dark in death the godlike owner lies. Raging with grief, Great Menelaus burns, and fraught with vengeance to the victor turns, that shook the ponderous lance in act to throw, and this stood adverse with the bended bow. Full on his breast the Trojan arrow fell, but harmless bounded from the plated steel. As on some ample barn's well-hardened floor, the winds collected at each open door, while the broad fan with force is whirled around, light leaps the golden grain, resulting from the ground. 
So from the steel that guards Atrides' heart, repelled to distance, flies the bounding dart. Atrides, watchful of the unwary foe, pierced with his lance the hand that grasped the bow, and nailed it to the yew. The wounded hand trailed the long lance that marked with blood the sand. But good Agenor gently from the wound the spear solicits, and the bandage bound. A sling's soft wool, snatched from a soldier's side, at once the tent and ligature supplied. Behold, Pisander, urged by fate's decree, springs through the ranks to fall, and fall by thee, great Menelaus, to enhance thy fame. High towering in the front the warrior came. First the sharp lance was by Atrides thrown, the lance far distant by the winds was blown. Nor pierced Pisander through Atrides' shield, Pisander's spear fell shivered on the field. Not so discouraged, to the future blind, vain dreams of conquest swell his haughty mind. Dauntless he rushes where the Spartan lord like lightning brandished his far-beaming sword. His left arm high opposed the shining shield, his right beneath the covered pole-axe held. An olive's cloudy grain the handle made, distinct with studs, and brazen was the blade. This on the helm discharged a noble blow. The plume dropped nodding to the plain below, shorn from the crest. Atrides waved his steel, deep through his front the weighty falchion fell. The crashing bones before its force gave way. In dust and blood the groaning hero lay. Forced from their ghastly orbs and spouting gore, the clotted eyeballs tumble on the shore. And fierce Atrides spurned him as he bled, tore off his arms, and, loud exulting, said, Thus, Trojans, thus, at length be taught to fear, O race perfidious, who delight in war! Already noble deeds ye have performed, A princess raped transcends a navy stormed. In such bold feats your impious might approve, Without the assistance or the fear of Jove. The violated rites, the ravished dame, our heroes slaughtered and our ships on flame, crimes heaped on crimes shall bend your glory down, and whelm in ruins yon flagitious town. O thou great father, lord of earth and skies, above the thought of man supremely wise, if from thy hand the fates of mortals flow, from whence this favor to an impious foe, a godless crew, abandoned and unjust, still breathing rapine, violence, and lust. The best of things, beyond their measure, cloy, sleep's balmy blessing, love's endearing joy, the feast, the dance, what e'er mankind desire, even the sweet charms of sacred numbers tire. But Troy for ever reaps a dire delight in thirst of slaughter and in lust of fight. This said, he seized, while yet the carcass heaved, the bloody armor which his train received. Then sudden mixed among the warring crew, and the bold son of Polymenes slew. Carpelian had through Asia travelled far, following his martial father to the war. Through filial love he left his native shore, never, ah, never, to behold it more. His unsuccessful spear he chanced to fling against the target of the Spartan king. Thus of his lance disarmed, from death he flies, and turns around his apprehensive eyes. Him, through the hip transpiercing as he fled, the shaft of Morion mingled with the dead. Beneath the bone the glancing point descends, and, driving down, the swelling bladder rends. Sunk in his sad companion's arms he lay, and in short panting sobbed his soul away, like some vile worm extended on the ground, while life's red torrent gushed from out the wound. Him on his car the Paphlagonian train in slow procession bore from off the plain. The pensive father, father now no more, attends the mournful pomp along the shore, and unavailing tears profusely shed, and unrevenged deplored his offspring dead. Paris from far the moving sight beheld, with pity softened and with fury swelled. His honored host, a youth of matchless grace, and loved of all the Paphlagonian race, with his full strength he bent his angry bow, and winged the feathered vengeance at the foe. A chief there was, the brave Eukinor named, for riches much and more for virtue famed, who held his seat in Corinth's stately town, Polita's son, a seer of old renown. Oft had the father told his early doom by arms abroad or slow disease at home. He climbed his vessel, prodigal of breath, and chose the certain glorious path to death. Beneath his ear the pointed arrow went, the soul came issuing at the narrow vent. 
his limbs unnerved dropped useless on the ground and everlasting darkness shades him round nor knew great hector how his legions yield wrapped in the cloud and tumult of the field wide on the left the force of greece commands and conquest hovers o'er the achaean bands with such a tide superior virtue swayed and he that shakes the solid earth gave aid but in the centre hector fixed remained where first the gates were forced and bulwarks gained there on the margin of the hoary deep their naval station where the jaces keep and where low walls confine the beating tides whose humble barrier scarce the foe divides where late in fight both foot and horse engaged and all the thunder of the battle raged there joined the whole boeotian strength remains the proud ionians with their sweeping trains locrians and Pthians and the apian force but joined repel not hector's fiery course the flower of athens stichus phidus led bias and great menestheus at their head meges the strong the apian bands controlled and dracius prudent and amphion bold the Thians, Medon, famed for martial might, and brave Podarces, active in the fight. This drew from Philicus his noble line, Iphiclus' son, and that, O Ilius, thine, young Ajax's brother, by a stolen embrace, he dwelt far distant from his native place, by his fierce stepdame from his father's reign, expelled and exiled for her brother slain. These rule the Thians, and their arms employ, mixed with the oceans on the shores of Troy, now side by side with like unwearied care each ajax labored through the field of war so when two lordly bulls with equal toil forced the bright ploughshare through the fallow soil joined to one yoke the stubborn earth they tear and trace large furrows with the shining share o'er their huge limbs the foam descends in snow and streams of sweat down their sour foreheads flow a train of heroes followed through the field who bore by turns great ajax's sevenfold shield when e'er he breathed remissive of his might tired with the incessant slaughters of the fight no following troops his brave associate grace in close engagement an unpractised race the locrian squadrons nor the javelin wield nor bear the helm nor lift the moony shield but skilled from far the flying shaft to wing or whirl the sounding pebble from the sling Dexterous with these, they aim a certain wound, or fell the distant warrior to the ground. Thus in the van the Telamonian train thronged in bright arms a pressing fight maintain. Far in the rear the Locrian archers lie, whose stones and arrows intercept the sky. The mingled tempest on the foes they pour. Troy's scattering orders open to the shower. Now had the Greeks eternal fame acquired, and the galled Ilians to their walls retired but sage polydamus discreetly brave addressed great hector and this counsel gave though great in all thou seem'st averse to lend impartial audience to a faithful friend to gods and men thy matchless worth is known and every art of glorious war thy own but in cool thought and counsel to excel how widely differs this from warring well content with what the bounteous gods have given seek not alone to engross the gifts of heaven to some the powers of bloody war belong to some sweet music and the charm of song to few and wondrous few has jove assigned a wise extensive all-considering mind their guardians these the nations round confess and towns and empires for their safety bless if heaven have lodged this virtue in my breast attend o hector what i judge the best see as thou mov'st on dangers dangers spread and war's whole fury burns around thy head behold distressed within yon hostile wall how many trojans yield disperse or fall what troops outnumbered scarce the war maintain and what brave heroes at the ships lie slain here cease thy fury and the chiefs and kings convoked in council weigh the sum of things whether the gods succeeding our desires to yon tall ships to bear the trojan fires or quit the fleet and pass unhurt away contented with the conquest of the day i fear i fear lest greece not yet undone pay the large debt of last revolving sun achilles great achilles yet remains on yonder decks and yet o'erlooks the plains the council pleased and hector with a bound leaped from his chariot on the trembling ground swift as he leaped his clanging arms resound to guard this post he cried thy art employ 
and here detain the scattered youth of Troy, where yonder heroes faint I bend my way, and hasten back to end the doubtful day. This said, the towering chief prepares to go, shakes his white plumes that to the breezes flow, and seems a moving mountain topped with snow. Through all his host, inspiring force, he flies, and bids anew the martial thunder rise. To Panthus' son, at Hector's high command, haste the bold leaders of the Trojan band. But round the battlements, and round the plain, for many a chief he looked, but looked in vain. Deiphobus, nor Helenus the seer, nor Asius' son, nor Asius' self appear. For these were pierced with many a ghastly wound, some cold in death, some groaning on the ground, some low in dust, a mournful object, lay. High on the wall some breathed their souls away. Far on the left, amid the throng he found, cheering the troops and dealing deaths around, the graceful Paris, whom with fury moved, opprobrious thus, the impatient chief reproved. Ill-fated Paris, slave to womankind, as smooth of face as fraudulent of mind, where is Deiphobus? Where Asius gone, the godlike father and the intrepid son, the force of Helenus dispensing fate, and great Othryonius so feared of late. Black fate hangs o'er thee from the avenging gods, imperial Troy from her foundations nods. Whelmed in thy country's ruin shalt thou fall, and one devouring vengeance swallow all. When Paris thus, my brother and my friend, thy warm impatience makes thy tongue offend. In other battles I deserved thy blame, though then not deedless nor unknown to fame. But since yon rampart by thy arms lay low, I scattered slaughter from my fatal bow. The chiefs you seek on yonder shore lie slain. Of all those heroes two alone remain, Deiphobus and Helenus the seer, each now disabled by a hostile spear. Go then, successful, where thy soul inspires. This heart and hand shall second all thy fires. What with this arm I can, prepare to know, till death for death be paid, and blow for blow. But tis not ours, with forces not our own to combat. Strength is of the gods alone. These words the hero's angry mind assuage, then fierce they mingle where the thickest rage. Around Polydamus, disdained with blood, Sabrian, Falses, stern Ortheus stood, Palmus with Polypetes the divine, and two bold brothers of Hippotian's line who reached fair Ilion from Ascania far the former day, the next engaged in war. As when from gloomy clouds a whirlwind springs, that bears Jove's thunder on its dreadful wings, wide o'er the blasted fields the tempest sweeps, then, gathered, settles on the hoary deeps, the afflicted deeps tumultuous mix and roar, the waves behind impel the waves before, wide rolling, foaming high, and tumbling to the shore. Thus rank on rank the thick battalions throng, Chief urged on chief, and man drove man along. Far o'er the plains, in dreadful order bright, The brazen arms reflect a beamy light. Full in the blazing van great Hector shined, Like Mars commissioned to confound mankind. Before him flaming his enormous shield, Like the broad sun, illumined all the field. His nodding helm emits a streamy ray, his piercing eyes through all the battle stray, and, while beneath his targe he flashed along, shot terrors round that withered e'en the strong. Thus stalked he, dreadful. Death was in his look. Whole nations feared, but not an argive shook. The towering Ajax, with an ample stride, advanced the first, and thus the chief defied. Hector, come on, thy empty threats forbear. Tis not thy arm, tis thundering Jove we fear, The skill of war to us not idly given. Lo, Greece is humbled, not by Troy, but heaven. Vain are the hopes that haughty mind imparts, To force our fleet. The Greeks have hands and hearts. Long ere in flames our lofty navy fall, Your boasted city and your god-built wall Shall sink beneath us, smoking on the ground, And spread a long unmeasured ruin round. The time shall come when, chased along the plain, Even thou shalt call on Jove and call in vain. Even thou shalt wish, to aid thy desperate course, The wings of falcons for thy flying horse. Shalt run, forgetful of a warrior's fame, While clouds of friendly dust conceal thy shame. As thus he spoke, behold, in open view, 
on sounding wings a dexter eagle flew to jove's glad omen all the grecians rise and hail with shouts his progress through the skies far echoing clamors bound from side to side they ceased and thus the chief of troy replied from whence this menace this insulting strain enormous boaster doomed to vaunt in vain so may the gods on hector life bestow not that short life which mortals lead below but such as those of jove's high lineage born the blue-eyed maid or he that gilds the morn as this decisive day shall end the fame of greece and argos be no more a name and thou imperious if thy madness wait the lance of hector thou shalt meet thy fate that giant course extended on the shore shall largely feast the fowls with fat and gore he said and like a lion stalked along with shouts incessant earth and ocean rung sent from his following host the grecian train with answering thunders filled the echoing plain a shout that tore heaven's concave and above shook the fixed splendors of the throne of jove juno, juno deceives, deceives jupiter, jupiter by, by the, the girdle, girdle of, of venus, venus. Nestor, sitting at the table with Machaon, is alarmed with the increasing clamor of war, and hastens to Agamemnon. On his way he meets that prince with Diomede and Ulysses, whom he informs of the extremity of the danger. Agamemnon proposes to make their escape by night, which Ulysses withstands, to which Diomede adds his advice that, wounded as they were, they should go forth and encourage the army with their presence, which advice is pursued. Juno, seeing the partiality of Jupiter to the Trojans, forms a design to overreach him. She sets off her charms with the utmost care, and, the more surely to enchant him, obtains the magic girdle of Venus. She then applies herself to the god of sleep, and, with some difficulty, persuades him to seal the eyes of Jupiter. This done, she goes to Mount Ida, where the god, at first sight, is ravished with her beauty sinks in her embraces and is laid asleep neptune takes advantage of his slumber and succors the greeks hector is struck to the ground with a prodigious stone by ajax and carried off from the battle several actions succeed till the trojans much distressed are obliged to give way the lesser ajax signalizes himself in a particular manner but not the genial feast, nor flowing bowl, could charm the cares of Nestor's watchful soul. His startled ears the increasing cries attend, then thus, impatient, to his wounded friend. What new alarm, divine Machaon, say? What mixed events attend this mighty day? Hark how the shouts divide, and how they meet, and now come full and thicken to the fleet. Here with the cordial draught dispel thy care. Let Hecamede the strengthening bath prepare, Refresh thy wound and cleanse the clotted gore, While I the adventures of the day explore. He said, and seizing Thrasymedes' shield, His valiant offspring, hastened to the field, That day the son his father's buckler bore, Then snatched a lance and issued from the door. Soon as the prospect opened to his view, His wounded eyes the scene of sorrow knew, Dire disarray the tumult of the fight, the wall in ruins and the Greeks in flight. As when old ocean's silent surface sleeps, the waves just heaving on the purple deeps, while yet the expected tempest hangs on high, weighs down the cloud and blackens in the sky, the mass of waters will no wind obey. Jove sends one gust and bids them roll away. While wavering counsels thus his mind engage, fluctuates in doubtful thought the Pylian sage, to join the host or to the general haste, debating long, he fixes on the last. Yet as he moves, the sight his bosom warms. The field rings dreadful with the clang of arms. The gleaming falchions flash, the javelins fly. Blows echo blows, and all or kill or die. Him in his march the wounded princes meet, by tardy steps ascending from the fleet. The king of men, Ulysses the divine, and who to Tydeus owes his noble line. Their ships at distance from the battle stand, in lines advanced along the shelving strand, whose bay the fleet unable to contain at length, beside the margin of the main, rank above rank, the crowded ships they moor, who landed first, lay highest on the shore. Supported on the spears, they took their way, unfit to fight, but anxious for the day. 
Nestors approach alarmed each Grecian breast, whom thus the general of the host addressed. O oh, grace and glory of the Achaean name! What drives thee, Nestor, from the field of fame? Shall then proud Hector see his boast fulfilled, our fleets in ashes, and our heroes killed? Such was his threat, ah, now too soon made good, on many a Grecian bosom writ in blood. Is every heart inflamed with equal rage against your king, nor will one chief engage? And have I lived to see with mournful eyes in every Greek a new Achilles rise? Gerenian Nestor then. So fate has willed, and all confirming time has fate fulfilled. Not he that thunders from the aerial bower, not Jove himself upon the past has power. The wall, our late inviolable bound, and best defense, lies smoking on the ground. Even to the ships their conquering arms extend, and groans of slaughtered Greeks to heaven ascend. On speedy measures then employ your thought, in such distress if counsel profit aught. Arms cannot much. Though Mars our souls in sight, these gaping wounds withhold us from the fight. To him the monarch. That our army bends, that Troy triumphant our high fleet ascends, and that the rampart late our surest trust and best defense lies smoking in the dust. All this from Jove's afflictive hand we bear, who, far from Argos, wills our ruin here. Past are the days when happier Greece was blessed, and all his favor, all his aid confessed. Now heaven averse, our hands from battle ties, and lifts the Trojan glory to the skies. Cease we at length to waste our blood in vain, and launch what ships lie nearest to the main. Leave these at anchor till the coming night. Then, if impetuous Troy forbear the fight, bring all to sea, and hoist each sail for flight. Better from evils well foreseen to run, than perish in the danger we may shun. Thus he. The sage Ulysses thus replies, while anger flashed from his disdainful eyes. What shameful words, unkingly as thou art, fall from that trembling tongue and timorous heart! O oh, were thy sway the curse of meaner powers, and thou the shame of any host but ours! A host, by Jove endued with martial might, and taught to conquer or to fall in fight, adventurous combats and bold wars to wage, employed our youth, and yet employs our age. And wilt thou thus desert the Trojan plain, and have whole streams of blood been spilt in vain? In such base sentence, if thou couch thy fear, speak it in whispers, lest a Greek should hear. Lives there a man so dead to fame who dares to think such meanness, or the thought declares? And comes it even from him whose sovereign sway the banded legions of all Greece obey? Is this a general's voice that calls to flight? while war hangs doubtful, while his soldiers fight? What more could Troy, what yet their fate denies, thou givest the foe, all Greece becomes their prize. No more the troops, our hoisted sails in view, themselves abandoned, shall the fight pursue. But thy ships flying with despair shall see, and owe destruction to a prince like thee. Thy just reproofs, Atrides calm replies, like arrows pierce me, for thy words are wise. Unwilling as I am to lose the host, I force not Greece to quit this hateful coast. Glad I submit, who e'er, or young or old, ought more conducive to our weal unfold. Tydides cut him short, and thus began. Such counsel if you seek, behold the man who boldly gives it, and what he shall say. Young though he be, disdain not to obey. A youth, who from the mighty tide you springs, may speak to councils and assembled kings. Hear then in me the great Oenides' son, whose honored dust, his race of glory run, lies whelmed in ruins of the Theban wall, brave in his life and glorious in his fall. With three bold sons was generous Prothus blessed, who Pleuron's walls and Caledon possessed, Melus and Agrius, but who far surpassed the rest in courage, Enus was the last. From him, my sire. From Caledon expelled, he passed to Argos and in exile dwelled. The monarch's daughter there, so Jove ordained, he won and flourished where Adrastus reigned. There, rich in fortune's gifts, his acres tilled, beheld his vines their liquid harvest yield, and numerous flocks that whitened all the field. Such Tydeus was, 
the foremost once in fame, nor lives in Greece a stranger to his name. Then, what for common good my thoughts inspire, attend, and in the sun respect the sire. Though sore of battle, though with wounds oppressed, let each go forth and animate the rest, advance the glory which he cannot share, though not partaker, witness of the war. But lest new wounds on wounds o'erpower us quite, Beyond the missile javelin's sounding flight, safe let us stand, and from the tumult far, inspire the ranks, and rule the distant war. He added not, the listening kings obey, slow moving on, Atrides leads the way. The god of ocean, to inflame their rage, appears a warrior furrowed o'er with age. Pressed in his own, the general's hand he took, and thus the venerable hero spoke. Atrides, lo, with what disdainful eye Achilles sees his country's forces fly. Blind, impious man, whose anger is his guide, who glories in unutterable pride. So may he perish, so may Jove disclaim the wretch relentless, and o'erwhelm with shame. But heaven forsakes not thee. O'er yonder sands, soon shall thou view the scattered Trojan bands fly diverse, while proud kings and chiefs renowned, driven heaps on heaps, with clouds involved around of rolling dust, their winged wheels employ to hide their ignominious heads in Troy. He spoke, then rushed amid the warrior crew, and sent his voice before him as he flew, loud, as the shout encountering armies yield, when twice ten thousand shake the laboring field. Such was the voice, and such the thundering sound of him whose trident rends the solid ground. Each Argive bosom beats to meet the fight, and grisly war appears a pleasing sight. Meantime, Saturnia from Olympus' brow, high throned in gold, beheld the fields below. With joy the glorious conflict she surveyed, where her great brother gave the Grecians aid. But placed aloft, on Ida's shady height, she sees her Jove, and trembles at the sight. Jove to deceive, what methods shall she try? What arts, to blind his all-beholding eye? At length she trusts her power, resolved to prove the old yet still successful cheat of love, against his wisdom to oppose her charms, and lull the lord of thunders in her arms. Swift to her bright apartment she repairs, sacred to dress and beauty's pleasing cares. With skill divine had Vulcan formed the bower, safe from access of each intruding power. Touched with her secret key, the doors unfold. Self-closed, behind her shut the valves of gold. Here first she bathes, and round her body pours soft oils of fragrance and ambrosial showers. The winds, perfumed, the balmy gale convey through heaven, through earth, and all the aerial way. Spirit divine, whose exhalation greets the sense of gods with more than mortal sweets. Thus, while she breathed of heaven, with decent pride her artful hands the radiant tresses tied, part on her head in shining ringlets rolled, part o'er her shoulders waved like melted gold. Around her next a heavenly mantle flowed, that rich with palace labored colors glowed. Large clasps of gold the foldings gathered round, a golden zone her swelling bosom bound. Far-beaming pendants tremble in her ear, each gem illumined with a triple star. Then o'er her head she cast a veil more white than new-fallen snow, and dazzling as the light. Last her fair feet celestial sandals grace. Thus issuing radiant with majestic pace, forth from the dome the imperial goddess moves, and calls the mother of the smiles and loves. How long, to Venus thus apart she cried, shall human strife celestial minds divide? Ah, yet, will Venus aid Saturnia's joy, and set aside the cause of Greece and Troy? Let heaven's dread empress, Cytherea said, speak her request, and deem her will obeyed. Then grant me, said the queen, those conquering charms, that power which mortals and immortals warms, that love which melts mankind in fierce desires, and burns the sons of heaven with sacred fires. For lo, I haste to those remote abodes, where the great parents, sacred source of gods, Ocean and Thetis their old empire keep, on the last limits of the land and deep. In their kind arms my tender years were passed, what time old Saturn from Olympus cast, of upper heaven to Jove, resigned the rain, whelmed under the huge mass of earth and main. 
for strife, I hear, has made the union cease, which held so long that ancient pair in peace. What honor and what love shall I obtain if I compose those fatal feuds again? Once more their minds in mutual ties engage, and what my youth has owed repay their age. She said, with awe divine, the queen of love obeyed the sister and the wife of Jove, and from her fragrant breast the zone embraced, with various skill and high embroidery graced. In this was every art and every charm, to win the wisest and the coldest warm. Fond love, the gentle vow, the gay desire, the kind deceit, the still reviving fire, persuasive speech, and the more persuasive sighs, silence that spoke, and eloquence of eyes. This on her hand the Cyprian goddess laid. Take this, and with it all thy wish, she said. With smiles she took the charm, and smiling pressed the powerful Cestus to her snowy breast. Then Venus to the courts of Jove withdrew, whilst from Olympus pleased Saturnia flew. O'er high Pieria, thence her course she bore, or fair Emathia's ever-pleasing shore, or Hemus hills with snows eternal crowned, nor once her flying foot approached the ground. Then taking wing from Athos' lofty steep, she speeds to Lemnos o'er the rolling deep, and seeks the cave of death's half-brother, Sleep. Sweet, pleasing sleep, Saturnia thus began, who spreads thy empire o'er each god and man. If e'er obsequious to thy Juno's will, O power of slumbers, hear and favor still. Shed thy soft dews on Jove's immortal eyes, While sunk in love's entrancing joys he lies. A splendid footstool and a throne, That shine with gold unfading softness shall be thine. The work of Vulcan, to indulge thy ease When wine and feasts thy golden humors please. Imperial dame, the balmy power replies, Great Saturn's heir and empress of the skies, O'er other gods I spread my easy chain, the sire of all, old ocean, owns my reign, and his hushed waves lie silent on the main. But how, unbidden, shall I dare to steep Jove's awful temples in the dew of sleep? Long since, too venturous, at thy bold command, on those eternal lids I laid my hand. What time, deserting Ilion's wasted plain, his conquering son, Alcides, ploughed the main. When, lo, the deeps arise, the tempests roar, And drive the hero to the Cohen shore. Great Jove, awaking, shook the blessed abodes With rising wrath, and tumbled gods on gods. Me, chief, he sought, and from the realms on high Had hurled indignant to the nether sky, But gentle knight, to whom I fled for aid, The friend of earth and heaven, her wings displayed, Empowered the wrath of gods and men to tame, even Jove revered the venerable dame. Vain are thy fears, the queen of heaven replies, and speaking, rolls her large majestic eyes. Think'st thou that Troy has Jove's high favor won, like great Alcides, his all-conquering son? Hear, and obey the mistress of the skies, nor for the deed expect a vulgar prize. For no, thy loved one shall be ever thine, the youngest grace, Pasithia the divine. Swear then, he said, by those tremendous floods that roar through hell and bind the invoking gods. Let the great parent earth one hand sustain, and stretch the other o'er the sacred main. Call the black titans that with Kronos dwell, to hear and witness from the depths of hell, that she, my loved one, shall be ever mine, the youngest grace, Pasithia the divine. The queen assents, and from the infernal bowers invokes the sable sub-Tartarian powers, and those who rule the inviolable floods, whom mortals name the dread Titanian gods. Then, swift as wind, o'er Lemno's smoky isle they wing their way, and embrace sea-beat soil. Through air, unseen, involved in darkness glide, and light on Lectos, on the point of Ide, mother of savages, whose echoing hills are heard resounding with a hundred rills. Fair Ida trembles underneath the god, Hushed are her mountains and her forests nod. There on a fir, whose spiry branches rise To join its summit to the neighboring skies, Dark in embowering shade, concealed from sight, Sat sleep, in likeness of the bird of night. Calchas his name by those of heavenly birth, But called Kimintis by the race of earth. To Ida's top successful Juno flies, Great Jove surveys her with desiring eyes, 
the god whose lightning sets the heavens on fire through all his bosom feels the fierce desire fierce as when first by stealth he seized her charms mixed with her soul and melted in her arms fixed on her eyes he fed his eager look then pressed her hand and thus with transport spoke why comes my goddess from the ethereal sky and not her steeds and flaming chariot nigh then she i haste to those remote abodes where the great parents of the deathless gods the reverend ocean and grey thetis reign on the last limits of the land and main i visit these to whose indulgent cares i owe the nursing of my tender years for strife i hear has made that union cease which held so long that ancient pair in peace the steeds prepared my chariot to convey o'er earth and seas and through the aerial way wait under eyed of thy superior power to ask consent i leave the olympian bower nor seek unknown to thee the sacred cells deep under seas where hoary ocean dwells for that said jove suffice another day but eager love denies the least delay let softer cares the present hour employ and be these moments sacred all to joy ne'er did my soul so strong a passion prove or for an earthly or a heavenly love not when i pressed ixion's matchless dame whence rose pirithous like the gods in fame not when fair danae felt the shower of gold stream into life whence perseus brave and bold not thus i burned for either theban dame bacchus from this from that alcides came nor phoenix daughter beautiful and young whence godlike radamanth and minos sprung not thus i burned for fair latona's face nor comelier ceres more majestic grace not thus even for thyself i felt desire as now my veins receive the pleasing fire he spoke the goddess with the charming eyes glows with celestial red and thus replies is this a scene for love on ida's height exposed to mortal and immortal sight our joys profaned by each familiar eye the sport of heaven and fable of the sky how shall i e'er review the blest abodes or mix among the senate of the gods shall i not think that with disordered charms all heaven beholds me recent from thy arms with skill divine has vulcan formed thy bower sacred to love and to the genial hour if such thy will to that recess retire in secret there indulge thy soft desire she ceased and smiling with superior love thus answered mild the cloud-compelling jove nor god nor mortal shall our joys behold shaded with clouds and circumfused in gold not even the sun who darts through heaven his rays and whose broad eye the extended earth surveys gazing he spoke and kindling at the view his eager arms around the goddess threw glad earth perceives and from her bosom pours unbidden herbs and voluntary flowers thick new-born violets a soft carpet spread and clustering lotus swelled the rising bed and sudden hyacinths the turf bestrow and flamy crocus made the mountain glow their golden clouds conceal the heavenly pair steeped in soft joys and circumfused with air celestial dews descending o'er the ground perfume the mount and breathe ambrosia round at length with love and sleep's soft power oppressed the panting thunderer nods and sinks to rest now to the navy borne on silent wings to neptune's ear soft sleep his message brings beside him sudden unperceived he stood and thus with gentle words addressed the god now neptune now the important hour employ to check awhile the haughty hopes of troy while jove yet rests while yet my vapours shed the golden vision round his sacred head for juno's love and somnus pleasing ties have closed those awful and eternal eyes thus having said the power of slumber flew on human lids to drop the balmy dew neptune with zeal increased renews his care and towering in the foremost ranks of war indignant thus o oh, once of martial fame o oh, greeks if yet ye can deserve the name this half-recovered day shall troy obtain shall hector thunder at your ships again lo still he vaunts and threats the fleet with fires while stern achilles in his wrath retires one hero's loss too tamely you deplore be still yourselves and ye shall need no more oh yet if glory any bosom warms brace on your firmest helms and stand to arms 
His strongest spear each valiant Grecian wield, Each valiant Grecian seize his broadest shield. Let to the weak the lighter arms belong, The ponderous targe be wielded by the strong. Thus armed, not Hector shall our presence stay, Myself, ye Greeks, myself will lead the way. The troops assent, their martial arms they change, The busy chiefs their banded legions range. The kings, though wounded and oppressed with pain, With helpful hands themselves assist the train. The strong and cumbrous arms the valiant wield, The weaker warrior takes a lighter shield. Thus sheathed in shining brass, In bright array the legions march, And Neptune leads the way. His brandished falchion flames before their eyes, Like lightning flashing through the frighted skies. Clad in his might the earth-shaking power appears, Pale mortals tremble, and confess their fears. Troy's great defender stands alone unawed, Arms his proud host, and dares oppose a god. And lo, the god and wondrous man appear, The sea's stern ruler there, and Hector here. The roaring main, at her great master's call, Rose in huge ranks, and formed a watery wall around the ships. Seas hanging o'er the shores, both armies join. Earth thunders, ocean roars. Not half so loud the bellowing deeps resound, When stormy winds disclose the dark profound. Less loud the winds that from the Aeolian hall Roar through the woods, and make whole forests fall. Less loud the woods, when flames in torrents pour, Catch the dry mountain and its shades devour. With such a rage the meeting hosts are driven, And such a clamor shakes the sounding heaven. The first bold javelin, urged by Hector's force, Direct at Ajax's bosom winged its course. But there no pass the crossing belts afford, One braced his shield, and one sustained his sword. Then back the disappointed Trojan drew, And cursed the lance that unavailing flew. But scaped not Ajax. His tempestuous hand, A ponderous stone upheaving from the sand, Where heaps laid loose beneath the warrior's feet, Or served to ballast, or to prop the fleet. Tossed round and round, the missive marble flings. On the raised shield the fallen ruin rings, Full on his breast and throat with force descends, nor deadened there its giddy fury spends, But whirling on, with many a fiery round, Smokes in the dust, and ploughs into the ground. As when the bolt, red hissing from above, Darts on the consecrated plant of Jove, The mountain oak in flaming ruin lies, Black from the blow, and smokes of sulphur rise. Stiff with amaze the pale beholders stand, And own the terrors of the Almighty Hand. So lies great Hector prostrate on the shore, his slackened hand deserts the lance it bore. His following shield the fallen chief o'erspread. Beneath his helmet dropped his fainting head. His load of armor, sinking to the ground, Clanks on the field, a dead and hollow sound. Loud shouts of triumph fill the crowded plain. Greece sees, in hope, Troy's great defender slain. All spring to seize him. Storms of arrows fly, And thicker javelins intercept the sky. In vain an iron tempest hisses round, He lies protected and without a wound. Polydamus, Agenor the divine, The pious warrior of Anchises' line, And each bold leader of the Lycian band, With covering shields a friendly circle stand, His mournful followers, with assistant care, The groaning hero to his chariot bear. His foaming coursers, swifter than the wind, Speed to the town and leave the war behind. When now they touched the Medes' enameled side, Where gentle Xanthus rolls his easy tide, With watery drops the chief they sprinkle round, Placed on the margin of the flowery ground. Raised on his knees, he now ejects the gore, Now faints anew, low sinking on the shore. By fits he breathes, half views the fleeting skies, And seals again by fits his swimming eyes. Soon as the Greeks the chief's retreat beheld, With double fury each invades the field. Oily and Ajax first his javelin sped, Pierced by whose point the son of Enops bled, Satnius the brave, whom beauteous Nais bore Amidst her flocks on Satnius' silver shore. Struck through the belly's rim, the warrior lies supine, And shades eternal veil his eyes. An arduous battle rose around the dead, By turns the Greeks, by turns the Trojans bled. 
Fired with revenge, Polydamus drew near, and at Prothoenor shook the trembling spear. The driving javelin through his shoulder thrust. He sinks to earth and grasps the bloody dust. Lo thus, the victor cries, we rule the field, and thus their arms the race of Panthus wield. From this unerring hand there flies no dart but bathes its point within a Grecian heart. Propped on that spear to which thou owest thy fall, go, guide thy darksome steps to Pluto's dreary hall. He said, and sorrow touched each argive of breast. The soul of Ajax burned above the rest. As by his side the groaning warrior fell, at the fierce foe he launched his piercing steel. The foe, reclining, shunned the flying death. But fate, Archilochus, demands thy breath. Thy lofty birth no succor could impart. The wings of death o'ertook thee on the dart. Swift to perform heaven's fatal will, it fled, full on the juncture of the neck and head, and took the joint, and cut the nerves in twain. The dropping head first tumbled on the plain. So just the stroke, that yet the body stood erect, then rolled along the sands in blood. Here, proud Polydamus, here turn thy eyes, the towering Ajax loud insulting cries. Say, is this chief extended on the plain a worthy vengeance for Prothoenor slain? Mark well his port, his figure and his face, nor speak him vulgar, nor of vulgar race. Some lines, methinks, may make his lineage known, Antenor's brother, or perhaps his son. He spake, and smiled severe, for well he knew the bleeding youth. Troy saddened at the view. But furious Acamas avenged his cause. As Promachus his slaughtered brother draws, he pierced his heart. Such fate attends you all, proud Argaevs, destined by our arms to fall. Not Troy alone, but haughty Greece, shall share the toils, the sorrows, and the wounds of war. Behold your Promachus, deprived of breath, a victim owed to my brave brother's death. Not unappeased he enters Pluto's gate, who leaves a brother to revenge his fate. Heart-piercing anguish struck the Grecian host, but touched the breast of bold Penelius most. At the proud boaster he directs his course. The boaster flies, and shuns superior force. But young Ileonius received the spear, Ileonius his father's only care. Forbus the rich, of all the Trojan train whom Hermes loved, and taught the arts of gain. Full in his eye the weapon chanced to fall, and from the fiber scooped the rooted ball, drove through the neck and hurled him to the plain. He lifts his miserable arms in vain. Swift his broad falchion fierce Penelius spread, and from the spouting shoulders struck his head. To earth at once the head and helmet fly, the lance yet sticking through the bleeding eye the victor seized, and as aloft he shook the gory visage, thus insulting spoke. Trojans, your great Ileonius behold. Haste to his father, let the tale be told. Let his high roofs resound with frantic woe, such as the house of Promachus must know. Let doleful tidings greet his mother's ear, such as to Promachus' sad spouse we bear, when we victorious shall to Greece return, and the pale matron in our triumphs mourn. Dreadful he spoke, then tossed the head on high. The Trojans hear, they tremble and they fly. Aghast they gaze around the fleet and wall, and dread the ruin that impends on all. Daughters of Jove, that on Olympus shine, ye all beholding, all recording nine. O oh, say, when Neptune made proud Ilion yield, what chief, what hero first embrued the field? Of all the Grecians, what immortal name, and whose blessed trophies will ye raise to fame? Thou first, great Ajax, on the unsanguined plain laid Hirtius, leader of the Mysian train. Falses and Murmur, Nestor's son o'erthrew. Bold Merion, Morus and Hippotion slew. Strong Periphetes and Prothoon bled by Teucer's arrows mingled with the dead. Pierced in the flank by Menelaus' steel, his people's pastor, Hipparinor, fell. Eternal darkness wrapped the warrior round, and the fierce soul came rushing through the wound. But stretched in heaps before Oelius' son fall mighty numbers, mighty numbers run. Ajax the less, of all the Grecian race, skilled in pursuit, and swiftest in the chase. The, the fifth, fifth battle at, at the, the ships, ships and, and the acts of, of Ajax. Ajax. Jupiter, awaking, sees the Trojans repulsed from the trenches, Hector in a swoon, and Neptune at the head of the Greeks. 
He is highly incensed at the artifice of Juno, who appeases him by her submissions. She is then sent to Iris and Apollo. Juno, repairing to the assembly of the gods, attempts with extraordinary address to incense them against Jupiter. In particular, she touches Mars with a violent resentment. He is ready to take arms, but is prevented by Minerva. Iris and Apollo obey the orders of Jupiter. Iris commands Neptune to leave the battle, to which, after much reluctance and passion, he consents. Apollo re-inspires Hector with vigor, brings him back to the battle, marches before him with his aegis, and turns the fortune of the fight. He breaks down great part of the Grecian wall. The Trojans rush in and attempt to fire the first line of the fleet, but are as yet repelled by the greater Ajax with a prodigious slaughter. Now in swift flight they pass the trench profound, and many a chief lay gasping on the ground, then stopped and panted where the chariots lie, fear on their cheek and horror in their eye. Meanwhile, awakened from his dream of love, on Ida's summit sat imperial Jove. Round the wide fields he cast a careful view. There saw the Trojans fly, the Greeks pursue. These proud in arms, those scattered o'er the plain, and midst the war the monarch of the main. Not far, great Hector on the dust he spies, his sad associates round with weeping eyes, ejecting blood and panting yet for breath, his senses wandering to the verge of death. The god beheld him with a pitying look, and thus, incensed, to fraudful Juno spoke. O thou still adverse to the eternal will, for ever studious in promoting ill! Thy arts have made the godlike Hector yield, and driven his conquering squadrons from the field. Canst thou, unhappy in thy wiles, withstand our power immense, and brave the Almighty hand? Hast thou forgot? When bound and fixed on high from the vast concave of the spangled sky, I hung thee trembling in a golden chain, and all the raging gods opposed in vain. Headlong I hurled them from the Olympian hall, stunned in the whirl and breathless with the fall. For godlike Hercules these deeds were done, nor seemed the vengeance worthy such a son. When, by thy wiles induced, fierce Boraas tossed the shipwrecked hero on the Cohen coast, him through a thousand forms of death I bore, and sent to Argos and his native shore. Hear this, remember, and our fury dread, nor pull the unwilling vengeance on thy head, lest arts and blandishments successless prove thy soft deceits and well-dissembled love. The thunderer spoke. Imperial Juno mourned, and trembling, these submissive words returned. By every oath that powers immortal ties, the foodful earth and all enfolding skies, by thy black waves, tremendous sticks, that flow through the drear realms of gliding ghosts below, by the dread honors of thy sacred head, and that unbroken vow, our virgin bed, not by my arts the ruler of the main steeps Troy in blood, and ranges round the plain, by his own ardor, his own pity swayed, to help his Greeks, he fought and disobeyed. Else had thy Juno better counsels given, and taught submission to the sire of heaven. Think'st thou with me, fair empress of the skies? The immortal father with a smile replies. Then soon the haughty sea-god shall obey, nor dare to act but when we point the way. If truth inspires thy tongue, Proclaim our will to yon bright synod on the Olympian hill. Our high decree let various Iris know, and call the god that bears the silver bow. Let her descend, and from the embattled plain command the sea-god to his watery reign, while Phoebus hastes great Hector to prepare to rise afresh, and once more wake the war. His laboring bosom re-inspires with breath, and calls his senses from the verge of death. Greece, chased by Troy, even to Achilles' fleet, shall fall by thousands at the hero's feet. He, not untouched with pity, to the plain shall send Patroclus, but shall send in vain. What youths he slaughtered under Ilion's walls, even my loved son, divine Sarpedon, falls. Vanquished at last by Hector's lance he lies. Then, nor till then, shall great Achilles rise, and lo, that instant, godlike Hector dies. 
From that great hour the war's whole fortune turns, Pallas assists and lofty Aelian burns. Not till that day shall Jove relax his rage, Nor one of all the heavenly host engage in aid of Greece. The promise of a god I gave, and sealed it with the almighty nod, Achilles' glory to the stars to raise. Such was our word, and fate the word obeys. The trembling queen, the almighty order given, Swift from the Idaean summit shot to heaven. As some wayfaring man, who wanders o'er In thought a length of lands he trod before, Sends forth his active mind from place to place, Joins hill to dale, and measures space with space, So swift flew Juno to the blessed abodes, If thought of man can match the speed of gods. There sat the powers in awful synod placed, they bowed, and made obeisance as she passed through all the brazen dome. With goblets crowned they hail her queen. The nectar streams around. Fair Themis first presents the golden bowl, and anxious asks what cares disturb her soul. To whom the white-armed goddess thus replies, Enough thou know'st the tyrant of the skies, severely bent his purpose to fulfill, unmoved his mind, and unrestrained his will. Go thou, the feasts of heaven attend thy call. Bid the crowned nectar circle round the hall. But Jove shall thunder through the ethereal dome such stern decrees, such threatened woes to come, as soon shall freeze mankind with dire surprise, and damp the eternal banquets of the skies. The goddess said, and sullen took her place. Black horror saddened each celestial face. To see the gathering grudge in every breast, Smiles on her lips a spleenful joy expressed, While on her wrinkled front and eyebrow bent Sat steadfast care and lowering discontent. Thus she proceeds, Attend ye powers above, But no, tis madness to contest with Jove, Supreme he sits and sees in pride of sway, Your vassal godheads grudgingly obey, Fierce in the majesty of power controls, Shakes all the thrones of heaven and bends the poles. Submiss, immortals, all he wills, obey. And thou, great Mars, begin and show the way. Behold Ascalaphus, behold him die. But dare not murmur, dare not vent a sigh. Thy own loved boasted offspring lies or thrown, If that loved boasted offspring be thy own. Stern Mars, with anguish for his slaughtered son, Smote his rebelling breast and fierce begun. Thus then, immortals, thus shall Mars obey. Forgive me, gods, and yield my vengeance way. Descending first to yon forbidden plain, The god of battles dares avenge the slain. Dares, though the thunder bursting o'er my head Should hurl me blazing on those heaps of dead. With that he gives command to fear and flight To join his rapid coursers for the fight. Then grim in arms, with hasty vengeance flies, Arms that reflect a radiance through the skies. And now had Jove, by bold rebellion driven, Discharged his wrath on half the host of heaven. But Pallas, springing through the bright abode, Starts from her azure throne to calm the god. Struck for the immortal race with timely fear, From frantic Mars she snatched the shield and spear. Then the huge helmet lifting from his head, Thus to the impetuous homicide she said, by what wild passion, furious, art thou tossed? Strivedst thou with Jove? Thou art already lost. Shall not the thunderer's dread command restrain, And was imperial Juno heard in vain? Back to the skies wouldst thou with shame be driven, And in thy guilt involve the host of heaven? Aelian and Greece no more should Jove engage, The skies would yield an ampler scene of rage. Guilty and guiltless find an equal fate, And one vast ruin whelm the Olympian state. Cease then thy offspring's death unjust to call. Heroes as great have died, and yet shall fall. Why should heaven's law with foolish man comply, Exempted from the race ordained to die? This menace fixed the warrior to his throne. Sullen he sat and curbed the rising groan. Then Juno called, Jove's orders to obey, the winged Iris and the god of day. Go wait the thunderer's will, Saturnia cried, on yon tall summit of the fountful Ide. There in the father's awful presence stand, receive and execute his dread command. She said and sat, the god that gilds the day and various Iris wing their airy way. 
Swift as the wind to Ida's hills they came, Fair nurse of fountains and of savage game. There sat the Eternal, he whose nod controls The trembling world and shakes the steady poles. Veiled in a mist of fragrance him they found With clouds of gold and purple circled round. Well pleased the thunderer saw their earnest care, And prompt obedience to the queen of air. Then, while a smile serenes his awful brow, Commands the goddess of the showery bow. Iris, descend, and what we here ordain, Report to yon mad tyrant of the main. Bid him from fight to his own deeps repair, Or breathe from slaughter in the fields of air. If he refuse, then let him timely weigh Our elder birthright and superior sway. How shall his rashness stand the dire alarms If heaven's omnipotence descend in arms? Strives he with me, by whom his power was given, And is there equal to the Lord of heaven? The Almighty spoke. The goddess winged her flight To sacred Ilion from the Idaean height. Swift as the rattling hail or fleecy snows Drive through the skies when Boraas fiercely blows, So from the clouds descending Iris falls, And to blue Neptune thus the goddess calls. Attend the mandate of the sire above, In me behold the messenger of Jove. He bids thee from forbidden wars repair To thine own deeps, or to the fields of air. This if refused, he bids thee timely weigh His elder birthright and superior sway. How shall thy rashness stand the dire alarms If heaven's omnipotence descend in arms? Strivest thou with him by whom all power is given? And art thou equal to the Lord of heaven? What means the haughty sovereign of the skies? The king of ocean thus, incensed, replies. Rule as he will his portioned realms on high, no vassal god, nor of his train, am I. Three brother deities from Saturn came, And ancient Rhea, Earth's immortal dame. Assigned by lot, our triple rule we know. Infernal Pluto sways the shades below. O'er the wide clouds and o'er the starry plain, Ethereal Jove extends his high domain. My court beneath the hoary waves I keep, And hush the roarings of the sacred deep. Olympus and this earth in common lie. What claim has here the tyrant of the sky? Far in the distant clouds let him control, And awe the younger brothers of the pole. There to his children his commands be given, The trembling, servile, second race of heaven. And must I then, said she, O sire of floods, Bear this fierce answer to the king of gods? Correct it yet, and change thy rash intent. A noble mind disdains not to repent. Two elder brothers, guardian fiends are given, To scourge the wretch insulting them and heaven. Great is the prophet, thus the god rejoined, When ministers are blessed with prudent mind. Warned by thy words, to powerful Jove I yield, And quit, though angry, the contended field. Not but his threats with justice I disclaim, The same our honors and our birth the same. If yet, forgetful of his promise given to Hermes, Pallas, and the Queen of Heaven, to favor Ilion, that perfidious place, he breaks his faith with half the ethereal race. Give him to know, unless the Grecian train lay yon proud structures level with the plain, how e'er the offense by other gods be passed, the wrath of Neptune shall for ever last. Thus speaking, furious from the field he strode and plunged into the bosom of the flood. The Lord of Thunders from his lofty height beheld, and thus bespoke the source of light. Behold, the God whose liquid arms are hurled around the globe, whose earthquakes rock the world, desists at length his rebel war to wage, seeks his own seas and trembles at our rage. Else had my wrath, heaven's thrones all shaking round, burned to the bottom of his seas profound, and all the gods that round old Saturn dwell had heard the thunders to the deeps of hell. Well was the crime, and well the vengeance spared. Even power immense had found such battle hard. Go thou, my son, the trembling Greeks alarm. Shake my broad aegis on thy active arm. Be God like Hector thy peculiar care. Swell his bold heart, and urge his strength to war. Let Ilion conquer, till the Achaean train Fly to their ships and Hellespont again. Then Greece shall breathe from toils. The god had said. 
His will divine the son of Jove obeyed. Not half so swift the sailing falcon flies That drives a turtle through the liquid skies As Phoebus, shooting from the Idian brow, Glides down the mountain to the plain below. There Hector seated by the stream he sees, His sense returning with the coming breeze. Again his pulses beat, his spirits rise, Again his loved companions meet his eyes. Jove thinking of his pains, they passed away, To whom the god who gives the golden day. Why sits great Hector from the field so far? What grief, what wound withholds thee from the war? The fainting hero, as the vision bright stood shining o'er him, half unsealed his sight. What blessed immortal with commanding breath thus wakens Hector from the sleep of death? Has fame not told how, while my trusty sword bathed Greece in slaughter and her battle gored, the mighty Ajax with a deadly blow had almost sunk me to the shades below? Even yet, methinks, the gliding ghosts I spy, And hell's black horrors swim before my eye. To him Apollo. Be no more dismayed. See and be strong. The thunderer sends thee aid. Behold, thy Phoebus shall his arms employ. Phoebus, propitious still to thee and Troy. Inspire thy warriors then with manly force, And to the ships impel thy rapid horse. Even I will make thy fiery coursers way, and drive the Grecians headlong to the sea. Thus to bold Hector spoke the son of Jove, and breathed immortal ardor from above. As when the pampered steed, with reins unbound, breaks from his stall and pours along the ground, with ample strokes he rushes to the flood, to bathe his sides and cool his fiery blood. His head, now freed, he tosses to the skies, his mane disheveled o'er his shoulders flies. He snuffs the females in the well-known plain, and springs exulting to his fields again. Urged by the voice divine, thus Hector flew, full of the god, and all his hosts pursue. As when the force of men and dogs combined invade the mountain goat or branching hind, far from the hunter's rage secure they lie close in the rock, not fated yet to die, when, lo, a lion shoots across the way, they fly, at once the chasers and the prey. So Greece, that late in conquering troops pursued, and marked their progress through the ranks in blood, soon as they see the furious chief appear, forget to vanquish and consent to fear. Thoas with grief observed his dreadful course, Thoas the bravest of the Aetolian force, skilled to direct the javelin's distant flight, and bold to combat in the standing fight, not more in councils famed for solid sense than winning words and heavenly eloquence. Gods, what portent, he cries, these eyes invades. Lo, Hector rises from the Stygian shades. We saw him late by thundering Ajax killed. What god restores him to the frighted field? And not content that half of Greece lies slain, pours new destruction on her sons again. He comes not, Jove, without thy powerful will. Lo, still he lives, pursues, and conquers still. Yet hear my counsel, and his worst withstand. The Greeks' main body to the fleet command. But let the few whom brisker spirits warm Stand the first onset, and provoke the storm. Thus point your arms, and when such foes appear Fierce as he is, let Hector learn to fear. The warrior spoke, the listening Greeks obey, Thickening their ranks, and form a deep array. Each Ajax, Teucer, Merion gave command, the valiant leader of the Cretan band, and Mars like Meges, these the chiefs excite, approach the foe, and meet the coming fight. Behind, unnumbered multitudes attend, to flank the navy and the shores defend. Full on the front the pressing Trojans bear, and Hector first came towering to the war. Phoebus himself the rushing battle led, a veil of clouds involved his radiant head. High held before him, Jove's enormous shield portentous shone, and shaded all the field. Vulcan to Jove the immortal gift consigned, to scatter hosts and terrify mankind. The Greeks expect the shock, the clamors rise from different parts, and mingle in the skies. Dire was the hiss of darts by heroes flung, and arrows leaping from the bowstring sung. These drink the life of generous warriors slain. Those guiltless fall and thirst for blood in vain. As long as Phoebus bore unmoved the shield, Sat doubtful conquest hovering o'er the field. 
But when a lofty shakes it in the skies, shouts in their ears and lightens in their eyes, deep horror seizes every Grecian breast, their forces humbled and their fear confessed. So flies a herd of oxen, scattered wide, no swain to guard them and no day to guide, when two fell lions from the mountain come, and spread the carnage through the shady gloom. Impending Phoebus pours around them fear, and Troy and Hector thunder in the rear. Heaps fall on heaps, the slaughter Hector leads, first great Arcesilaus, then Stichius bleeds, one to the bold Boeotians ever dear, and one Menestheus' friend and famed compere. Maiden and Aesus Aeneas sped, this sprang from Phyllis and the Athenians led, but hapless Medon from the Oelius came, him Ajax honored with a brother's name, though born of lawless love, from home expelled a banished man. In Phylacy he dwelled, pressed by the vengeance of an angry wife. Troy ends at last his labors and his life. Mesistius next Polydamus o'erthrew, and the brave Clonius great Agenor slew. By Paris, Deiochus inglorious dies, pierced through the shoulder as he basely flies. Polites' arm laid Echius on the plain, stretched on one heap the victors spoil the slain. The Greeks dismayed, confused, disperse or fall. Some seek the trench, some skulk behind the wall. While these fly trembling, others pant for breath, and o'er the slaughter stalks gigantic death. On rushed bold Hector, gloomy as the night, forbids to plunder, animates the fight, points to the fleet. For by the gods, who flies, who dares but linger, by this hand he dies. No weeping sister his cold eye shall close, no friendly hand his funeral pyre compose. Who stops to plunder at this signal hour, the birds shall tear him, and the dogs devour. Furious, he said, the smarting scourge resounds, the coursers fly, the smoking chariot bounds. The hosts rush on, loud clamors shake the shore, the horses thunder, earth and ocean roar. Apollo, planted at the trenches bound, pushed at the bank, down sank the enormous mound, rolled in the ditch the heapy ruin lay, a sudden road, a long and ample way. O'er the dread fosse a late impervious space, now steeds and men and cars tumultuous pass. The wondering crowds the downward level trod, before them flamed the shield and marched the god. Then with his hand he shook the mighty wall, and lo, the turrets nod, the bulwarks fall. Easy, as when ashore an infant stands and draws imagined houses in the sands. The sport of wanton, pleased with some new play, sweeps the slight works and fashioned domes away. Thus vanished at thy touch the towers and walls, the toil of thousands in a moment falls. The Grecians gaze around with wild despair, Confused and weary all the powers with prayer, exhort their men with praises, threats, commands, and urge the gods with voices, eyes, and hands. Experienced Nestor chief obtests the skies, and weeps his country with a father's eyes. O oh, Jove, if ever on his native shore one Greek enriched thy shrine with offered gore, if e'er in hope our country to behold, we paid the fattest firstlings of the fold. If e'er thou sign'st our wishes with thy nod, perform the promise of a gracious God. This day preserve our navies from the flame, and save the relics of the Grecian name. Thus prayed the sage. The Eternal gave consent, and peals of thunder shook the firmament. Presumptuous Troy mistook the accepting sign, and catched new fury at the voice divine. As when black tempests mix the seas and skies, the roaring deeps in watery mountains rise, above the sides of some tall ship ascend, its womb they deluge, and its ribs they rend. Thus loudly roaring and o'erpowering all, mount the thick Trojans up the Grecian wall. Legions on legions from each side arise, thick sound the keels, the storm of arrows flies. Fierce on the ships above, the cars below, these wield the mace, and those the javelin throw. While thus the thunder of the battle raged, and laboring armies round the works engaged, still in the tent Patroclus sat to tend the good Eurypolis, his wounded friend. He sprinkles healing balms to anguish kind, 
and adds discourse the medicine of the mind but when he saw ascending up the fleet victorious troy then starting from his seat with bitter groans his sorrows he expressed he wrings his hands he beats his manly breast though yet thy state require redress he cries depart i must what horrors strike my eyes charged with achilles high command i go a mournful witness of this scene of woe i haste to urge him by his country's care to rise in arms and shine again in war perhaps some favoring god his soul may bend the voice is powerful of a faithful friend he spoke and speaking swifter than the wind sprung from the tent and left the war behind the embodied greeks the fierce attack sustain but strive though numerous to repulse in vain nor could the trojans through that firm array force to the fleet and tents the impervious way as when a shipwright with palladian art smooths the rough wood and levels every part with equal hand he guides his whole design by the just rule and the directing line the martial leaders with like skill and care preserved their line and equal kept the war brave deeds of arms through all the ranks were tried and every ship sustained an equal tide at one proud bark high towering o'er the fleet ajax the great and godlike hector meet for one bright prize the matchless chiefs contend nor this the ships can fire nor that defend one kept the shore and one the vessel trod that fixed as fate this acted by a god the son of clytius in his daring hand the deck approaching shakes a flaming brand but pierced by telamon's huge lance expires thundering he falls and drops the extinguished fires great hector viewed him with a sad survey as stretched in dust before the stern he lay o oh, all of trojan all of lycian race stand to your arms maintain this arduous space lo where the son of royal clytius lies ah save his arms secure his obsequies this said his eager javelin sought the foe but ajax shunned the meditated blow not vainly yet the forceful lance was thrown it stretched in dust unhappy lycophron an exile long sustained at ajax board a faithful servant to a foreign lord in peace and war for ever at his side near his loved master as he lived he died from the high poop he tumbles on the sand and lies a lifeless load along the land with anguish ajax views the piercing sight and thus inflames his brother to the fight teucer behold extended on the shore our friend our loved companion now no more dear as a parent with a parent's care to fight our wars he left his native heir this death deplored to hector's rage we owe revenge revenge it on the cruel foe where are those darts on which the fates attend, and where the bow which Phoebus taught to bend? Impatient Teucer, hastening to his aid, before the chief his ample bow displayed, the well-stored quiver on his shoulders hung, then hissed his arrow, and the bowstring sung. Clytus, Picenor's son, renowned in fame, to thee, Polydemus, an honored name, drove through the thickest of the embattled plains the startling steeds, and shook his eager reins. As all on glory ran his ardent mind, the pointed death arrests him from behind. Through his fair neck the thrilling arrow flies, in youth's first bloom reluctantly he dies. Hurled from the lofty seat, at distance far, the headlong coursers spurn his empty car, till sad Polydemus the steeds restrained and gave Astinous to thy careful hand. Then, fired to vengeance, rushed amidst the foe, rage edged his sword and strengthened every blow once more bold teucer in his country's cause at hector's breast a chosen arrow draws and had the weapon found the destined way thy fall great trojan had renowned that day but hector was not doomed to perish then the all-wise disposer of the fates of men imperial jove his present death withstands nor was such glory due to teucer's hands at its full stretch as the tough string he drew struck by an arm unseen it burst in two down dropped the bow the shaft with brazen head fell innocent and on the dust lay dead 
the astonished archer to great Ajax cries, Some god prevents our destined enterprise. Some god, propitious to the Trojan foe, Has, from my arm unfailing, struck the bow, And broke the nerve my hands had twined with art, Strong to impel the flight of many a dart. Since heaven commands it, Ajax made reply, Dismiss the bow, and lay thy arrows by. Thy arms no less suffice the lance to wield, And quit the quiver for the ponderous shield. In the first ranks indulge thy thirst of fame. Thy brave example shall the rest inflame. Fierce as they are, by long successes vain, To force our fleet or even a ship to gain Asks toil and sweat and blood. Their utmost might shall find its match. No more, tis ours to fight. Then Teucer laid his faithless bow aside, the fourfold buckler o'er his shoulder tied. On his brave head a crested helm he placed, with nodding horsehair formidably graced. A dart, whose point with brass refulgent shines, the warrior wields, and his great brother joins. This Hector saw, and thus expressed his joy. Ye troops of Lycia, Dardanus, and Troy, be mindful of yourselves, your ancient fame, and spread your glory with the navy's flame. Jove is with us. I saw his hand, but now, from the proud archer strike his vaunted bow. Indulgent Jove, how plain thy favors shine, when happy nations bear the marks divine. How easy, then, to see the sinking state of realms accursed, deserted, reprobate. Such is the fate of Greece, and such is ours. Behold, ye warriors, and exert your powers. Death is the worst a fate which all must try, and for our country tis a bliss to die. The gallant man, though slain in fight he be, yet leaves his nation safe, his children free, entails a debt on all the grateful state, his own brave friends shall glory in his fate. His wife live honored, all his race succeed, and late posterity enjoy the deed. This roused the soul in every Trojan breast. The godlike Ajax next his Greeks addressed. How long, ye warriors of the Argive race, To generous Argos what a dire disgrace! How long on these cursed confines will ye lie, Yet undetermined, or to live or die? What hopes remain, what methods to retire, If once your vessels catch the Trojan fire? Make how the flames approach, how near they fall! How Hector calls, and Troy obeys his call! Not to the dance that dreadful voice invites, It calls to death and all the rage of fights. Tis now no time for wisdom or debates, To your own hands are trusted all your fates, And better far in one decisive strife, One day should end our labor or our life, Than keep this hard-got inch of barren sands, Still pressed, and pressed by such inglorious hands. The listening Grecians feel their leader's flame, And every kindling bosom pants for fame. Then mutual slaughters spread on either side. By Hector here the Phocian Scedius died. There, pierced by Ajax, sunk Laodamus, Chief of the foot of old Antenor's race. Polydamus laid Otoas on the sand, The fierce commander of the Epean band. His lance bold Meges at the victor threw, the victor, stooping, from the death withdrew. That valued life, O Phoebus, was thy care. But Chrysmus' bosom took the flying spear. His corpse fell bleeding on the slippery shore. His radiant arms triumphant Meges bore. Dollops, the son of Lampus, rushes on, sprung from the race of old Laomedon, and famed for prowess in a well-fought field, he pierced the center of his sounding shield. But Meges, Phileus, ample breastplate war, well known in fight on Sali's winding shore, for King Euphetes gave the golden mail, compact and firm with many a jointed scale, which oft in cities stormed and battles won, had saved the father, and now saves the son. Full at the Trojan's head he urged his lance, where the high plumes above the helmet dance, new tinged with Tyrian dye. In dust below, shorn from the crest, the purple honors glow. Meantime their fight the Spartan king surveyed, And stood by Meges' side a sudden aid. Through Dollop's shoulder urged his forceful dart, Which held its passage through the panting heart, And issued at his breast. 
With thundering sound, the warrior falls, extended on the ground. In rush the conquering Greeks to spoil the slain, but Hector's voice excites his kindred train. The hero most, from Hecateon sprung, fierce Melanippus, gallant, brave, and young. He, ere to Troy the Grecians crossed the main, fed his large oxen on Percotes' plain. But when oppressed, his country claimed his care, returned to Ilion and excelled in war. For this, in Priam's court, he held his place, beloved no less than Priam's royal race. Him Hector singled, as his troops he led, and thus inflamed him, pointing to the dead. Lo, Melanippus, lo, where Dollops lies, and is it thus our royal kinsman dies? Or matched he falls, to two at once a prey, and lo, they bear the bloody arms away. Come on, a distant war no longer wage, but hand to hand thy country's foes engage, till Greece at once and all her glory end. Or Ilion from her towery height descend, heaved from the lowest stone, and bury all in one sad sepulchre, one common fall. Hector, this said, rushed forward on the foes, with equal ardor Melanippus glows. Then Ajax thus, O Greeks, respect your fame, respect yourselves, and learn an honest shame. Let mutual reverence mutual warmth inspire, and catch from breast to breast the noble fire. On valor's side the odds of combat lie. The brave live glorious or lamented die. The wretch that trembles in the field of fame meets death, and worse than death, eternal shame. His generous sense he not in vain imparts. It sunk and rooted in the Grecian hearts. They join, they throng, they thicken at his call and flank the navy with a brazen wall. Shields touching shields, in order blaze above, and stop the Trojans, though impelled by Jove. The fiery Spartan first, with loud applause, warms the bold son of Nestor in his cause. Is there, he said, in arms a youth like you, so strong to fight, so active to pursue? Why stand you distant, nor attempt a deed? Lift the bold lance and make some Trojan bleed. He said, and backward to the lines retired. Forth rushed the youth with martial fury fired, beyond the foremost ranks. His lance he threw, and round the black battalions cast his view. The troops of Troy recede with sudden fear, while the swift javelin hissed along in air. Advancing Melanippus met the dart with his bold breast, and felt it in his heart. Thundering he falls, his falling arms resound, and his broad buckler rings against the ground. The victor leaps upon his prostrate prize. Thus on a row the well-breathed beagle flies, and rends his side, fresh bleeding with the dart the distant hunter sent into his heart. Observing Hector to the rescue flew, bold as he was, Antilochus withdrew. So when a savage ranging o'er the plain has torn the shepherd's dog or shepherd's swain, while conscious of the deed he glares around, and hears the gathering multitude resound, timely he flies the yet untasted food, and gains the friendly shelter of the wood. So fears the youth. All Troy with shouts pursue, while stones and darts in mingled tempest flew. But entered in the Grecian ranks, he turns his manly breast and with new fury burns. Now on the fleet the tides of Trojans drove, fierce to fulfill the stern decrees of Jove. The sire of gods, confirming Thetis' prayer, the Grecian ardor quenched in deep despair. But lifts to glory Troy's prevailing bands, swells all their hearts, and strengthens all their hands. On Ida's top he waits with longing eyes, to view the navy blazing to the skies. Then, nor tell then, the scale of war shall turn. The Trojans fly, and conquered Ilion burn. These fates revolved in his almighty mind. He raises Hector to the work designed, bids him with more than mortal fury glow, and drives him, like a lightning, on the foe. So Mars, when human crimes for vengeance call, shakes his huge javelin, and whole armies fall. Not with more rage a conflagration rolls, wraps the vast mountains, and involves the poles. He foams with wrath. Beneath his gloomy brow like fiery meteors his red eyeballs glow. The radiant helmet on his temple burns, waves when he nods, and lightens as he turns. 
for jove his splendor round the chief had thrown and cast the blaze of both the hosts on one unhappy glories for his fate was near due to stern pallas and pelides spear yet jove deferred the death he was to pay and gave what fate allowed the honors of a day now all on fire for fame his breast his eyes burn at each foe and single every prize still at the closest ranks the thickest fight he points his ardor and exerts his might the grecian phalanx moveless as a tower on all sides battered yet resists his power so some tall rock o'erhangs the hoary main by winds assailed by billows beat in vain unmoved it hears above the tempest blow and sees the watery mountains break below girt in surrounding flames he seems to fall like fire from jove and bursts upon them all bursts as a wave that from the cloud impends and swelled with tempests on the ship descends white are the decks with foam the winds aloud howl o'er the masts and sing through every shroud pale trembling tired the sailors freeze with fears and instant death on every wave appears so pale the greeks the eyes of hector meet the chief so thunders and so shakes the fleet as when a lion rushing from his den amidst the plain of some wide watered fen where numerous oxen as at ease they feed at large expatiate o'er the rancor mead leaps on the herds before the herdsman's eyes the trembling herdsman far to distance flies some lordly bull the rest dispersed and fled he singles out arrests and lays him dead thus from the rage of jove like hector flew all greece in heaps but one he seized and slew mycenaean periphes a mighty name in wisdom great in arms well known to fame the minister of stern eurystheus ire against alcides copreus was his sire the son redeemed the honors of the race a son as generous as the sire was base o'er all his country's youth conspicuous far in every virtue or of peace or war but doomed to hector stronger force to yield against the margin of his ample shield he struck his hasty foot his heels upsprung supine he fell his brazen helmet rung on the fallen chief the invading trojan pressed and plunged the pointed javelin in his breast his circling friends who strove to guard too late the unhappy hero fled or shared his fate chased from the foremost line the grecian train now man the next receding toward the main wedged in one body at the tents they stand walled round with sterns a gloomy desperate band now manly shame forbids the inglorious flight now fear itself confines them to the fight man courage breathes in man but nestor most the sage preserver of the grecian host exhorts adjures to guard these utmost shores and by their parents by themselves implores o oh, friends be men your generous breasts inflame with mutual honor and with mutual shame think of your hopes your fortunes all the care your wives your infants and your parents share think of each living father's reverend head think of each ancestor with glory dead absent by me they speak by me they sue they ask their safety and their fame from you the gods their fates on this one action lay and all are lost if you desert the day he spoke and round him breathed heroic fires minerva seconds what the sage inspires the mist of darkness jove around them threw she cleared restoring all the war to view a sudden ray shot beaming o'er the plain and showed the shores the navy and the main hector they saw and all who fly or fight the scene wide opening to the blaze of light first of the field great ajax strikes their eyes his port majestic and his ample size a ponderous mace with studs of iron crowned full twenty cubits long he swings around nor fights like others fixed to certain stands but looks a moving tower above the bands high on the decks with vast gigantic stride the godlike hero stalks from side to side so when a horseman from the watery mead skilled in the manage of the bounding steed drives four fair coursers practised to obey to some great city through the public way safe in his art as side by side they run he shifts his seat and vaults from one to one 
And now to this and now to that he flies, Admiring numbers follow with their eyes. From ship to ship thus Ajax swiftly flew, No less the wonder of the warring crew. As furious, Hector thundered threats aloud, And rushed, enraged, before the Trojan crowd. Then swift invades the ships, whose beaky prores Lay ranked contiguous on the bending shores. So the strong eagle from his airy height, Who marks the swans or cranes embodied flight, Stoops down impetuous while they light for food, And, stooping, darkens with his wings the flood. Jove leads him on with his almighty hand, And breathes fierce spirits in his following band. The warring nations meet, the battle roars, Thick beats the combat on the sounding prores. Thou wouldst have thought, so furious was their fire, No force could tame them, and no toil could tire. As if new vigor from new fights they won, And the long battle was but then begun. Greece, yet unconquered, kept alive the war, Secure of death, confiding in despair. Troy in proud hopes already viewed the main Bright with the blaze, and red with heroes slain. Like strength is felt from hope, and from despair, And each contends, as his were all the war. T'was thou, bold Hector, whose resistless hand First seized a ship on that contested strand, The same which dead Protesilus bore, The first that touched the unhappy Trojan shore. For this in arms the warring nations stood, And bathed their generous breasts with mutual blood. No room to poise the lance or bend the bow, But hand to hand and man to man they grow. Wounded they wound, and seek each other's hearts With falchions, axes, swords, and shortened darts. The falchions ring, shields rattle, axes sound, Swords flash in air or glitter on the ground. With streaming blood the slippery shores are dyed, And slaughtered heroes swell the dreadful tide. Still raging, Hector with his ample hand Grasps the high stern, and gives this loud command. Haste, bring the flames, that toil of ten long years Is finished, and the day desired appears. This happy day with acclamations greet, Bright with destruction of yon hostile fleet. The coward counsels of a timorous throng Of reverent daughters checked our glory long. Too long, Jove lulled us with lethargic charms, But now in peals of thunder calls to arms. In this great day he crowns our full desires, Wakes all our force, and seconds all our fires. He spoke. The warriors at his fierce command Pour a new deluge on the Grecian band. Even Ajax paused, so thick the javelins fly, Stepped back, and doubted or to live or die. Yet, where the oars are placed, he stands to wait What chief approaching dares attempt his fate. Even to the last his naval charge defends, Now shakes his spear, now lifts, and now protends. Even yet the Greeks with piercing shouts inspires, Amidst attacks, and deaths, and darts, and fires. O friends, O heroes, names for ever dear, Once sons of Mars, and thunderbolts of war. Ah, yet, be mindful of your old renown, Your great forefathers' virtues and your own. What aids expect you in this utmost strait? What bulwarks rising between you and fate? No aids, no bulwarks your retreat attend, No friends to help, no city to defend. This spot is all you have, to lose or keep. There stand the Trojans, and here rolls the deep. Tis hostile ground you tread, your native lands far, far from hence, your fates are in your hands. Raging he spoke, nor further wastes his breath, but turns his javelin to the work of death. What e'er bold Trojan armed his daring hands, against the sable ships with flaming brands, so well the chief his naval weapon sped, the luckless warrior at his stern lay dead. Full twelve, the boldest, in a moment fell, sent by great Ajax to the shades of hell. The, the sixth, sixth battle, battle, the, the acts, acts and death, death of, of Patroclus. Patroclus, in pursuance of the request of Nestor in the eleventh book, entreats Achilles to suffer him to go to the assistance of the Greeks with Achilles' troops and armor. He agrees to it, but at the same time charges him to content himself with rescuing the fleet without further pursuit of the enemy. The armor, horses, soldiers, and officers are described. 
Achilles offers a libation for the success of his friend, after which Patroclus leads the Myrmidons to battle. The Trojans, at the sight of Patroclus in Achilles' armor, taking him for that hero, are cast into the uttermost consternation. He beats them off from the vessels, Hector himself flies, Sarpedon is killed, though Jupiter was averse to his fate. Several other particulars of the battle are described, in the heat of which Patroclus, neglecting the orders of Achilles, pursues the foe to the walls of Troy, where Apollo repulses and disarms him, Euphorbus wounds him, and Hector kills him, which concludes the book. So warred both armies on the ensanguined shore, while the black vessels smoked with human gore. Meantime Patroclus to Achilles flies, the streaming tears fall copious from his eyes, not faster trickling to the plains below, from the tall rock the sable waters flow. Divine Pelides, with compassion moved, thus spoke, indulgent, to his best beloved. Patroclus, say what grief thy bosom bears, that flows so fast in these unmanly tears. No girl, no infant whom the mother keeps from her loved breast, with fonder passion weeps. Not more the mother's soul that infant warms, clung to her knees and reaching at her arms, than thou hast mine. Oh, tell me, to what end thy melting sorrows thus pursue thy friend? Griefs thou for me or for my martial band? Or come sad tidings from our native land? Our fathers live, our first most tender care. Thy good Menetius breathes the vital air, and hoary Peleus yet extends his days, pleased in their age to hear their children's praise. Or may some meaner cause thy pity claim. Perhaps yon relics of the Grecian name, doomed in their ships to sink by fire and sword, and pay the forfeit of their haughty lord. Whate'er the cause, reveal thy secret care, and speak those sorrows which a friend would share. A sigh that instant from his bosom broke, another followed, and Patroclus spoke. Let Greece at length with pity touch thy breast, thyself a Greek, and once of Greeks the best. Lo, every chief that might her fate prevent lies pierced with wounds and bleeding in his tent. Eurypolis, Tydides, Atreus' son, and wise Ulysses at the navy groan, more for their country's wounds than for their own. Their pain soft arts of pharmacy can ease. Thy breast alone no lenitives appease. May never rage like thine my soul enslave, O great in vain, unprofitably brave. Thy country slighted in her last distress, What friend, what man from thee shall hope redress? No, men unborn and ages yet behind Shall curse that fierce, that unforgiving mind. O man unpitying, if of man thy race, But sure thou spring'st not from a soft embrace, Nor ever amorous hero caused thy birth, Nor ever tender goddess brought thee forth. Some rugged rocks hard entrails gave thee form, and raging seas produced thee in a storm, a soul well suiting that tempestuous kind, so rough thy manners, so untamed thy mind. If some dire oracle thy breast alarm, if aught from Jove or Thetis stop thy arm, some beam of comfort yet on Greece may shine, if I but lead the Myrmidonian line. Clad in thy dreadful arms if I appear, proud Troy shall tremble and desert the war. Without thy person, Greece shall win the day, and thy mere image chase her foes away. Pressed by fresh forces, her o'er-labored train shall quit the ships, and Greece respire again. Thus, blind to fate, with supplicating breath, thou begst his arms, and in his arms thy death. Unfortunately good, a boding sigh thy friend returned, and with it this reply. Patroclus, thy Achilles knows no fears, nor words from Jove, nor oracles he hears, nor aught a mother's caution can suggest. The tyrant's pride lies rooted in my breast. My wrongs, my wrongs, my constant thought engage. Those, my sole oracles, inspire my rage. I made him tyrant, gave him power to wrong even me. I felt it, and shall feel it long." The maid, my black-eyed maid, he forced away, due to the toils of many a well-fought day, due to my conquest of her father's reign, due to the votes of all the Grecian train. From me he forced her, me, the bold and brave, disgraced, dishonored, 
like the meanest slave. But bear we this, the wrongs I grieve are past, tis time our fury should relent at last. I fixed its date, the day I wished appears, how Hector to my ships his battle bears, the flames my eyes, the shouts invade my ears. Go then, Patroclus, court fair honor's charms in Troy's famed fields, and in Achilles' arms. Lead forth my martial myrmidons to fight. Go, save the fleets, and conquer in my right. See the thin relics of their baffled band at the last edge of yon deserted land. Behold all Ilion on their ships descends, how the cloud blackens, how the storm impends. It was not thus, when at my sight amazed, Troy saw and trembled as this helmet blazed. Had not the injurious king our friendship lost, yon ample trench had buried half her host. No camps, no bulwarks now the Trojans fear, those are not dreadful, no Achilles there. No longer flames the lance of Tydeus' son, no more your general calls his heroes on. Hector alone I hear. His dreadful breath commands your slaughter or proclaims your death. Yet now Patroclus issue to the plain, now save the ships, the rising fires restrain, and give the Greeks to visit Greece again. But heed my words, and mark a friend's command, who trusts his fame and honors in thy hand, and from thy deeds expects the Achaean host shall render back the beauteous maid he lost. Rage uncontrolled through all the hostile crew, but touch not Hector, Hector is my due. Though Jove in thunder should command the war, be just, consult my glory, and forbear. The fleet once saved, desist from further chase, nor lead to Ilion's walls the Grecian race. Some adverse god thy rashness may destroy, some god, like Phoebus, ever kind to Troy. Let Greece, redeemed from this destructive strait, do her own work, and leave the rest to fate. O oh, would to all the immortal powers above, Apollo, Pallas, and almighty Jove, that not one Trojan might be left alive, and not a Greek of all the race survive. Might only we the vast destruction shun, and only we destroy the accursed town. Such conference held the chiefs, while on the strand great Jove with conquest crowned the Trojan band. Ajax no more the sounding storm sustained, so thick the darts in iron tempest rained. On his tired arm the weighty buckler hung, his hollow helm with falling javelins rung. His breath in quick short pantings comes and goes, and painful sweat from all his members flows. Spent and overpowered, he barely breathes at most. Yet scarce an army stirs him from his post. Dangers on dangers all around him glow, And toil to toil, and woe succeeds to woe. Say, muses, throned above the starry frame, How first the navy blazed with Trojan flame. Stern Hector waved his sword, and standing near, Where furious Ajax plied his ashen spear, Full on the lance a stroke so justly sped That the broad falchion lopped its brazen head. His pointless spear the warrior shakes in vain, The brazen head falls sounding on the plain. Great Ajax saw and owned the hand divine, Confessing Jove and trembling at the sign, Warned he retreats. Then swift from all sides pour the hissing brands, Thick streams the fiery shower, o'er the high stern the curling volumes rise, and sheets of rolling smoke involve the skies. Divine Achilles viewed the rising flames, and smote his thigh, and thus aloud exclaims, Arm, arm, Patroclus, lo, the blaze aspires, the glowing ocean reddens with the fires. Arm, ere our vessels catch the spreading flame, arm, ere the Grecians be no more a name. I haste to bring the troops, the hero said, the friend with ardor and with joy obeyed. He cased his limbs in brass, and first around his manly legs with silver buckles bound the clasping greaves. Then to his breast applies the flaming cuirass of a thousand dyes. Emblazed with studs of gold his falchion shone in the rich belt as in a starry zone. Achilles' shield his ample shoulders spread, Achilles' helmet nodded o'er his head. Adorned in all his terrible array, he flashed around intolerable day. Alone untouched, Pelides' javelin stands, not to be poised but by Pelides' hands. 
From Pelion's shady brow the plant entire old Chiron rent, and shaped it for his sire, whose son's great arm alone the weapon wields, the death of heroes, and the dread of fields. The brave Atomedon, an honoured name, the second to his lord in love and fame, in peace his friend and partner of the war, the winged coursers harnessed to the car. Xanthus and Balius, of immortal breed, sprung from the wind and like the wind in speed, whom the winged harpy swift Podargi bore, by Zephyr pregnant on the breezy shore. Swift Pedasus was added to their side, once great Atians, now Achilles' pride, who, like in strength, in swiftness and in grace, a mortal courser matched the immortal race. Achilles speeds from tent to tent, and warms his hardy myrmidons to blood and arms. All breathing death, around the chief they stand, a grim, terrific, formidable band. Grim as voracious wolves that seek the springs, when scalding thirst their burning bowels rings. When some tall stag, fresh slaughtered in the wood, has drenched their wide insatiate throats with blood. To the black fount they rush, a hideous throng, with paunch distended and with lolling tongue. Fire fills their eye, their black jaws belch the gore, and gorged with slaughter still they thirst for more. Like furious rushed the Myrmidonian crew, such their dread strength and such their deathful view. High in the midst the great Achilles stands, directs their order and the war commands. He loved of Jove, had launched for Ilion's shores full fifty vessels, manned with fifty oars. Five chosen leaders the fierce bands obey, himself supreme in valor as in sway. First marched Menestheus of celestial birth, derived from thee, whose waters wash the earth, divine Spercuse, Jove descended flood, a mortal mother mixing with a god. Such was Menestheus, but miscalled by fame the son of Boris, that espoused the dame. Eudorus next, whom Palamela the gay, famed in the graceful dance, produced to-day. Her sly Selenius loved. On her would gaze, as with swift step she formed the running maze. To her high chamber from Diana's choir the god pursued her, urged, and crowned his fire. The son confessed his father's heavenly race, and aired his mother's swiftness in the chase. Strong Akeklus, blessed in all those charms that pleased a god, succeeded to her arms. Not conscious of those loves, long hid from fame, with gifts of price he sought and won the dame. Her secret offspring to her sire she bare, her sire caressed him with a parent's care. Pisander followed, matchless in his art to wing the spear or aim the distant dart. No hand so sure of all the Emathian line, or, if a surer, great Patroclus, thine. The fourth by Phoenix, grave command was graced. Laerces, valiant offspring, led the last. Soon as Achilles with superior care had called the chiefs and ordered all the war, this stern remembrance to his troops he gave. Ye far-famed Myrmidons, ye fierce and brave, think with what threats you dared the Trojan throng. Think what reproach these ears endured so long. Stern son of Peleus, thus ye used to say, while restless, raging in your ships you lay, O oh, nursed with gall, unknowing how to yield, whose rage defrauds us of so famed a field. If that dire fury must for ever burn, what make we here? Return, ye chiefs, return. Such were your words. Now, warriors, grieve no more. Lo, there are the Trojans. Bathe your swords in gore. This day shall give you all your soul demands, glut all your hearts, and weary all your hands. Thus, while he roused the fire in every breast, close and more close the listening cohorts pressed. Ranks wedged in ranks, of arms a steely ring still grows, and spreads, and thickens round the king. As when a circling wall the builder forms, of strength defensive against wind and storms, Compacted stones the thickening work compose, and round him wide the rising structure grows. So helm to helm and crest to crest they throng, shield urged on shield and man drove man along. Thick, undistinguished plumes together joined, 
float in one sea, and wave before the wind. Far o'er the rest in glittering pomp appear, there bold Automedon, Patroclus here, brothers in arms with equal fury fired, two friends, two bodies with one soul inspired. But mindful of the gods, Achilles went to the rich coffer in his shady tent. There lay on heaps his various garments rolled, and costly furs, and carpets stiff with gold, the presence of the silver-footed dame. From thence he took a bowl of antique frame, which never man had stained with ruddy wine, nor raised in offerings to the power divine, but Peleus' son, and Peleus' son to none had raised in offerings but to Jove alone. This tinged with sulphur, sacred first to flame, he purged, and washed it in the running stream. Then cleansed his hands, and fixing for a space his eyes on heaven, his feet upon the place of sacrifice, the purple draught he poured forth in the midst, and thus the god implored. O thou supreme, high-throned all height above! O great Pelasgic, Dodonian Jove, who midst surrounding frosts and vapors chill, presidest on bleak Dodono's vocal hill, whose groves the Selly, race austere, surround, their feet unwashed, their slumbers on the ground, who hear from rustling oaks thy dark decrees, and catch the fates, low whispered in the breeze. Here, as of old, thou gavest at Theta's prayer glory to me, and to the Greeks' despair. Lo, to the dangers of the fighting field the best, the dearest of my friends I yield, though still determined to my ships confined. Patroclus gone, I stay but half behind. O oh, be his guard, thy providential care, confirm his heart and string his arm to war. Pressed by his single force, let Hector see his fame in arms not owing all to me. But when the fleets are saved from foes and fire, let him with conquest and renown retire. Preserve his arms, preserve his social train, and safe return him to these eyes again. Great Jove consents to half the chief's request, but heaven's eternal doom denies the rest. To free the fleet was granted to his prayer. His safe return the winds dispersed in air. Back to his tent the stern Achilles flies and waits the combat with impatient eyes. Meanwhile the troops beneath Patroclus' care invade the Trojans and commence the war. As wasps, provoked by children in their play, pour from their mansions by the broad highway, in swarms the guiltless traveler engage, whet all their stings and call forth all their rage. All rise in arms and with a general cry assert their waxen domes and buzzing progeny. Thus from the tents the fervent legion swarms, so loud their clamors and so keen their arms. Their rising rage Patroclus' breath inspires, who thus inflames them with heroic fires. O warriors, partners of Achilles' praise, be mindful of your deeds in ancient days. Your godlike master let your acts proclaim, and add new glories to his mighty name. Think your Achilles sees you fight. Be brave, and humble the proud monarch whom you save. Joyful they heard, and kindling as he spoke, flew to the fleet, involved in fire and smoke. From shore to shore the doubling shouts resound, the hollow ships return a deeper sound. The war stood still, and all around them gazed, when great Achilles' shining armor blazed. Troy saw and thought the dread Achilles nigh, at once they see, they tremble, and they fly. Then first thy spear, divine Patroclus, flew, where the war raged and where the tumult grew. Close to the stern of that famed ship which bore unblessed Protesilaus to Ilion's shore, the great Paeonian bold Pyrechmes stood, who led his bands from Axius' winding flood. His shoulder-blade receives the fatal wound. The groaning warrior pants upon the ground. His troops, that see their country's glory slain, fly diverse, scattered o'er the distant plain. Patroclus' arm forbids the spreading fires, and from the half-burned ship proud Troy retires. Cleared from the smoke the joyful navy lies, in heaps on heaps the foe tumultuous flies. Triumphant Greece her rescued decks ascends, and loud acclaim the starry region rends. So when thick clouds enwrap the mountain's head, or heaven's expanse like one black ceiling spread, Sudden the thunderer, with a flashing ray, 
bursts through the darkness and lets down the day. The hills shine out, the rocks in prospect rise, and streams and vales and forests strike the eyes. The smiling scene wide opens to the sight, and all the unmeasured ether flames with light. But Troy, repulsed and scattered o'er the plains, forced from the navy, yet the fight maintains. Now every Greek some hostile hero slew, but still the foremost, bold Patroclus flew. As Arielicus had turned him round, sharp in his thigh he felt the piercing wound, the brazen-pointed spear with vigor thrown, the thigh transfixed and broke the brittle bone. Headlong he fell. Next Thoas was thy chance, thy breast unarmed received the Spartan lance. Philides' dart, as Amphetus drew nigh, his blow prevented, and transpierced his thigh, tore all the brawn, and rent the nerves away. In darkness and in death the warrior lay. In equal arms two sons of Nestor stand, and two bold brothers of the Lycian band. By great Antilochus and Timnius dies, pierced in the flank, lamented youth he lies. Kind Maris, bleeding in his brother's wound, defends the breathless carcass on the ground. Furious he flies, his murderer to engage, but godlike Thrasymed prevents his rage. Between his arm and shoulder aims a blow, his arm falls spouting on the dust below. He sinks with endless darkness covered o'er, and vents his soul effused with gushing gore. Slain by two brothers, thus two brothers bleed, Sarpedon's friends, Amasodorus seed. Amasodorus, who by furies led, the bane of men, abhorred chimera bred. Skilled in the dart in vain, his sons expire, and pay the forfeit of their guilty sire. Stopped in the tumult, Cleobulus lies, beneath Oileus' arm, a living prize. A living prize not long the Trojan stood. The thirsty falchion drank his reeking blood. Plunged in his throat the smoking weapon lies, Black death and fate unpitying seal his eyes. Amid the ranks, with mutual thirst of fame, Like on the brave and fierce Penelius came, In vain their javelins at each other flew, Now, met in arms, their eager swords they drew. On the plumed crest of his Boeotian foe The daring lycan aimed a noble blow. The sword broke short, but his, Penelius, Sped full on the juncture of the neck and head. The head, divided by a stroke so just, hung by the skin, the body sunk to dust. Or taken Neamus by Morion bleeds, pierced through the shoulder as he mounts his steeds. Back from the car he tumbles to the ground, his swimming eyes eternal shades surround. Next Aramis was doomed his fate to feel, his opened mouth received the Cretan steel. Beneath the brain the point a passage tore, Crashed the thin bones, and drowned the teeth in gore. His mouth, his eyes, his nostrils pour a flood. He sobs his soul out in the gush of blood. As when the flocks, neglected by the swain, Or kids or lambs, lie scattered o'er the plain, A troop of wolves the unguarded charge survey, And rent the trembling, unresisting prey. Thus on the foe the Greeks impetuous came, Troy fled, unmindful of her former fame. But still at Hector godlike Ajax aimed, Still, pointed at his breast, his javelin flamed. The Trojan chief, experienced in the field, O'er his broad shoulders spread the massy shield, Observed the storm of darts the Grecians pour, And on his buckler caught the ringing shower. He sees for Greece the scale of conquest rise, Yet stops, and turns, and saves his loved allies. As when the hand of Jove a tempest forms, And rolls the cloud to blacken heaven with storms, Dark o'er the fields the ascending vapor flies, And shades the sun, and blots the golden skies. So from the ships along the dusky plain, Dire flight and terror drove the Trojan train. Even Hector fled. Through heads of disarray the fiery coursers forced their lord away, While far behind his Trojans fall confused, Wedged in the trench, in one vast carnage bruised. Chariots on chariots roll, the clashing spokes shock, while the madding steeds break short their yokes. In vain they labor up the steepy mound, their charioteers lie foaming on the ground. Fierce on the rear with shouts Patroclus flies, 
tumultuous clamor fills the fields and skies. Thick drifts of dust involve their rapid flight. Clouds rise on clouds, and heaven is snatched from sight. The affrighted steeds their dying lords cast down, scour o'er the fields and stretch to reach the town. Loud o'er the rout was heard the victor's cry, where the war bleeds and where the thickest die, where horse and arms and chariots be o'erthrown, and bleeding heroes under axles groan. No stop, no check, the steeds of Peleus knew. From bank to bank the immortal coursers flew. High bounding o'er the foss, the whirling car smokes through the ranks, or takes the flying war, and thunders after Hector. Hector flies, Patroclus shakes his lance, but fate denies. Not with less noise, with less impetuous force, the tide of Trojans urge their desperate course, than when in autumn Jove his fury pours, and earth is loaden with incessant showers. When guilty mortals break the eternal laws, or judges, bribed, betray the righteous cause, from their deep beds he bids the rivers rise, and opens all the floodgates of the skies. The impetuous torrents from their hills obey, whole fields are drowned, and mountains swept away. Loud roars the deluge till it meets the main, and trembling man sees all his labors vain. And now the chief, the foremost troops repelled, back to the ships his destined progress held bore down half Troy in his resistless way, and forced the routed ranks to stand the day. Between the space where silver Samos flows, where lay the fleets and where the rampires rose, all grim in dust and blood Patroclus stands, and turns the slaughter on the conquering bands. First Pronoas died beneath his fiery dart, which pierced below the shield his valiant heart. Thestor was next, who saw the chief appear, and fell the victim of his coward fear. Shrunk up he sat with wild and haggard eye, nor stood to combat, nor had force to fly. Patroclus marked him as he shunned the war, and with unmanly trembling shook the car, and dropped the flowing reins. Him twixt the jaws the javelin sticks, and from the chariot draws. As on a rock that overhangs the main, an angler, studious of the line and cane, some mighty fish draws panting to the shore. Not with less ease the barbed javelin bore the gaping dastard. As the spear was shook, he fell, and life his heartless breast forsook. Next on Ariales he flies. A stone, large as a rock, was by his fury thrown. Full on his crown the ponderous fragment flew, and burst the helm, and cleft the head in two. Prone to the ground, the breathless warrior fell, and death involved him with the shades of hell. Then low in dust, Epaltes, Echius lie, Iphus, Evipus, Polymilus die, Amphoterus and Eremus succeed, and last Tipolemus and Pyrus bleed. Where'er he moves, the growing slaughter spread in heaps on heaps a monument of dead. When now Sarpedon his brave friends beheld groveling in dust and gasping on the field, with this reproach his flying host he warms. O stain to honor, O disgrace to arms, Forsake inglorious the contended plain. This hand unaided shall the war sustain, The task be mine this hero's strength to try, Who mows whole troops and makes an army fly. He spake, and speaking, leaps from off the car. Patroclus lights and sternly waits the war. As when two vultures on the mountain's height Stoop with resounding pinions to the fight, They cuff, they tear, they raise a screaming cry, The desert echoes and the rocks reply. The warriors thus opposed in arms Engage with equal clamors and with equal rage. Jove viewed the combat, whose event foreseen, He thus bespoke his sister and his queen. The hour draws on, the destinies ordain, My godlike son shall press the Phrygian plain. Already on the verge of death he stands, His life is owed to fierce Patroclus' hands. What passions in a parent's breast debate? Say, shall I snatch him from impending fate, And send him safe to Lycia, Distant far from all the dangers and the toils of war? Or to his doom my bravest offspring yield, And fatten with celestial blood the field? Then thus the goddess with the radiant eyes, What words are these, O sovereign of the skies? Short is the date prescribed to mortal man. Shall Jove for one extend the narrow span, Whose bounds were fixed before his race began? 
How many sons of gods, foredoomed to death, Before proud Aelian must resign their breath? Were thine exempt, debate would rise above, And murmuring powers condemn their partial Jove. Give the bold chief a glorious fate in fight, And when the ascending soul has winged her flight, Let sleep and death convey, by thy command, The breathless body to his native land. His friends and people to his future praise, A marble tomb and pyramid shall raise, And lasting honors to his ashes give. His fame, tis all the dead can have, shall live. She said, the cloud compeller overcome, Assents to fate and ratifies the doom. Then touched with grief, the weeping heavens Distilled a shower of blood o'er all the fatal field. The god, his eyes averting from the plain, Laments his son, predestined to be slain, Far from the Lycian shores, his happy native reign. Now met in arms the combatants appear, Each heaved the shield and poised the lifted spear. From strong Patroclus' hand the javelin fled, And passed the groin of valiant Thrasymede. The nerves unbraced no more his bulk sustain, He falls, and falling, bites the bloody plain. Two sounding darts the Lycian leader threw, The first aloof with erring fury flew, The next transpierced Achilles' mortal steed, The generous Pedasus of Theban breed. Fixed in the shoulder's joint, he reeled around, Rolled in the bloody dust, and pawed the slippery ground. His sudden fall the entangled harness broke, Each axle crackled, and the chariot shook. When bold Automedon, to disengage the starting coursers and restrain their rage, divides the traces with his sword, and freed the encumbered chariot from the dying steed. The rest move on, obedient to the rein. The car rolls slowly o'er the dusty plain. The towering chiefs to fiercer fight advance. The first Sarpedon whirled his weighty lance, which o'er the warrior's shoulder took its course, and spent in empty air its dying force. Not so Patroclus' never erring dart. Aimed at his breast it pierced a mortal part, where the strong fibres bind the solid heart. Then, as the mountain oak, or poplar tall, or pine, fit mast for some great admiral, nods to the axe, till with a groaning sound it sinks, and spreads its honours on the ground, thus fell the king, and laid on earth supine, before his chariot stretched his form divine. He grasped the dust, disdained with streaming gore, and, pale in death, lay groaning on the shore. So lies a bull beneath the lion's paws, while the grim savage grinds with foamy jaws the trembling limbs, and sucks the smoking blood. Deep groans and hollow roars rebellow through the wood. Then to the leader of the Lycian band the dying chief addressed his last command. Glaucus, be bold. Thy task be first to dare the glorious dangers of destructive war, to lead my troops, to combat at their head, incite the living and supply the dead. Tell them, I charged them with my latest breath, not unrevenged to bear Sarpedon's death. What grief, what shame must Glaucus undergo, if these spoiled arms adorn a Grecian foe? Then as a friend and as a warrior fight, defend my body, conquer in my right, that, taught by great examples, all may try like thee to vanquish, or like me to die. He ceased. The fates suppressed his laboring breath, and his eyes darkened with the shades of death. The insulting victor with disdain bestrode the prostrate prince, and on his bosom trod. Then drew the weapon from his panting heart, the reeking fibres clinging to the dart. From the wide wound gushed out a stream of blood, and the soul issued in the purple flood. His flying steeds the myrmidons detain, unguided now their mighty master slain. All impotent of aid, transfixed with grief, unhappy Glaucus heard the dying chief, his painful arm, yet useless with the smart inflicted late by Teucer's deadly dart, supported on his better hand he stayed. To Phoebus, then, t'was all he could, he prayed. All-seeing monarch, whether Lycia's coast or sacred Ilion thy bright presence boast, powerful alike to ease the wretch's smart, O oh, hear me, God of every healing art! Lo, stiff with clotted blood and pierced with pain that thrills my arm and shoots through every vein, I stand unable to sustain the spear, and sigh at distance from the glorious war. Lo, in the dust is great Sarpedon laid, nor Jove vouchsafed his hapless offspring aid. 
But thou, O God of health, thy succour lend, To guard the relics of my slaughtered friend. For thou, though distant, canst restore my might, To head my Lycians, and support the fight. Apollo heard, and, suppliant as he stood, His heavenly hand restrained the flux of blood. He drew the dollars from the wounded part, And breathed the spirit in his rising heart. Renewed by art divine, the hero stands, And owns the assistance of immortal hands. First to the fight his native troops he warms, Then loudly calls on Troy's vindictive arms. With ample strides he stalks from place to place, Now fires Agenor, now Polydamus. Aeneas next, and Hector he accosts, Inflaming thus the rage of all their hosts. What thoughts, regardless chief, thy breast employ? O oh, too forgetful of the friends of Troy! Those generous friends who from their country far Breathe their brave souls out in another's war. See, where in dust the great Sarpedon lies, In action valiant and in counsel wise, Who guarded right and kept his people free, To all his Lycians lost and lost to thee. Stretched by Patroclus' arm on yonder plains, O oh, save from hostile rage his loved remains! Ah, let not Greece his conquered trophies boast, Nor on his course revenge her heroes lost. He spoke, each leader in his grief partook, Troy, at the loss, through all her legions shook. Transfixed with deep regret, they view o'erthrown At once his country's pillar and their own. A chief, who led to Troy's beleaguered wall A host of heroes, and outshined them all. Fired, they rush on, First Hector seeks the foes, and with superior vengeance greatly glows. But o'er the dead the fierce Patroclus stands, and rousing Ajax, roused the listening bands. Heroes be men, be what you were before, or weigh the great occasion and be more. The chief who taught our lofty walls to yield lies pale in death, extended on the field. To guard his body Troy in numbers flies, tis half the glory to maintain our prize. Haste, strip his arms, the slaughter round him spread, And send the living Lycians to the dead. The heroes kindle at his fierce command, The martial squadrons close on either hand. Here Troy and Lycia charge with loud alarms, The Salia there, and Greece, oppose their arms. With horrid shouts they circle round the slain, The clash of armor rings o'er all the plain. Great Jove, to swell the horrors of the fight, o'er the fierce armies pours pernicious night, and round his son confounds the warring hosts, his fate ennobling with a crowd of ghosts. Now Greece gives way, and great Epijus falls, Agacleus' son from Budium's lofty walls, who chased for murder thence a suppliant came to Peleus, and the silver-footed dame. Now sent to Troy, Achilles' arms to aid, he pays due vengeance to his kinsman's shade. Soon as his luckless hand had touched the dead, A rock's large fragment thundered on his head. Hurled by Hectorian force, it cleft in twain his shattered helm, And stretched him o'er the slain. Fierce to the van of fight Patroclus came, And like an eagle darting at his game, Sprung on the Trojan and the Lycian band. What grief thy heart, what fury urged thy hand, O generous Greek! when with full vigor thrown at Sthenelus flew the weighty stone, which sunk him to the dead, when Troy too near that arm drew back, and Hector learned to fear. Far as an able hand a lance can throw, or at the lists, or at the fighting foe, so far the Trojans from their lines retired, till Glaucus, turning, all the rest inspired. Then Bathocles fell beneath his rage, the only hope of Calchon's trembling age. Wide o'er the land was stretched his large domain, With stately seats and riches blessed in vain. Him, bold with youth and eager to pursue The flying Lycians, Glaucus met and slew. Pierced through the bosom with a sudden wound, He fell, and falling made the fields resound. The Achaeans sorrow for their heroes slain. With conquering shouts the Trojans shake the plain And crowd to spoil the dead. The Greeks oppose. An iron circle round the carcass grows. Then brave Laogonus resigned his breath, Dispatched by Merion to the shades of death. On Ida's holy hill he made abode, The priest of Jove, and honored like his god. Between the jaw and ear the javelin went, 
the soul exhaling issued at the vent. His spear Aeneas at the victor threw, who stooping forward from the death withdrew. The lance hissed harmless o'er his covering shield, and trembling struck and rooted in the field. There yet scarce spent it quivers on the plain, sent by the great Aeneas arm in vain. Swift as thou art, the raging hero cries, and skilled in dancing to dispute the prize, my spear, the destined passage had it found, had fixed thy active vigor to the ground. O valiant leader of the Dardan host, insulted Morion thus retorts the boast, strong as you are, tis mortal force you trust, an arm as strong may stretch thee in the dust, and if to this my lance thy fate be given, vain are thy vaunts, success is still from heaven. This, instant, sends thee down to Pluto's coast. Mine is the glory, his thy parting ghost. O friend, Manisha's son, this answer gave, with words to combat ill befits the brave. Not empty boasts the sons of Troy repel, your swords must plunge them to the shades of hell. To speak beseems the counsel, but to dare in glorious action is the task of war. This said, Patroclus to the battle flies, Great Merion follows, and new shouts arise. Shields, helmets rattle as the warriors close, and thick and heavy sounds the storm of blows. As through the shrilling vale or mountain ground the labors of the woodman's axe resound, blows following blows are heard re-echoing wide, while crackling forests fall on every side. Thus echoed all the fields with loud alarms, so fell the warriors, and so rung their arms. Now great Sarpedon on the sandy shore, his heavenly form defaced with dust and gore, and stuck with darts by warring heroes shed, lies undistinguished from the vulgar dead. His long-disputed course the chiefs enclose, on every side the busy combat grows. Thick as beneath some shepherd's thatched abode, the pails high foaming with a milky flood, the buzzing flies, a preserving train, incessant swarm, and chaste return again. Jove viewed the combat with a stern survey, and eyes that flashed intolerable day. Fixed on the field his sight, his breast debates the vengeance due, and meditates the fates, whether to urge their prompt effect, and call the force of Hector to Patroclus' fall, this instant see his short-lived trophies won, and stretch him breathless on his slaughtered son, or yet, with many a soul's untimely flight, augment the fame and horror of the fight. To crown Achilles' valiant friend with praise at length he dooms, and that his last of days shall set in glory bids him drive the foe, nor unattended see the shades below. Then Hector's mind he fills with dire dismay. He mounts his car and calls his hosts away. Sunk with Troy's heavy fates, he sees decline the scales of Jove and pants with awe divine. Then, nor before, the hardy Lycians fled, and left their monarch with the common dead. Around, in heaps on heaps, a dreadful wall of carnage rises as the heroes fall. So Jove decreed. At length the Greeks obtain the prize contested and despoil the slain. The radiant arms are by Patroclus born. Patroclus' ships the glorious spoils adorn. Then thus to Phoebus in the realms above spoke from his throne the cloud-compelling Jove. Descend, my Phoebus, on the Phrygian plain, and from the fight convey Sarpedon slain. Then bathe his body in the crystal flood, with dust dishonored and deformed with blood. O'er all his limbs ambrosial odors shed, and with celestial robes adorn the dead. Those rites discharged, his sacred course bequeathed to the soft arms of silent sleep and death. They to his friends the immortal charge shall bear. His friends a tomb and pyramid shall rear. What honor mortals after death receive, those unavailing honors we may give. Apollo bows, and from Mount Ida's height, swift to the field precipitates his flight. Thence from the war the breathless hero bore, veiled in a cloud, to silver Samoa's shore. There bathed his honorable wounds, and dressed his manly members in the immortal vest and with perfumes of sweet ambrosial dews restores his freshness and his form renews. Then sleep and death, two twins of winged race, of matchless swiftness but of silent pace, received Sarpedon at the gods' command, and in a moment reached the Lycian land. 
The course amidst his weeping friends they laid, Where endless honors wait the sacred shade. Meanwhile Patroclus pours along the plains, With foaming coursers and with loosened reins. Fierce on the Trojan and the Lycian crew, Ah, blind to fate, thy headlong fury flew Against what fate and powerful Jove ordain. Vain was thy friend's command, thy courage vain. For he, the god, whose counsels uncontrolled Dismay the mighty and confound the bold, The god who gives, resumes, and orders all. He urged thee on, and urged thee on to fall. Who first, brave hero, by that arm was slain? Who last beneath thy vengeance pressed the plain? When heaven itself thy fatal fury led And called to fill the number of the dead? Adrestus first, Atonus then succeeds, Echicles follows, next young Migus bleeds. Epistor, Melanippus bite the ground, The slaughter Elysus and Mulius crowned, Then sunk Pilartes to eternal night, The rest, dispersing, trust their fates to flight. Now Troy had stooped beneath his matchless power, But flaming Phoebus kept the sacred tower. Thrice at the battlements Patroclus struck, his blazing aegis thrice Apollo shook. He tried the fourth, when, bursting from the cloud, a more than mortal voice was heard aloud. Patroclus, cease! This heaven-defended wall defies thy lance, not fated yet to fall. Thy friend, thy greater far it shall withstand, Troy shall not stoop even to Achilles' hand. So spoke the god who darts celestial fires. The Greek obeys him, and with awe retires. While Hector checking at the Saon gates his panting coursers, in his breast debates, or in the field his forces to employ, or draw the troops within the walls of Troy. Thus while he thought, beside him Phoebus stood, in Asius' shape, who reigned by Sanger's flood. Thy brother, Hecuba, from Dymas sprung, a valiant warrior, haughty, bold, and young. Thus he accosts him. What a shameful sight! God, is it Hector that forbears the fight? Were thine my vigor, this successful spear should soon convince thee of so false a fear. Turn thee, ah, turn thee to the field of fame, and in Patroclus' blood efface thy shame. Perhaps Apollo shall thy arm succeed, and heaven ordains him by thy lance to bleed. So spoke the inspiring god, then took his flight, and plunged amidst the tumult of the fight. He bids Cabrion drive the rapid car. The lash resounds, the coursers rush to war. The god the Grecians' sinking souls depressed, And poured swift spirits through each Trojan breast. Patroclus lights, impatient for the fight, A spear his left, a stone employs his right. With all his nerves he drives it at the foe, Pointed above and rough and gross below. The falling ruin crushed Cabrion's head, The lawless offspring of King Priam's bed. His front brow's eyes, one undistinguished wound. The bursting balls drop sightless to the ground. The charioteer, while yet he held the rein, Struck from the car, falls headlong on the plain. To the dark shades the soul unwilling glides, While the proud victor thus his fall derides. Good heaven! What active feats yon artist shows! What skillful divers are our Phrygian foes! Mark with what ease they sink into the sand. Pity that all their practice is by land. Then rushing sudden on his prostrate prize, To spoil the carcass fierce Patroclus flies. Swift as a lion, terrible and bold, That sweeps the field, depopulates the fold. Pierced through the dauntless heart, Then tumbles slain and from his fatal courage Finds his bane. At once bold Hector, leaping from his car, Defends the body and provokes the war. Thus for some slaughtered hind, with equal rage, Two lordly rulers of the wood engage. Stung with fierce hunger, each the prey invades, And echoing roars re-bellow through the shades. Stern Hector fastens on the warrior's head, And by the foot Patroclus drags the dead. While all around confusion, rage, and fright Mix the contending hosts in mortal fight. So pent by hills, the wild winds roar aloud In the deep bosom of some gloomy wood. Leaves, arms, and trees aloft in air are blown, The broad oaks crackle and the sylvans groan. This way and that the rattling thicket bends, And the whole forest in one crash descends. 
not with less noise, with less tumultuous rage, in dreadful shock the mingled hosts engage. Darts showered on darts now round the carcass ring, now flights of arrows bounding from the string. Stones follow stones, some clatter on the fields, some hard and heavy shake the sounding shields. But where the rising whirlwind clouds the plains, sunk in soft dust the mighty chief remains, and stretched in death forgets the guiding reins. Now flaming from the zenith, Saul had driven his fervid orb through half the vault of heaven, while on each host with equal tempests fell the showering darts and numbers sank to hell. But when his evening wheels o'erhung the main, glad conquest rested on the Grecian train. Then from amidst the tumult and alarms they draw the conquered course and radiant arms. Then rash Patroclus with new fury glows, and breathing slaughter pours amid the foes. Thrice on the press like Mars himself he flew, and thrice three heroes at each onset slew. There ends thy glory. There the fates untwine the last black remnant of so bright a line. Apollo dreadful stops thy middle way. Death calls, and heaven allows no longer day. For lo, the god in dusky clouds enshrined, approaching dealt a staggering blow behind. The weighty shock his neck and shoulders feel. His eyes flash sparkles, his stunned senses reel in giddy darkness. Far to distance flung, his bounding helmet on the champagne rung. Achilles' plume is stained with dust and gore, that plume which never stooped to earth before. Long used, untouched, in fighting fields to shine, and shade the temples of the mad divine. Jove dooms it now on Hector's helm to nod. Not long, for fate pursues him and the god. His spear in shivers falls, his ample shield drops from his arm, his baldric strows the field. The corslet his astonished breast forsakes, loose is each joint, each nerve with horror shakes. Stupid he stares, and all a assistless stands. Such is the force of more than mortal hands. A Dardan youth there was, well known to fame, from Penthus sprung, Euphorbus was his name, famed for the manage of the foaming horse, skilled in the dart, and matchless in the course. Full twenty nights he tumbled from the car, while yet he learned his rudiments of war. His venturous spear first drew the hero's gore, he struck, he wounded, but he durst no more. Nor, though disarmed, Patroclus' fury stood. But swift withdrew the long protended wood, And turned him short, and herded in the crowd. Thus by an arm divine and mortal spear, Wounded at once, Patroclus yields to fear, Retires for succor to his social train, And flies the fate, which heaven decreed, in vain. Stern Hector, as the bleeding chief he views, breaks through the ranks, and his retreat pursues. The lance arrests him with a mortal wound. He falls, earth thunders, and his arms resound. With him all Greece was sunk. That moment all her yet surviving heroes seemed to fall. So, scorched with heat, along the desert score, the roaming lion meets a bristly boar, fast by the spring. They both dispute the flood, with flaming eyes, and jaws besmeared with blood. At length the sovereign savage wins the strife, and the torn boar resigns his thirst and life. Patroclus thus, so many chiefs o'erthrown, so many lives effused, expires his own. As dying now at Hector's feet he lies, he sternly views him, and triumphant cries, Lie there, Patroclus, and with thee the joy thy pride once promised, of subverting Troy, the fancied scenes of Ilion wrapped in flames, and thy soft pleasures served with captive dames. Unthinking man, I fought those towers to free, and guard that beauteous race from lords like thee. But thou a prey to vultures shalt be made. Thy own Achilles cannot lend thee aid. Though much at parting that great chief might say, and much enjoin thee this important day. Return not, my brave friend, perhaps he said without the bloody arms of Hector dead. He spoke, Patroclus marched, and thus he sped. Supine and wildly gazing on the skies, with faint expiring breath, the chief replies, Vain boaster, cease, and know the powers divine. Jove's and Apollo's is this deed, not thine. 
To heaven is owed whate'er your own you call, And heaven itself disarmed me ere my fall. Had twenty mortals each thy match in might, Opposed me fairly, they had sunk in fight. By fate and Phoebus was I first o'erthrown, Euphorbus next, the third mean part thy own. But thou imperious, hear my latest breath, The gods inspire it, and it sounds thy death. Insulting man, thou shalt be soon as I, Black fate o'erhangs thee, and thy hour draws nigh. Even now on life's last verge I see thee stand, I see thee fall, and by Achilles' hand. He faints. The soul unwilling wings her way, The beauteous body left a load of clay, Flits to the lone, uncomfortable coast, A naked, wandering, melancholy ghost. Then Hector pausing, as his eyes he fed On the pale carcass, thus addressed the dead. From whence this boding speech, the stern decree of death denounced, or why denounced to me? Why not as well Achilles' fate be given to Hector's lance? Who knows the will of heaven? Pensive, he said, then pressing as he lay his breathless bosom, tore the lance away, and upwards cast the course. The reeking spear he shakes, and charges the bold charioteer. But swift Automedon, with loosened reins wrapped in the chariot o'er the distant plains, Far from his rage the immortal coursers drove. The immortal coursers were the gift of Jove. The, the seventh, seventh battle, battle for the, the body, body of Patroclus, Patroclus the, the acts of Menelaus. Menelaus, upon the death of Patroclus, defends his body from the enemy. Euphorbus, who attempts it, is slain. Hector advancing, Menelaus retires, but soon returns with Ajax and drives him off. This Glaucus objects to Hector as a flight, who thereupon puts on the armor he had won from Patroclus and renews the battle. The Greeks give way till Ajax rallies them. Aeneas sustains the Trojans. Aeneas and Hector attempt the chariot of Achilles, which is borne off by Automedon. The horses of Achilles deplore the loss of Patroclus. Jupiter covers his body with a thick darkness. The noble prayer of Ajax on that occasion. Menelaus sends Antilochus to Achilles, with the news of Patroclus' death, then returns to the fight where, though attacked with the utmost fury, he and Meriones, assisted by the Ajaces, bear off the body to the ships. The time is the evening of the eight-and-twentieth day. The scene lies in the fields before Troy. On the cold earth divine Patroclus spread, lies pierced with wounds among the vulgar dead. Great Menelaus, touched with generous woe, springs to the front and guards him from the foe. Thus round her new-fallen young the heifer moves, fruit of her throes and first-born of her loves, and anxious, helpless as he lies and bare, turns and returns her with a mother's care. Opposed to each that near the carcass came, his broad shield glimmers and his lances flame. The son of Panthus, skilled the dart to send, eyes the dead hero, and insults the friend. This hand, Atreides, laid Patroclus low. Warrior, desist, nor tempt an equal blow. To me the spoils my prowess won, resign. Depart with life, and leave the glory mine. The Trojan thus. The Spartan monarch burned with generous anguish, and in scorn returned. Laughst thou not, Jove, from thy superior throne? when mortals boast of prowess not their own? Not thus the lion glories in his might, nor panther braves his spotted foe in fight, nor thus the boar those terrors of the plain. Man only vaunts his force and vaunts in vain. But far the vainest of the boastful kind, these sons of Panthus vent their haughty mind. Yet t'was but late, beneath my conquering steel, this boaster's brother, Hyperenor, fell. Against our arm, which rashly he defied, Vain was his vigor, and as vain his pride. These eyes beheld him on the dust expire, No more to cheer his spouse or glad his sire. Presumptuous youth, like his shall be thy doom. Go, wait thy brother to the Stygian gloom, Or, while thou mayst, avoid the threatened fate. Fools stay to feel it, and are wise too late. Unmoved, Euphorbus thus. That action known, come, for my brother's blood repay thy own. His weeping father claims thy destined head, and spouse a widow in her bridal bed. On these thy conquered spoils I shall bestow, 
to soothe a consort's and a parent's woe. No longer than defer the glorious strife, let heaven decide our fortune, fame, and life. Swift as the word, the missile lance he flings, the well-aimed weapon on the buckler rings, but blunted by the brass, innoxious falls. On Jove the father great Atrides calls, nor flies the javelin from his arm in vain. It pierced his throat and bent him to the plain. Wide through the neck appears the grisly wound. Prone sinks the warrior, and his arms resound. The shining circlets of his golden hair, which even the graces might be proud to wear, instarred with gems and gold, bestrow the shore with dust dishonored and deformed with gore. As the young olive in some sylvan scene, crowned by fresh fountains with eternal green, lifts the gay head in snowy flowerets fair, and plays and dances to the gentle air, when, lo, a whirlwind from high heaven invades the tender plant, and withers all its shades. It lies uprooted from its genial bed, a lovely ruin now defaced and dead. Thus young, thus beautiful, Euphorbus lay, while the fierce Spartan tore his arms away. Proud of his deed and glorious in the prize, affrighted Troy the towering victor flies. Flies, as before some mountain lion's ire the village curs and trembling swains retire, when o'er the slaughtered bull they hear him roar, and see his jaws distill with smoking gore. All pale with fear, at distance scattered round, they shout incessant, and the veils resound. Meanwhile Apollo viewed with envious eyes, and urged great Hector to dispute the prize. In Menti's shape, beneath whose martial care the rough Siconians learned the trade of war. Forbear, he cried, with fruitless speed to chase Achilles' coursers of ethereal race. They stoop not, these, to mortal man's command, or stoop to none but great Achilles' hand. Too long amused with a pursuit so vain, turn, and behold the brave Euphorbus slain, by Sparta slain, for ever now suppressed the fire which burned in that undaunted breast. Thus having spoke, Apollo winged his flight, and mixed with mortals in the toils of fight. His words infixed unutterable care deep in great Hector's soul. Through all the war he darts his anxious eye, and, instant, viewed the breathless hero in his blood imbued, forth welling from the wound as prone he lay, and in the victor's hands the shining prey. Sheathed in bright arms, through cleaving ranks he flies, and sends his voice in thunder to the skies. Fierce as a flood of flame by Vulcan sent, it flew, and fired the nations as it went. Atrides from the voice the storm divined, and thus explored his own unconquered mind. Then shall I quit Patroclus on the plain, slain in my cause, and for my honor slain? Desert the arms, the relics of my friend? or singly Hector and his troops attend. Sure where such partial favor heaven bestowed, to brave the hero were to brave the god. Forgive me, Greece, if once I quit the field, tis not to Hector but to heaven I yield. Yet nor the god nor heaven should give me fear, did but the voice of Ajax reach my ear. Still would we turn, still battle on the plains, and give Achilles all that yet remains of his and our Patroclus. This no more the time allowed. Troy thickened on the shore. A sable scene. The terrors Hector led. Slow he recedes, and sighing quits the dead. So from the fold the unwilling lion parts, forced by loud clamors and a storm of darts. He flies indeed, but threatens as he flies, with heart indignant and retorted eyes. Now entered in the Spartan ranks, he turned his manly breast and with new fury burned. O'er all the black battalions sent his view, And through the cloud the godlike Ajax knew. Where laboring on the left the warrior stood, All grim in arms, and covered o'er with blood. There breathing courage, where the god of day Had sunk each heart with terror and dismay. To him the king, O Ajax, O my friend, Haste, and Patroclus loved remains defend. The body to Achilles to restore Demands our care, alas, we can no more. For naked now, despoiled of arms, he lies, and Hector glories in the dazzling prize. He said, and touched his heart. The raging pair pierced the thick battle and provoked the war. Already had stern Hector seized his head, and doomed to Trojan gods the unhappy dead. 
But soon as Ajax reared his tower-like shield, sprung to his car and measured back the field, his train to Troy the radiant armor bear, to stand a trophy of his fame in war. Meanwhile great Ajax, his broad shield displayed, guards the dead hero with the dreadful shade, and now before and now behind he stood, thus in the center of some gloomy wood, with many a step, the lioness surrounds her tawny young, beset by men and hounds, elate her heart, and rousing all her powers, dark o'er the fiery balls each hanging eyebrow lowers. Fast by his side the generous Spartan glows with great revenge, and feeds his inward woes. But Glaucus, leader of the Lycian aids, on Hector frowning thus his flight upbraids. Where now in Hector shall we Hector find? A manly form without a manly mind. Is this, O chief, a hero's boasted fame? How vain, without the merit, is the name! Since battle is renounced, thy thoughts employ what other methods may preserve thy Troy. Tis time to try if Ilian state can stand by thee alone, nor ask a foreign hand. Mean, empty boast! But shall the Lycians stake their lives for you, those Lycians you forsake? What from thy thankless arms can we expect? Thy friend Sarpedon proves thy base neglect. Say, Shall our slaughtered bodies guard your walls, while unrevenged the great Sarpedon falls? Even where he died for Troy, you left him there, a feast for dogs and all the fowls of air. On my command, if any Lycian wait, hence let him march and give up Troy to fate. Did such a spirit as the gods impart impel one Trojan hand or Trojan heart, such as should burn in every soul that draws the sword for glory and his country's cause, even yet our mutual arms we might employ, and drag yon carcass to the walls of Troy. Oh, were Patroclus ours, we might obtain Sarpedon's arms and honored course again. Greece with Achilles' friend should be repaid, and thus do honors purchased to his shade. But words are vain. Let Ajax once appear, and Hector trembles and recedes with fear. Thou darest not meet the terrors of his eye, and lo, already thou preparest to fly. The Trojan chief with fixed resentment eyed the Lycian leader and sedate replied, Say, is it just, my friend, that Hector's ear from such a warrior such a speech should hear? I deemed thee once the wisest of thy kind, but ill this insult suits a prudent mind. I shun great Ajax? I desert my train? Tis mine to prove the rash assertion vain. I joy to mingle where the battle bleeds, and hear the thunder of the sounding steeds. But Jove's high will is ever uncontrolled. The strong he withers, and confounds the bold, Now crowns with fame the mighty man, And now strikes the fresh garland from the victor's brow. Come, through yon squadrons let us hew the way, And thou be witness if I fear to-day. If yet a Greek the sight of Hector dread, Or yet their hero dare defend the dead. Then turning to the martial hosts he cries, Ye Trojans, Dardans, Lycians, and allies, be men, my friends, in action as in name, and yet be mindful of your ancient fame. Hector in proud Achilles' arms shall shine, torn from his friend, by right of conquest mine. He strode along the field, as thus he said, the sable plumage nodded o'er his head. Swift through the spacious plain he sent a look, one instant saw, one instant overtook the distant band that on the sandy shore the radiant spoils to sacred Ilion bore. There his own mail unbraced the field bestrode, his train to Troy conveyed the massy load. Now blazing in the immortal arms he stands, the work and present of celestial hands. By aged Peleus to Achilles given, as first to Peleus by the court of heaven. His father's arms not long Achilles wears, Forbid by fate to reach his father's ears. Him, proud in triumph, glittering from afar, The god whose thunder rends the troubled air Beheld with pity, as apart he sat and conscious Looked through all the scene of fate. He shook the sacred honors of his head. Olympus trembled, and the godhead said, Ah, wretched man, unmindful of thy end, A moment's glory and what fates attend. In heavenly panoply divinely bright thou stand'st, and armies tremble at thy sight, as at Achilles' self. Beneath thy dart lies slain the great Achilles' dearer part. 
thou from the mighty dead those arms hast torn which once the greatest of mankind had worn yet live i give thee one illustrious day a blaze of glory ere thou fadest away for ah no more andromache shall come with joyful tears to welcome hector home no more officious with endearing charms from thy tired limbs unbrace polites arms then with his sable brow he gave the nod that seals his word the sanction of the god the stubborn arms by jove's command disposed conformed spontaneous and around him closed filled with the god enlarged his members grew through all his veins a sudden vigor flew the blood in brisker tides began to roll and mars himself came rushing on his soul exhorting loud through all the field he strode and looked and moved achilles or a god now mesles glaucus medon he inspires now phorcys chromius and hippothus fires the great thersilicus like fury found astropius kindled at the sound and enomus in augury renowned here all ye hosts and here unnumbered bands of neighboring nations or of distant lands twas not for state we summoned you so far to boast our numbers and the pomp of war ye came to fight a valiant foe to chase to save our present and our future race for this our wealth our products you enjoy and glean the relics of exhausted troy now then to conquer or to die prepare to die or conquer are the terms of war Whatever hand shall win Patroclus slain, whoever shall drag him to the Trojan train, with Hector's self shall equal honors claim, with Hector part the spoil and share the fame. Fired by his words, the troops dismiss their fears. They join, they thicken, they protend their spears. Full on the Greeks they drive in firm array, and each from Ajax hopes the glorious prey. Vain hope! What numbers shall the field o'erspread? What victims perish round the mighty dead? Great Ajax marked the growing storm from far, And thus bespoke his brother of the war. Our fatal day, alas, is come, my friend, And all our wars and glories at an end. Tis not this course alone we guard in vain, Condemned to vultures on the Trojan plain. We, too, must yield. The same sad fate must fall on thee, on me, Perhaps, my friend, on all. See what a tempest direful Hector spreads, and lo, it bursts, it thunders on our heads. Call on our Greeks, if any hear the call, the bravest Greeks, this hour demands them all. The warrior raised his voice, and wide around the field re-echoed the distressful sound. O chiefs, O princes, to whose hand is given the rule of men, whose glory is from heaven, whom with due honors both Atrides grace, ye guides and guardians of our argive race all whom this well-known voice shall reach from far all whom i see not through this cloud of war come all let generous rage your arms employ and save patroclus from the dogs of troy oilean ajax first the voice obeyed swift was his pace and ready was his aid next him idomeneus more slow with age and merion burning with a hero's rage the long succeeding numbers who can name but all were greeks and eager all for fame fierce to the charge great hector led the throng whole troy embodied rushed with shouts along thus when a mountain billow foams and raves where some swollen river disembogues his waves full in the mouth is stopped the rushing tide the boiling ocean works from side to side the river trembles to his utmost shore and distant rocks rebellow to the roar nor less resolved the firm Achaean band with brazen shields in horrid circle stand jove pouring darkness o'er the mingled fight conceals the warriors shining helms in night to him the chief for whom the hosts contend had lived not hateful for he lived a friend dead he protects him with superior care nor dooms his carcass to the birds of air the first attack the grecians scarce sustain repulsed they yield the Trojans seize the slain. Then fierce they rally, to revenge led on by the swift rage of Ajax Telamon. Ajax to Peleus' son the second name, in graceful stature next, and next in fame. With headlong force the foremost ranks he tore, 
So through the thicket bursts the mountain boar, And rudely scatters, for a distance round, The frighted hunter and the baying hound. The son of Lethus, brave Pelasgus' heir, Hippothus, dragged the carcass through the war. The sinewy ankles bored, the feet he bound With thongs inserted through the double wound. Inevitable fate o'ertakes the deed, Doomed by great Ajax' vengeful lance to bleed. It cleft the helmet's brazen cheeks in twain, the shattered crest and horsehair strow the plain. With nerves relaxed he tumbles to the ground, the brain comes gushing through the ghastly wound. He drops Patroclus' foot, and o'er him spread now lies a sad companion of the dead. Far from Larissa lies his native heir, and ill requites his parents' tender care. Lamented youth, in life's first bloom he fell, sent by great Ajax to the shades of hell. Once more at Ajax Hector's javelin flies. The Grecian marking, as it cut the skies, shunned the descending death, which hissing on, stretched in the dust the great Iphetus son, Scedius the brave, of all the Phocian kind the boldest warrior and the noblest mind. In little panopy, for strength renowned, he held his seat and ruled the realms around. Plunged in his throat, the weapon drank his blood, and deep transpiercing through the shoulder stood. In clanging arms the hero fell, and all the fields resounded with his weighty fall. Forces, as slain Hippothus he defends, the Telamonian lance his belly rends. The hollow armor burst before the stroke, and through the wound the rushing entrails broke. In strong convulsions, panting on the sands, he lies and grasps the dust with dying hands. Struck at the sight, recede the Trojan train. The shouting Argives strip the heroes slain. And now had Troy, by Greece compelled to yield, fled to her ramparts and resigned the field. Greece, in her native fortitude elate, with Jove averse, had turned the scale of fate. But Phoebus urged Aeneas to the fight. He seemed like aged Periphus to sight. A herald in Anchises love grown old, revered for prudence and with prudence bold. Thus he, what methods yet, O chief, remain to save your Troy, though heaven its fall ordain? There have been heroes, who by virtuous care, by valor, numbers, and by arts of war, have forced the powers to spare a sinking state, and gained at length the glorious odds of fate. But you, when fortune smiles, when Jove declares his partial favor and assists your wars, your shameful efforts against yourselves employ, and force the unwilling god to ruin Troy. Aeneas, through the form assumed, decries the power concealed, and thus to Hector cries, O lasting shame! To our own fears a prey, we seek our ramparts, and desert the day. A god, nor is he less, my bosom warms, and tells me, Jove asserts the Trojan arms. He spoke, and foremost to the combat flew, the bold example all his hosts pursue. Then first Leocritus beneath him bled, in vain beloved by valiant Lycomede, who viewed his fall, and grieving at the chance, swift to revenge it sent his angry lance. The whirling lance, with vigorous force addressed, descends and pants in Apiseon's breast. From rich Paeonia's vales the warrior came, next thee Asteropeus, in place and fame. Asteropeus with grief beheld the slain, and rushed to combat, but he rushed in vain. Indissolubly firm around the dead, Rank within rank on buckler buckler spread, And hemmed with bristled spears the Grecians stood, A brazen bulwark and an iron wood. Great Ajax eyes them with incessant care, And in an orb contracts the crowded war, Close in their ranks commands to fight or fall, And stands the centre and the soul of all. Fixed on the spot they wore, and wounded wound, A sanguine torrent steeps the reeking ground. On heaps the Greeks, on heaps the Trojans bled, and, thickening round them, rise the hills of dead. Greece, in close order and collected might, yet suffers least, and sways the wavering fight. Fierce as conflicting fires the combat burns, and now it rises, now it sinks by turns. In one thick darkness all the fight was lost. The sun, the moon, and all the ethereal host seemed as extinct. Day ravished from their eyes, and all heaven's splendors blotted from the skies. Such o'er Patroclus' body hung the night, the rest in sunshine fought and open light. 
Unclouded there, the aerial azure spread, no vapor rested on the mountain's head. The golden sun poured forth a stronger ray, and all the broad expansion flamed with day. Dispersed around the plain, by fits they fight, and here and there their scattered arrows light. But death and darkness o'er the carcass spread, there burned the war, and there the mighty bled. Meanwhile the sons of Nestor, in the rear, their fellows routed, toss the distant spear, and skirmish wide. So Nestor gave command when from the ships he sent the Pylian band. The youthful brothers thus for fame contend, nor knew the fortune of Achilles' friend. In thought they viewed him still, with martial joy, glorious in arms, and dealing death to Troy. But round the course the heroes pant for breath, and thick and heavy grows the work of death. Or labored now with dust and sweat and gore, their knees, their legs, their feet are covered o'er. Drops follow drops, the clouds on clouds arise, and carnage clogs their hands, and darkness fills their eyes. As when a slaughtered bull's yet reeking hide, strained with full force, and tugged from side to side, the brawny couriers stretch, and labor o'er the extended surface, drunk with fat and gore. So tugging round the course both armies stood, the mangled body bathed in sweat and blood. While Greeks and Ilians equal strength employ, now to the ships to force it, now to Troy. Not Pallas' self, her breast when fury warms, nor he whose anger sets the world in arms, could blame this scene, such rage, such horror reigned. Such, Jove to honor the great dead ordained. Achilles in his ships at distance lay, nor knew the fatal fortune of the day. He, yet unconscious of Patroclus' fall, in dust extended under Ilion's wall, expects him glorious from the conquered plain, and for his wished return prepares in vain. Though well he knew, to make proud Ilion bend was more than heaven had destined to his friend. Perhaps to him, this Thetis had revealed, the rest, in pity to her son, concealed. Still raged the conflict round the hero dead, and heaps on heaps by mutual wounds they bled. Cursed be the man, even private Greeks would say, who dares desert this well-disputed day. First may the cleaving earth before our eyes gape wide, and drink our blood for sacrifice. First perish all, ere haughty Troy shall boast we lost Patroclus, and our glory lost. Thus they, while with one voice the Trojans said, Grant this day, Jove, or heap us on the dead. Then clash their sounding arms, the clangors rise, and shake the brazen concave of the skies. Meantime, at distance from the scene of blood, the pensive steeds of great Achilles stood. Their godlike master slain before their eyes, they wept, and shared in human miseries. In vain Automata now shakes the rein, now plies the lash, and soothes and threats, in vain nor to the fight nor Hellespont they go, restive they stood, and obstinate in woe. Still as a tombstone, never to be moved, on some good man or woman unreproved lays its eternal weight, or fixed, as stands a marble courser by the sculptor's hands, placed on the hero's grave. Along their face the big round drops coursed down with silent pace come globing on the dust. Their manes, that late circled their arched necks and waved in state, trailed on the dust beneath the yoke were spread, and prone to earth was hung their languid head. Nor Jove disdained to cast a pitying look, while thus relenting to the steeds he spoke. Unhappy coursers of immortal strain, exempt from age and deathless, now in vain. Did we your race on mortal man bestow only, alas, to share in mortal woe? For ah! What is there of inferior birth that breathes or creeps upon the dust of earth? What wretched creature of what wretched kind, than man more weak, calamitous, and blind? A miserable race! But cease to mourn, for not by you shall Priam's son be borne high on the splendid car. One glorious prize he rashly boasts, the rest our will denies. Ourself will swiftness to your nerves impart, ourself with rising spirits swell your heart. Automedon, your rapid flight shall bear safe to the navy through the storm of war. For yet tis given to Troy to ravage o'er the field, and spread her slaughters to the shore. The sun shall see her conquer, till his fall with sacred darkness shades the face of all. He said, and breathing in the immortal horse excessive spirit, urged them to the course. 
From their high manes they shake the dust, and bear the kindling chariot through the parted war. So flies a vulture through the clamorous train of geese that scream and scatter round the plain. From danger now with swiftest speed they flew, and now to conquest with like speed pursue. Soul in the seat the charioteer remains, now plies the javelin, now directs the reins. Him brave Alcimedon beheld distressed, approached the chariot and the chief addressed. What god provokes thee rashly thus to dare, alone unaided in the thickest war? Alas, thy friend is slain, and Hector wields Achilles' arms triumphant in the fields. In happy time, the charioteer replies, the bold Alcimedon now greets my eyes. No Greek like him the heavenly steeds restrains, or holds their fury in suspended reins. Patroclus, while he lived, their rage could tame, but now Patroclus is an empty name. To thee I yield the seat, to thee resign the ruling charge, the task of fight be mine. He said, Alcimedon, with active heat, snatches the reins and vaults into the seat. His friend descends. The chief of Troy decried and called Aeneas fighting near his side. Lo, to my sight, beyond our hope restored, Achilles' car, deserted of its lord. The glorious steeds our ready arms invite, Scarce their weak drivers guide them through the fight. Can such opponents stand when we assail? Unite thy force, my friend, and we prevail. The son of Venus to the council yields. Then o'er their backs they spread their solid shields. With brass refulgent the broad surface shined, And thick bull hides the spacious concave lined. Them Chromius follows, Aretas succeeds. Each hopes the conquest of the lofty steeds. In vain, brave youths, with glorious hopes ye burn, In vain advance, not fated to return. Unmoved, Automedon attends the fight, Implores the Eternal, and collects his might. Then turning to his friend, with dauntless mind, O oh, keep the foaming coursers close behind! Full on my shoulders let their nostrils blow, For hard the fight, determined is the foe. Tis Hector comes, and when he seeks the prize, War knows no mean. He wins it or he dies. Then through the field he sends his voice aloud, And calls the Aegises from the warring crowd, With great Atrides. Hither turn, he said, Turn where distress demands immediate aid. The dead, encircled by his friends, Forgo, and save the living from a fiercer foe. Unhelped we stand, Unequal to engage the force of Hector And Aeneas' rage. Yet mighty as they are, My force to prove is only mine. The event belongs to Jove. He spoke, and high the sounding javelin flung, Which passed the shield of Aretas the young. It pierced his belt, embossed with curious art, Then in the lower belly struck the dart. As when a ponderous axe, descending full, Cleaves the broad forehead of some brawny bull, Struck twixt the horns, he springs with many a bound, Then tumbling rolls enormous on the ground. Thus fell the youth, the air his soul received, and the spear trembled as his entrails heaved. Now at Automedon the Trojan foe discharged his lance. The meditated blow, stooping, he shunned. The javelin idly fled and hissed innoxious o'er the hero's head. Deep rooted in the ground, the forceful spear in long vibration spent its fury there. With clashing falchions now the chiefs had closed, but each brave Ajax heard and interposed. Nor longer Hector with his Trojans stood, But left their slain companion in his blood. His arms Automedon divests, and cries, Accept, Patroclus, this mean sacrifice. Thus have I soothed my griefs, and thus have paid, Poor as it is, some offering to thy shade. So looks the lion o'er a mangled boar, All grim with rage, and horrible with gore. High on the chariot at one bound he sprung, And o'er his seat the bloody trophies hung. And now Minerva from the realms of air Descends impetuous and renews the war. For, pleased at length the Grecian arms to aid, The lord of thunders sent the blue-eyed maid. As when high Jove, denouncing future woe, O'er the dark clouds extends his purple bow, In sign of tempest from the troubled air, Or from the rage of man, destructive war, The drooping cattle dread the impending skies, And from his half-tilled field the labor flies. In such a form the goddess round her drew a livid cloud, and to the battle flew. Assuming phoenix shape, on earth she falls, and in his well-known voice to Sparta calls. 
And lies Achilles' friend, beloved by all, a prey to dogs beneath the Trojan wall? What shame, O Greece, for future times to tell, to thee the greatest in whose cause he fell? O chief, O father, Atreus' son replies, O full of days, by long experience wise, what more desires my soul than here unmoved to guard the body of the man I loved? Ah, would Minerva send me strength to rear this wearied arm and ward the storm of war? But Hector, like the rage of fire, we dread, and Jove's own glories blaze around his head. Pleased to be first of all the powers addressed, she breathes new vigor in her hero's breast, and fills with keen revenge, with fell despite, desire of blood and rage and lust of fight. So burns the vengeful hornet, soul all o'er, repulsed in vain, and thirsty still of gore. Bold son of errant heat, on angry wings untamed, untired, he turns, attacks, and stings. Fired with like ardor fierce Atrides flew, and sent his soul with every lance he threw. There stood a Trojan, not unknown to fame, Aetian's son, and Podus was his name. With riches honored, and with courage blessed, by Hector loved, his comrade and his guest. Through his broad belt the spear a passage found, and, ponderous as he falls, his arms resound. Sudden at Hector's side Apollo stood. Like Phaenops, Aesius' son, appeared the god, Aesius the Great, who held his wealthy reign in fair Abydos, by the rolling main. O prince, he cried, O foremost once in fame, what Grecian now shall tremble at thy name? Dost thou at length to Menelaus yield, a chief once thought no terror of the field? Yet singly now the long-disputed prize he bears victorious, while our army flies. By the same arm illustrious Podes bled, the friend of Hector, unrevenged, is dead. This heard, o'er Hector spreads a cloud of woe, rage lifts his lance and drives him on the foe. But now the Eternal shook his sable shield, that shaded eyed and all the subject field beneath its ample verge. A rolling cloud involved the mount, the thunder roared aloud, the affrighted hills from their foundations nod and blaze beneath the lightnings of the god. At one regard of his all-seeing eye, the vanquished triumph, and the victors fly. Then trembled Greece, the flight Penelaus led, for as the brave Boeotian turned his head to face the foe, Polydamus drew near, and raised his shoulder with a shortened spear. By Hector wounded, Lytus quits the plain, pierced through the wrist, and raging with the pain, grasps his once formidable lance in vain. As Hector followed, Idomen addressed the flaming javelin to his manly breast. The brittle point before his corslet yields. Exulting Troy with clamor fills the fields. High on his chariots the Cretan stood. The son of Priam whirled the massive wood. But erring from its aim, the impetuous spear struck to the dust the squire and charioteer of Marshal Merion, Coeranus his name, who left fair Lictus for the fields of fame. On foot bold Merion fought, and now laid low, had graced the triumphs of his Trojan foe, but the brave squire the ready coursers brought, and with his life his master's safety bought. Between his cheek and ear the weapon went, the teeth it shattered and the tongue it rent. Prone from the seat he tumbles to the plain, his dying hand forgets the falling rain. This Merion reaches, bending from the car, and urges to desert the hopeless war. Idomeneus consents, the lash applies, and the swift chariot to the navy flies. Not Ajax less the will of heaven decried, and conquest shifting to the Trojan side, turned by the hand of Jove. Then thus begun, to Atreus' seed, the godlike Telamon. Alas, who sees not Jove's almighty hand transfers the glory to the Trojan band? Whether the weak or strong discharge the dart, he guides each arrow to a Grecian heart. Not so our spears. Incessant though they reign, he suffers every lance to fall in vain. Deserted of the god, yet let us try what human strength and prudence can supply. If yet this honored course, in triumph born, may glad the fleets that hope not our return, who tremble yet, scarce rescued from their fates, and still hear Hector thundering at their gates, some hero too must be dispatched to bear the mournful message to Pelides' ear. For sure he knows not, distant on the shore, his friend, his loved Patroclus, is no more. But such a chief I spy not through the host, 
The men, the steeds, the armies, all are lost in general darkness. Lord of earth and air, O king, O father, hear my humble prayer. Dispel this cloud, the light of heaven restore. Give me to see, and Ajax asks no more. If Greece must perish, we thy will obey, but let us perish in the face of day. With tears the hero spoke, and at his prayer the god relenting cleared the clouded air. Forth burst the sun with all enlightening ray. The blaze of armor flashed against the day. Now, now, Atrides, cast around thy sight. If yet Antilochus survives the fight, let him to great Achilles' ear convey the fatal news. Atrides hastes away. So turns the lion from the knightly fold, though high in courage and with hunger bold, long galled by herdsmen and long vexed by hounds, stiff with fatigue and fretted sore with wounds. The darts fly round him from a hundred hands, and the red terrors of the blazing brands. Till late, reluctant, at the dawn of day sour he departs, and quits the untasted prey. So moved Atrides from his dangerous place with weary limbs, but with unwilling pace. The foe he feared might yet Patroclus gain, and much admonished, much adjured his train. O oh, guard these relics to your charge consigned, and bear the merits of the dead in mind. How skilled he was in each obliging art, the mildest manners and the gentlest heart. He was, alas, but fate decreed his end, in death a hero, as in life a friend. So parts the chief. From rank to rank he flew, and round on all sides sent his piercing view. As the bold bird, endued with sharpest eye of all that wings the mid-aerial sky, the sacred eagle, from his walks above looks down, and sees the distant thicket move. Then stoops, and sousing on the quivering hair, snatches his life amid the clouds of air. Not with less quickness his exerted sight passed this and that way, through the ranks of fight, till on the left the chief he sought he found, cheering his men and spreading deaths around. To him the king, Beloved of Jove, draw near, for sadder tidings never touch thy ear. Thy eyes have witnessed what a fatal turn, how Ilion triumphs and the Achaeans mourn. This is not all. Patroclus, on the shore now pale and dead, shall succor Greece no more. Fly to the fleet, this instant fly, and tell the sad Achilles how his loved one fell. He too may haste the naked course to gain. The arms are Hector's, who despoiled the slain. The youthful warrior heard with silent woe. From his fair eyes the tears began to flow. Big with the mighty grief, he strove to say what sorrow dictates, but no word found way. To brave Laodicus his arms he flung, who, near him wheeling, drove his steeds along. Then ran the mournful message to impart, with tearful eyes, and with dejected heart. Swift fled the youth, nor Menelaus stands, though sore distressed, to aid the Pylian bands, but bids bold Thrasymede those troops sustain. Himself returns to his Patroclus slain. Gone is Antilochus, the hero said, but hope not, warriors, for Achilles' aid. Though fierce his rage, unbounded be his woe, unarmed, he fights not with the Trojan foe. Tis in our hands alone our hopes remain, tis our own vigor must the dead regain, and save ourselves, while with impetuous hate Troy pours along, and this way rolls our fate. Tis well, said Ajax, be it then thy care with Merion's aid, the weighty course to rear. Myself and my bold brother will sustain the shock of Hector and his charging train, nor fear we armies fighting side by side. What Troy can dare, we have already tried, have tried it and have stood. The hero said, high from the ground the warriors heave the dead. A general clamor rises at the sight. Loud shout the Trojans and renew the fight. Not fiercer rush along the gloomy wood, with rage insatiate and with thirst of blood, voracious hounds, that many a length before their furious hunters drive the wounded boar. But if the savage turns his glaring eye, they howl aloof and round the forest fly. Thus on retreating Greece the Trojans pour, wave their thick falchions and their javelins shower. But Ajax turning, to their fears they yield. All pale they tremble and forsake the field. While thus aloft the hero's course they bear, behind them rages all the storm of war, confusion, tumult, horror o'er the throng of men, steeds, chariots urged the rout along. 
Less fierce, the winds with rising flames conspire to whelm some city under waves of fire. Now sink in gloomy clouds the proud abodes, now crack the blazing temples of the gods. The rumbling torrent through the ruin rolls, and sheets of smoke mount heavy to the poles. The heroes sweat beneath their honored load, as when two mules along the rugged road from the steep mountain with exerted strength drag some vast beam or mast's unwieldy length. Inly they groan, big drops of sweat distill, the enormous timber lumbering down the hill. So these. Behind, the bulk of Ajax stands and breaks the torrent of the rushing bands. Thus, when a river swelled with sudden rains spreads his broad waters o'er the level plains, some interposing hill the stream divides, and breaks its force, and turns the winding tides. Still close they follow, close the rear engage, Aeneas storms, and Hector foams with rage. While Greece a heavy, thick retreat maintains, wedged in one body, like a flight of cranes, that shriek incessant, while the falcon, hung high on poised pinions, threats their callow young. So from the Trojan chiefs the Grecians fly, such the wild terror and the mingled cry. Within, without the trench, and all the way, strode in bright heaps their arms and armor lay. Such horror Jove impressed, yet still proceeds the work of death, and still the battle bleeds. The, the grief, grief of, of Achilles, Achilles and, and new, new armor, armor made him by Vulcan. Vulcan. The news of the death of Patroclus is brought to Achilles by Antilochus. Thetis, hearing his lamentations, comes with all her sea nymphs to comfort him. The speeches of the mother and son on this occasion. Iris appears to Achilles by the command of Juno and orders him to show himself at the head of the entrenchments. The sight of him turns the fortunes of the day and the body of Patroclus is carried off by the Greeks. The Trojans call a council where Hector and Polydamus disagree in their opinions, but the advice of the former prevails to remain encamped in the field. The grief of Achilles over the body of Patroclus. Thetis goes to the palace of Vulcan to obtain new arms for her son, the description of the wonderful works of Vulcan, and lastly, that noble one of the shield of Achilles. The latter part of the nine-and-twentieth day, and the night ensuing, take up this book. The scene is at Achilles' tent on the seashore, from whence it changes to the palace of Vulcan. Thus, like the rage of fire, the combat burns, and now it rises, now it sinks by turns. Meanwhile, where Hellespont's broad waters flow, stood Nestor's son, the messenger of woe. There sat Achilles, shaded by his sails, on hoisted yards extended to the gales, pensive he sat, for all that fate designed rose in sad prospect to his boding mind. Thus to his soul he said, Ah, what constrains the Greeks, late victors, now to quit the plains? Is this the day which heaven so long ordained to sink me with the weight of woe? So Thetis warned, when by a Trojan hand the bravest of the Myrmidonian band should lose the light, fulfilled is that decree. Fallen is the warrior, and Patroclus he. In vain I charged him soon to quit the plain, and warned to shun Hectorian force in vain. Thus while he thinks, Antilochus appears, and tells the melancholy tale with tears. Sad tidings, son of Peleus, thou must hear and wretched I, the unwilling messenger. Dead is Patroclus, for his course they fight, his naked course, his arms are Hector's right. A sudden horror shot through all the chief, and wrapped his senses in the cloud of grief. Cast on the ground, with furious hands he spread the scorching ashes o'er his graceful head. His purple garments and his golden hairs, those he deforms with dust, and these he tears. On the hard soil his groaning breast he threw, and rolled and groveled as to earth he grew. The virgin captives with disordered charms, won by his own or by Patroclus' arms, rushed from their tents with cries, and gathering round, beat their white breasts, and fainted on the ground, while Nestor's son sustains a manlier part, and mourns the warrior with a warrior's heart, hangs on his arms amidst his frantic woe, and oft prevents the meditated blow. Far in the deep abysses of the main, with hoary Nereus and the watery train, the mother goddess from her crystal throne heard his loud cries and answered groan for groan. The circling Nereids with their mistress weep, and all the sea-green sisters of the deep, 
Thalia, Glaucy, every watery name, Nessaia mild and silver spio came. Samothoe and Samodusi were nigh, and the blue languish of soft Aliazai. eye. Their locks Actaea and Limnori rear, then Proto, Doris, Panope appear, Thoa, Ferusa, Doto, Melita, Agave gentle, and Amphithoe gay. Next Calianira, Calianasa show their sister looks, Dexamini the slow, and swift Dynamini now cut the tides, Iaira now the verdant wave divides, Nimertes with Apsudes lifts the head, bright Galatia quits her pearly bed, these Orithia Clymene attend, Mera, Amphinomy the train extend, and black Janira, and Janassa fair, and Amathaea with her amber hair. All these, and all that deep in ocean held their sacred seats, the glimmering grotto filled. Each beat her ivory breast with silent woe, till Thetis' sorrows thus began to flow. Hear me, and judge, ye sisters of the main, how just a cause has Thetis to complain. How wretched, were I mortal, were my fate! How more than wretched in the immortal state! Sprung from my bed a godlike hero came, the bravest far that ever bore the name. Like some fair olive, by my careful hand, he grew, he flourished and adorned the land. To Troy I sent him, but the fates ordain he never, never must return again. So short a space the light of heaven to view, so short, alas, and filled with anguish too. Hear how his sorrows echo through the shore. I cannot ease them, but I must deplore. I go at least to bear a tender part, And mourn my loved one with a mother's heart. She said, and left the caverns of the main, All bathed in tears. The melancholy train attend her way, Wide opening part the tides, While the long pomp the silver wave divides. Approaching now, they touched the Trojan land, Then, two by two, ascended up the strand. The immortal mother, standing close beside her mournful offspring, To his sighs replied, Along the coast their mingled clamors ran, and thus the silver-footed dame began. Why mourns my son? Thy late preferred request the god has granted, and the Greeks distressed. Why mourns my son? Thy anguish let me share. Reveal the cause, and trust a parent's care. He deeply groaning? To this cureless grief not even the thunderer's favor brings relief. Patroclus, ah, say, goddess, can I boast a pleasure now? Revenge itself is lost. Patroclus, loved of all my martial train, beyond mankind, beyond myself, is slain. Lost are those arms the gods themselves bestowed on Peleus. Hector bears the glorious load. Cursed be that day when all the powers above thy charms submitted to a mortal love. Oh, hadst thou still a sister of the main, Pursued the pleasures of the watery rain, And happier Peleus, less ambitious, Led a mortal beauty to his equal bed, Ere the sad fruit of thy unhappy womb Had caused such sorrows past and woes to come. For soon, alas, that wretched offspring slain, New woes, new sorrows shall create again. Tis not in fate the alternate now to give. Patroclus dead, Achilles hates to live. Let me revenge it on proud Hector's heart. Let his last spirit smoke upon my dart. On these conditions will I breathe. Till then I blush to walk among the race of men. A flood of tears at this the goddess shed. Ah, then, I see thee dying, see thee dead. When Hector falls, thou diest. Let Hector die, and let me fall, Achilles made reply. Far lies Patroclus from his native plain. He fell and falling, wished my aid in vain. Ah, then, since from this miserable day I cast all hope of my return away, since unrevenged a hundred ghosts demand the fate of Hector from Achilles' hand, since here, for brutal courage far renowned, I live an idle burden to the ground, others in council famed for nobler skill, more useful to preserve than I to kill, let me, but, O oh, ye gracious powers above, Wrath and revenge from men and gods remove, Far, far too dear to every mortal breast, Sweet to the soul as honey to the taste, Gathering like vapors of a noxious kind From fiery blood, and darkening all the mind, Me, Agamemnon, urged to deadly hate. Tis past, I quell it, I resign to fate. Yes, 
I will meet the murderer of my friend, or, if the gods ordain it, meet my end. The stroke of fate the strongest cannot shun, the great Alcides, Jove's unequalled son, to Juno's hate at length resigned his breath, and sunk the victim of all conquering death. So shall Achilles fall, stretched pale and dead, no more the Grecian hope or Trojan dread. Let me this instant rush into the fields, and reap what glory life's short harvest yields. Shall I not force some widowed dame to tear with frantic hands her long dishevelled hair? Shall I not force her breast to heave with sighs, and the soft tears to trickle from her eyes? Yes, I shall give the fair those mournful charms. In vain you hold me. Hence, my arms, my arms. Soon shall the sanguine torrent spread so wide that all shall know. Achilles swells the tide. My son, Cerulean Thetis made reply, to fate submitting with a secret sigh, the host to succor and thy friends to save is worthy thee the duty of the brave. But canst thou, naked, issue to the plains? Thy radiant arms the Trojan foe detains. Insulting Hector bears the spoils on high, but vainly glories, for his fate is nigh. Yet, yet a while thy generous ardor stay. Assured, I meet thee at the dawn of day, charged with refulgent arms, a glorious load, Vulcanian arms, the labor of a god. Then turning to the daughters of the main, the goddess thus dismissed her azure train. Ye sister Nereids, to your deeps descend, haste, and our father's sacred seat attend. I go to find the architect divine, where vast Olympus starry summits shine. So tell our hoary sire. This charge she gave, the sea-green sisters plunge beneath the wave. Thetis once more ascends the blessed abodes, and treads the brazen threshold of the gods. And now the Greeks from furious Hector's force urge to broad Hellespont their headlong course. Nor yet their chief's Patroclus' body bore safe through the tempest to the tinted shore. The horse, the foot, with equal fury joined, poured on the rear and thundered close behind. And like a flame through fields of ripened corn, the rage of Hector o'er the ranks was borne. Thrice the slain hero by the foot he drew, thrice to the skies the Trojan clamors flew. As oft the Aegises his assault sustain, but checked he turns, repulsed attacks again. With fiercer shouts his lingering troops he fires, nor yields a step, nor from his post retires. So watchful shepherds strive to force, in vain, the hungry lion from a carcass slain. Even yet Patroclus had he borne away, and all the glories of the extended day, had not high Juno from the realms of air, secret, dispatched her trusty messenger. The various goddess of the showery bow shot in a whirlwind to the shore below. To great Achilles at his ships she came, and thus began the many-colored dame. Rise, son of Peleus, rise, divinely brave! Assist the combat, and Patroclus save! For him the slaughter to the fleet they spread, and fall by mutual wounds around the dead. To drag him back to Troy the foe contends, nor with his death the rage of Hector ends. A prey to dogs he dooms the course to lie, and marks the place to fix his head on high. Rise and prevent, if yet you think of fame, thy friend's disgrace, thy own eternal shame. Who sends thee, goddess, from the ethereal skies? Achilles thus. And Iris thus replies, I come, Pelides, from the Queen of Jove, the immortal empress of the realms above, unknown to him who sits remote on high, unknown to all the synod of the sky. Thou comest in vain, he cries, with fury warmed. Arms I have none, and can I fight unarmed? Unwilling as I am, of force I stay, till Thetis bring me at the dawn of day Vulcanian arms. What other can I wield except the mighty Telamonian shield? That, in my friend's defense, has Ajax spread, while his strong lance around him heaps the dead. The gallant chief defends Menetius' son, and does what his Achilles should have done. Thy want of arms, said Iris, well we know, but though unarmed, yet clad in terrors, go. Let but Achilles or yon trench appear, proud Troy shall tremble and consent to fear. Greece from one glance of that tremendous eye shall take new courage and disdain to fly. She spoke and passed in air. The hero rose, her aegis palace o'er his shoulder throws, 
Around his brows a golden cloud she spread, A stream of glory flamed above his head. As when from some beleaguered town arise the smokes, High curling to the shaded skies, Seen from some island or the main afar, When men distressed hang out the sign of war. Soon as the sun in ocean hides his rays, Thick on the hills the flaming beacons blaze. With long projected beams the seas are bright, And heaven's high arch reflects the ruddy light. So from Achilles' head the splendors rise, Reflecting blaze on blaze against the skies. Forth marched the chief, and distant from the crowd, High on the rampart raised his voice aloud. With her own shout Minerva swells the sound. Troy starts astonished, and the shores rebound. As the loud trumpet's brazen mouth from far with shrilling clangor sounds the alarm of war, struck from the walls the echoes float on high, and the round bulwarks and thick towers reply, so high his brazen voice the hero reared. Hosts dropped their arms and trembled as they heard, and back the chariots roll, and coursers bound, and steeds and men lie mingled on the ground. Aghast they see the living lightnings play, And turn their eyeballs from the flashing ray. Thrice from the trench his dreadful voice he raised, And thrice they fled, confounded and amazed. Twelve in the tumult wedged, untimely rushed on their own spears, By their own chariots crushed. While shielded from the darts, the Greeks obtain The long-contented carcass of the slain. A lofty bier the breathless warrior bears, Around, his sad companions melt in tears, But chief Achilles, bending down his head, Pours unavailing sorrows o'er the dead, Whom late triumphant with his steeds and car He sent refulgent to the field of war. Unhappy change, now senseless, pale he found, Stretched forth and gashed with many a gaping wound. Meantime, unwearied with his heavenly way, in ocean's waves the unwilling light of day Quenched his red orb at Juno's high command, And from their labors eased the Achaean band. The frighted Trojans, panting from the war, Their steeds unharnessed from the weary car, A sudden council called. Each chief appeared in haste, and standing, For to sit they feared. T'was now no season for prolonged debate. They saw Achilles, and in him their fate. Silent they stood, Polydamus at last, Skilled to discern the future by the past, The son of Panthus thus expressed his fears, The friend of Hector and of equal years. The selfsame night to both a being gave, One wise in counsel, one in action brave. In free debate, my friends, your sentence speak. For me, I move before the morning break To raise our camp. Too dangerous here our post, Far from Troy walls and on a naked coast. I deemed not Greaseful so dreadful while engaged in mutual feuds her king and hero raged. Then, while we hoped our armies might prevail, we boldly camped beside a thousand sail. I dread Polites now. His rage of mind not long continues to the shores confined, nor to the fields where long in equal fray contending nations won and lost the day. For Troy, for Troy, shall henceforth be the strife and the hard contest not for fame but life. Haste then to Ilion, while the favoring night detains these terrors, keeps that arm from fight. If but the morrow's sun behold us here, that arm, those terrors, we shall feel, not fear, and hearts that now disdain shall leap with joy, if heaven permit them then to enter Troy. Let not my fatal prophecy be true, nor what I tremble but to think ensue. Whatever be our fate, Yet let us try what force of thought and reason can supply. Let us on counsel, for our guard depend. The town her gates and bulwarks shall defend. When morning dawns, our well-appointed powers, arrayed in arms, shall line the lofty towers. Let the fierce hero then, when fury calls, vent his mad vengeance on our rocky walls, or fetch a thousand circles round the plain, till his spent coursers seek the fleet again. So may his rage be tired and labored down, and dogs shall tear him ere he sack the town. Return, said Hector, fired with stern disdain. What, coop whole armies in our walls again? Was not enough, ye valiant warriors, say, nine years imprisoned in those towers ye lay? Wide o'er the world was Ilion famed of old for brass exhaustless and for mines of gold. But while inglorious in her walls we stayed, Sunk were her treasures and her stores decayed. 
The Phrygians now her scattered spoils enjoy, And proud Maonia wastes the fruits of Troy. Great Jove at length my arms to conquest calls, And shuts the Grecians in their wooden walls. Darest thou dispirit whom the gods incite? Flies any Trojan? I shall stop his flight. To better counsel, then, attention lend. Take due refreshment, and the watch attend. If there be one whose riches cost him care, Forth let him bring them for the troops to share. Tis better generously bestowed on those, Than left the plunder of our country's foes. Soon as the morn the purple orient warms, Fierce on yon navy will we pour our arms. If great Achilles rise in all his might, His be the danger. I shall stand the fight. Honor, ye gods, or let me gain or give, And live he glorious, whosoe'er shall live. Mars is our common lord, alike to all, And oft the victor triumphs but to fall. The shouting host in loud applauses joined, So Pallas robbed the many of their mind, To their own sense condemned, and left to choose The worst advice, the better to refuse. While the long night extends her sable reign, Around Patroclus mourned the Grecian train. Stern in superior grief Polites stood, Those slaughtering arms, so used to bathe in blood, Now clasp his clay-cold limbs, Then gushing start the tears, And sighs burst from his swelling heart. The lion thus, with dreadful anguish stung, Roars through the desert, and demands his young, when the grim savage to his rifled den too late returning snuffs the track of men and o'er the vales and o'er the forest bounds his clamorous grief the bellowing wood resounds so grieves achilles and impetuous vents to all his myrmidons his loud laments in what vain promise gods did i engage when to console Manetius' feeble age I vowed his much-loved offspring to restore, Charged with rich spoils to fair Opuntia's shore. But mighty Jove cuts short with just disdain The long, long views of poor designing man. One fate the warrior and the friend shall strike, And Troy's black sands must drink our blood alike. Me too a wretched mother shall deplore, An aged father never see me more. Yet, my Patroclus, yet a space I stay, Then swift pursue thee on the darksome way. Ere thy dear relics in the grave are laid, Shall Hector's head be offered to thy shade, That, with his arms, shall hang before thy shrine, And twelve, the noblest of the Trojan line, Sacred to vengeance, by this hand expire, Their lives effused around thy flaming pyre. Thus let me lie till then, Thus, closely pressed, bathe thy cold face and sob upon thy breast. While Trojan captives hear thy mourners stay, weep all the night and murmur all the day. Spoils of my arms and thine when, wasting wide, our swords kept time and conquered side by side. He spoke and bade the sad attendants round cleanse the pale corse and wash each honored wound. A massy cauldron of stupendous frame they brought and placed it o'er the rising flame. Then heaped the lighted wood. The flame divides beneath the vase and climbs around the sides. In its wide womb they pour the rushing stream. The boiling water bubbles to the brim. The body then they bathe with pious toil, embalm the wounds, anoint the limbs with oil. High on a bed of state extended laid and decent covered with a linen shade, last o'er the dead the milk-white veil they threw. That done, their sorrows and their sighs renew. Meanwhile to Juno in the realms above, his wife and sister, spoke almighty Jove. At last thy will prevails. Great Peleus' son rises in arms. Such grace thy Greeks have won. Say, for I know not, is their race divine, and thou the mother of that martial line? What words are these? the imperial dame replies, while anger flashed from her majestic eyes. Succor like this a mortal arm might lend, and such success mere human wit attend. And shall not I, the second power above, heaven's queen and consort of the thundering Jove, say, shall not I one nation's fate command, not wreak my vengeance on one guilty land? So they. Meanwhile the silver-footed dame reached the Vulcanian dome, eternal frame. High eminent amid the works divine, where heaven's far-beaming brazen mansions shine, there the lame architect the goddess found, obscure in smoke, his forges flaming round, while bathed in sweat from fire to fire he flew, and puffing loud the roaring billows blew. 
That day no common task his labor claimed, Full twenty tripods for his hall he framed, That placed on living wheels of massy gold, Wondrous to tell, instinct with spirit Rolled from place to place, around the blessed abodes, Self-moved, obedient to the beck of gods. For their fair handles now, or wrought with flowers, In moulds prepared, the glowing ore he pours. Just as responsive to his thought the frame stood prompt to move, The azure goddess came. Cheris, his spouse, a grace divinely fair, With purple fillets round her braided hair, Observed her entering. Her soft hand she pressed, and, smiling, Thus the watery queen addressed. What goddess this unusual favor draws? All hail and welcome, whatsoe'er the cause, Till now a stranger in a happy hour Approach and taste the dainties of the bower. High on a throne, with stars of silver graced, And various artifice, the queen she placed, A footstool at her feet. Then calling, said, Vulcan, draw near, Tis Thetis asks your aid. Thetis, replied the god, our powers may claim, An ever dear, an ever honored name. When my proud mother hurled me from the sky, My awkward form, it seems, displeased her eye, She, and your enemy, my griefs redressed and soft received me on their silver breast. Even then these arts employed my infant thought. Chains, bracelets, pendants, all their toys I wrought. Nine years kept secret in the dark abode, secure I lay, concealed from man and God. Deep in a caverned rock my days were led, the rushing ocean murmured o'er my head. Now, since her presence glads our mansion, say, for such desert what service can I pay? Vouchsafe, O Thetis, at our board to share the genial rites and hospitable fare, while I the labors of the forge forego and bid the roaring bellows cease to blow. Then from his anvil the lame artist rose, wide with distorted legs oblique he goes, and stills the bellows, and, in order laid, locks in their chests his instruments of trade. Then with a sponge the sooty workman dressed his brawny arms embrowned and hairy breast. With his huge sceptre graced, and red attire, Came halting forth the sovereign of the fire. The monarch steps two female forms uphold, That moved and breathed in animated gold, To whom was voice, and sense, and science given of works divine, Such wonders are in heaven. On these supported, with unequal gait, He reached the throne where pensive Thetis sate. There placed beside her on the shining frame, He thus addressed the silver-footed dame. Thee welcome, goddess. What occasion calls, so long a stranger, to these honored walls? Tis thine, fair Thetis, the command to lay, and Vulcan's joy and duty to obey. To whom the mournful mother thus replies, the crystal drops stood trembling in her eyes. O Vulcan, say, was ever breast divine so pierced with sorrows, so overwhelmed as mine? Of all the goddesses, did Jove prepare for Thetis only such a weight of care? I, only I, of all the watery race, by force subjected to a man's embrace, who, sinking now with age and sorrow, pays the mighty fine imposed on length of days. Sprung from my bed, a godlike hero came, the bravest sure that ever bore the name. Like some fair plant beneath my careful hand he grew, he flourished and he graced the land. To Troy I sent him, but his native shore never, ah, never shall receive him more. Even while he lives he wastes with secret woe, nor I, a goddess, can retard the blow. Robbed of the prize the Grecian suffrage gave, the king of nations forced his royal slave. For this he grieved, until the Greeks oppressed required his arm, he sorrowed unredressed. Large gifts they promise, and their elders send. In vain, he arms not, but permits his friend his arms, his steeds, his forces to employ. He marches, combats, almost conquers Troy, then slain by Phoebus, Hector had the name, at once resigns his armor, life, and fame. But thou in pity, by my prayer be won, grace with immortal arms this short-lived son, and to the field in martial pomp restore, to shine with glory, till he shines no more. To her the artist god, thy griefs resign, secure, what Vulcan can is ever thine. Oh, could I hide him from the fates as well, Or with these hands the cruel stroke repel, As I shall forge most envied arms, The gaze of wandering ages and the world's amaze. Thus having said, 
the father of the fires to the black labors of his forge retires. Soon as he bade them blow, the bellows turned their iron mouths, and where the furnace burned, resounding breathed. At once the blast expires, and twenty forges catch at once the fires. Just as the god directs, now loud, now low, they raise a tempest, or they gently blow. In hissing flames huge silver bars are rolled, and stubborn brass, and tin, and solid gold. Before, deep fixed, the eternal anvils stand. The ponderous hammer loads his better hand, his left with tongs turns the vexed metal round, and thick strong strokes the doubling vaults rebound. Then first he formed the immense and solid shield. Rich various artifice emblazed the field. Its utmost verge a threefold circle bound. A silver chain suspends the massy round. Five ample plates the broad expanse compose, and godlike labors on the surface rose. There shone the image of the master mind. There earth, there heaven, there ocean he designed. The unwearied sun, the moon completely round. The starry lights that heaven's high convex crowned. The Pleiades, Hyads with the northern team, and great Orion's more refulgent beam, to which, around the axle of the sky, the bear revolving points his golden eye, still shines exalted on the ethereal plain, nor bathes his blazing forehead in the main. Two cities radiant on the shield appear, the image one of peace and one of war. Here sacred pomp and genial feast delight, and solemn dance and hymeneal rite. Along the street the new-made brides are led, with torches flaming, to the nuptial bed. The youthful dancers in a circle bound to the soft flute and cithern silver sound. Through the fair streets the matrons in a row stand in their porches and enjoy the show. There in the forum swarm a numerous train, the subject of debate, a townsman slain. One pleads the fine discharged, which one denied, and bade the public and the laws decide. The witness is produced on either hand, for this or that the partial people stand. The appointed heralds still the noisy bands, and form a ring with scepters in their hands. On seats of stone, within the sacred place, the reverend elders nodded o'er the case. Alternate, each the attesting scepter took, and rising solemn, each his sentence spoke. Two golden talents lay amidst, in sight, the prize of him who best adjudged the right. Another part, a prospect differing far, glowed with refulgent arms and horrid war. Two mighty hosts a leaguered town embrace, and one would pillage, one would burn the place. Meantime the townsmen, armed with silent care, a secret ambush on the foe prepare. Their wives, their children, and the watchful band of trembling parents on the turrets stand. They march, by Pallas and by Mars made bold, Gold were the gods, their radiant garments, gold, and gold their armor. These the squadron led, august, divine, superior by the head. A place for ambush fit they found and stood, covered with shields, beside a silver flood. Two spies at distance lurk, and watchful seem if sheep or oxen seek the winding stream. Soon the white flocks proceeded o'er the plains, and steers slow-moving, and two shepherd swains. Behind them piping on their reeds they go, nor fear an ambush, nor suspect a foe. In arms the glittering squadron rising round rush sudden, hills of slaughter heap the ground. Whole flocks and herds lie bleeding on the plains, and all amidst them dead the shepherd swains. The bellowing oxen the besiegers hear. They rise, take horse, approach, and meet the war. They fight, they fall, beside the silver flood. The waving silver seemed to blush with blood. Their tumult, their contention stood confessed. One reared a dagger at a captive's breast. One held a living foe that freshly bled with new-made wounds. Another dragged a dead. Now here, now there, the carcasses they tore. Fate stalked amidst them, grim with human gore. And the whole war came out and met the eye, and each bold figure seemed to live or die. A field deep furrowed next the god designed, the third time labored by the sweating hind. The shining shares full many ploughmen guide, and turn their crooked yokes on every side. Still as at either end they wheel around, the master meets them with his goblet crowned. 
the hearty draft rewards, renews their toil, then back the turning plowshares cleave the soil. Behind, the rising earth in ridges rolled, and sable looked, though formed of molten gold. Another field rose high with waving grain, with bended sickles stand the reaper train. Here stretched in ranks the leveled swarths are found, sheaves heaped on sheaves here thicken up the ground. With sweeping stroke the mowers strow the lands, the gatherers follow and collect in bands, and last the children, in whose arms are born, too short to gripe them, the brown sheaves of corn. The rustic monarch of the field descries, with silent glee the heaps around him rise. A ready banquet on the turf is laid, beneath an ample oak's expanded shade. The victim ox the sturdy youth prepare, the reaper's due repast, the woman's care. Next, ripe in yellow gold, a vineyard shines, bent with the ponderous harvest of its vines. A deeper dye the dangling clusters show, and curled on silver props in order glow. A darker metal mixed entrenched the place, and pails of glittering tin the enclosure grace. To this one pathway gently winding leads, where march a train with baskets on their heads, fair maids and blooming youths, that smiling bear the purple product of the autumnal year. To these a youth awakes the warbling strings, whose tender lay the fate of Linus sings. In measured dance behind him move the train, tune soft the voice, and answer to the strain. Here herds of oxen march, erect and bold, rear high their horns and seem to low in gold, and speed to meadows, on whose sounding shores a rapid torrent through the rushes roars. Four golden herdsmen as their guardians stand, and nine sour dogs complete the rustic band. Two lions rushing from the wood appeared, and seized a bull, the master of the herd. He roared, in vain the dogs, the men withstood, they tore his flesh and drank his sable blood. The dogs, oft cheered in vain, desert the prey, dread the grim terrors, and at distance bay. Next this, the eye the art of Vulcan leads deep through fair forests and a length of meads, and stalls and folds and scattered cots between, and fleecy flocks that whiten all the scene. A figured dance succeeds. Such once was seen in lofty gnosis for the Cretan queen, formed by Dedalian art, a comely band of youths and maidens bounding hand in hand, the maids in soft cymars of linen dressed, the youths all graceful in the glossy vest. Of those the locks with flowery wreath enrolled, of these the sides adorned with swords of gold, that glittering gay from silver belts depend. Now all at once they rise, at once descend, with well-taught feet, now shape in oblique ways, confusedly regular, the moving maze. Now forth at once, too swift for sight, they spring, and undistinguished blend the flying ring. So whirls a wheel in giddy circle tossed, and rapid as it runs, the single spokes are lost. The gazing multitudes admire around, two active tumblers in the center bound. Now high, now low, their pliant limbs they bend, and general songs the sprightly revel end. Thus the broad shield complete the artist crowned with his last hand, and poured the ocean round. In living silver seemed the waves to roll, and beat the buckler's verge and bound the whole. This done, what e'er a warrior's use requires he forged, the cuirass that outshone the fires, the greaves of ductile tin, the helm impressed with various sculpture, and the golden crest. At Thetis' feet the finished labor lay, she, as a falcon, cuts the aerial way, swift from Olympus' snowy summit flies, and bears the blazing present through the skies. The, the reconciliation, reconciliation of Achilles, Achilles and, and Agamemnon. Agamemnon Thetis brings to her son the armor made by Vulcan. She preserves the body of his friend from corruption and commands him to assemble the army to declare his resentment at an end. Agamemnon and Achilles are solemnly reconciled the speeches, presents, and ceremonies on that occasion. Achilles is with great difficulty persuaded to refrain from the battle till the troops have refreshed themselves by the advice of Ulysses. The presents are conveyed to the tent of Achilles, where Briseis laments over the body of Patroclus. The hero obstinately refuses all repast, and gives himself up to lamentations for his friend. Minerva descends to strengthen him by the order of Jupiter. He arms for the fight. His appearance described. 
he addresses himself to his horses and reproaches them with the death of Patroclus. One of them is miraculously endued with voice and inspired to prophesy his fate. But the hero, not astonished by that prodigy, rushes with fury to the combat. The thirtieth day. The scene is on the seashore. Soon as Aurora heaved her orient head above the waves that blushed with early red, with newborn day to gladden mortal sight and gild the courts of heaven with sacred light, the immortal arms the goddess mother bears swift to her son. Her son she finds in tears stretched o'er Patroclus' course, while all the rest their sovereign sorrows in their own expressed. A ray divine her heavenly presence shed, and thus his hand soft touching, Thetis said, Suppress, my son, this rage of grief, and know it was not man but heaven that gave the blow. Behold what arms by Vulcan are bestowed, arms worthy thee, or fit to grace a god. Then drops the radiant burden on the ground, clang the strong arms and ring the shores around. Back shrink the myrmidons with dread surprise, and from the broad effulgence turn their eyes. Unmoved, the hero kindles at the show, and feels with rage divine his bosom glow. From his fierce eyeballs living flames expire, and flash incessant like a stream of fire. He turns the radiant gift, and feeds his mind on all the immortal artist had designed. Goddess, he cried, these glorious arms that shine with matchless art confess the hand divine. Now to the bloody battle let me bend, but ah, the relics of my slaughtered friend! In those wide wounds through which his spirit fled, shall flies and worms obscene pollute the dead? That unavailing care be laid aside, the azure goddess to her son replied. Whole years untouched, uninjured shall remain, fresh as in life the carcass of the slain. But go, Achilles, as affairs require, before the Grecian peers renounce thine ire. Then, uncontrolled, in boundless war engage, and heaven with strength supply the mighty rage. Then in the nostrils of the slain she poured nectarious drops, and rich ambrosia showered o'er all the course. The flies forbid their prey, untouched it rests, and sacred from decay. Achilles to the strand obedient went. The shores resounded with the voice he sent. The heroes heard, and all the naval train that tend the ships, or guide them o'er the main, alarmed, transported at the well-known sound, frequent and full the great assembly crowned. Studious to see the terror of the plain, long lost to battle, shine in arms again. Tydides and Ulysses first appear, lame with their wounds, and leaning on the spear. These on the sacred seats of council placed, the king of men, Atrides, came the last. He, too, sore wounded by Agenor's son. Achilles, rising in the midst, begun. O monarch, better far had been the fate of thee, of me, of all the Grecian state, if, ere the day when by mad passion swayed, rash we contended for the black-eyed maid, preventing Diane had dispatched her dart, and shot the shining mischief to the heart. Then many a hero had not pressed the shore, nor Troy's glad fields been fattened with our gore. Long, long shall Greece the woes we caused bewail, and sad posterity repeat the tale. But this, no more the subject of debate, is past, forgotten, and resigned to fate. Why should, alas, a mortal man as I, burn with a fury that can never die? Here then my anger ends. Let war succeed, and even as Greece has bled, let Ilion bleed. Now call the hosts, and try if in our sight Troy yet shall dare to camp a second night. I deem their mightiest, when this arm he knows, shall scape with transport and with joy repose. He said, his finished wrath, with loud acclaim the Greeks accept, and shout Pelides' name. When thus, not rising from his lofty throne, in state unmoved, the king of men begun. Hear me, ye sons of Greece, with silence, hear, and grant your monarch an impartial ear. A while your loud, untimely joy suspend, and let your rash, injurious clamors end. Unruly murmurs or ill-timed applause wrong the best speaker and the justest cause. Nor charge on me, ye Greeks, the dire debate. No, angry Jove and all-compelling fate with fell Arenes, 
urged my wrath that day, when from Achilles' arms I forced the prey. What then could I against the will of heaven? Not by myself, but vengeful Ati driven. She, Jove's dread daughter, fated to infest the race of mortals, entered in my breast. Not on the ground that haughty fury treads, but prints her lofty footsteps on the heads of mighty men, inflicting as she goes long festering wounds, inextricable woes. Of old she stalked amid the bright abodes, and Jove himself, the sire of men and gods, the world's great ruler, felt her venomed dart. Deceived by Juno's wiles and female art, for when Alcmena's nine long months were run, and Jove expected his immortal son, to gods and goddesses the unruly joy he showed, and vaunted of his matchless boy. From us, he said, this day an infant springs, fated to rule and born a king of kings. Saturnia asked an oath to vouch the truth, and fix dominion on the favored youth. The thunderer, unsuspicious of the fraud, pronounced those solemn words that bind a god. The joyful goddess, from Olympus' height, swift to Achaean Argos, bent her flight. Scarce seven moons gone lay Sthenelus's wife. She pushed her lingering infant into life. Her charms Alcmana's coming labor stay, and stop the babe, just issuing to the day. Then bids Saturnius bear his oath in mind. A youth, said she, of Jove's immortal kind is this day born. From Sthenelus he springs, and claims thy promise to be king of kings. Grief seized the thunderer by his oath engaged. Stung to the soul, he sorrowed and he raged. From his ambrosial head, where perched she sate, he snatched the fury goddess of debate. The dread, the irrevocable oath he swore, the immortal seats should ne'er behold her more and whirled her headlong down, forever driven from bright Olympus and the starry heaven. Thence on the nether world the fury fell, ordained with man's contentious race to dwell. Full oft the god his son's hard toils bemoaned, cursed the dire fury, and in secret groaned. Even thus, like Jove himself, was I misled, while raging Hector heaped our camps with dead. What can the errors of my rage atone? My martial troops, my treasures are thy own. This instant from the navy shall be sent what e'er Ulysses promised at thy tent. But thou, appeased, propitious to our prayer, resume thy arms and shine again in war. O king of nations whose superior sway, returns Achilles, all our hosts obey. To keep or send the presents be thy care. To us tis equal. All we ask is war. While yet we talk or but an instant shun the fight, our glorious work remains undone. Let every Greek who sees my spear confound the Trojan ranks and deal destruction round, with emulation what I act survey, and learn from thence the business of the day. The son of Peleus thus, and thus replies the great in councils, Ithacus the wise. Though, godlike, thou art by no toils oppressed, at least our armies claim repast and rest. Long and laborious must the combat be, when by the gods inspired and led by thee. Strength is derived from spirits and from blood, and those augment by generous wine and food. What boastful son of war, without that stay, can last a hero through a single day? Courage may prompt, but, ebbing out his strength, mere unsupported man must yield at length. Shrunk with dry famine and with toils declined, the drooping body will desert the mind. But built anew with strength conferring fair, with limbs and soul untamed, he tires a war. Dismiss the people then, and give command, with strong repast to hearten every band. But let the presence to Achilles made, in full assembly of all Greece be laid. The king of men shall rise in public sight, and solemn swear, observant of the right, that, spotless, as she came, the maid removes, pure from his arms and guiltless of his loves. That done, a sumptuous banquet shall be made, and the full price of injured honor paid. Stretch not henceforth, O prince, thy sovereign might, beyond the bounds of reason and of right. Tis the chief praise that e'er to kings belonged, to right with justice whom with power they wronged. To him the monarch. Just is thy decree. Thy words give joy, and wisdom breathes in thee. Each due atonement gladly I prepare, and heaven regard me as I justly swear. 
Here then a while let Greece assembled stay, nor great Achilles grudge this short delay, till from the fleet our presence be conveyed, and Jove attesting, the firm compact made. A train of noble youths the charge shall bear, these to select, Ulysses, be thy care. In order ranked let all our gifts appear, and the fair train of captives close the rear. Talthybius shall the victim boar convey, sacred to Jove, and yon bright orb of day. For this, the stern Aesides replies, some less important season may suffice, when the stern fury of the war is o'er, and wrath, extinguished, burns my breast no more. By Hector slain, their faces to the sky, all grim with gaping wounds, our heroes lie. Those call to war, and might my voice incite, now, now, this instant, shall commence the fight. Then, when the day's complete, let generous bowls, and copious banquets, glad your weary souls. Let not my palate know the taste of food, till my insatiate rage be cloyed with blood. Pale lies my friend, with wounds disfigured o'er, and his cold feet are pointed to the door. Revenge is all my soul, no meaner care, interest, or thought has room to harbor there. Destruction be my feast, and mortal wounds, and scenes of blood, and agonizing sounds. O first of Greeks, Ulysses thus rejoined, the best and bravest of the warrior kind, thy praise it is in dreadful camps to shine, but old experience and calm wisdom mine. Then hear my counsel, and to reason yield, the bravest soon are satiate of the field. Though vast the heaps that strow the crimson plain, the bloody harvest brings but little gain. The scale of conquest ever wavering lies, great Jove but turns it, and the victor dies. The great, the bold, by thousands daily fall, and endless were the grief to weep for all. Eternal sorrows, what avails to shed? Greece honors not with solemn fasts the dead. Enough, when death demands the brave, to pay the tribute of a melancholy day. One chief with patience to the grave resigned, our care devolves on others left behind. Let generous food supplies of strength produce, let rising spirits flow from sprightly juice, let their warm heads with scenes of battle glow, and pour new furies on the feebler foe. Yet a short interval, and none shall dare expect a second summons to the war. Who waits for that, the dire effects shall find, if trembling in the ships he lags behind. Embodied, to the battle let us bend, and all at once on haughty Troy descend. And now the delegates Ulysses sent, to bear the presents from the royal tent. The sons of Nestor, Phileus, valiant heir, Thias and Merion, thunderbolts of war, with Lycomedes of Cryontian strain, and Melanippus formed the chosen train. Swift as the word was given, the youths obeyed. Twice ten bright faces in the midst they laid. A row of six fair tripods then succeeds, and twice the number of high-bounding steeds. Seven captives next a lovely line compose. The eighth Briseis, like the blooming rose, closed the bright band. Great Ithacus, before, first of the train, the golden talents bore. The rest in public view the chiefs dispose, a splendid scene. Then Agamemnon rose. The boar Talthybius held. The Grecian lord drew the broad cutlass sheathed beside his sword. The stubborn bristles from the victim's brow he crops, and offering meditates his vow. His hands uplifted to the attesting skies, on heaven's broad marble roof were fixed his eyes. The solemn words a deep attention draw, and Greece around sat thrilled with sacred awe. Witness thou first, thou greatest power above, all good, all wise, and all surveying Jove, and Mother Earth, and Heaven's revolving light, and ye, fell furies of the realms of night, who rule the dead, and horrid woes prepare for perjured kings, and all who falsely swear. The black-eyed maid in violet removes, pure and unconscious of my manly loves. If this be false, heaven all its vengeance shed, and leveled thunder strike my guilty head. With that, his weapon deep inflicts the wound. The bleeding savage tumbles to the ground. The sacred herald rolls the victim slain, a feast for fish, into the foaming main. Then thus Achilles, Hear ye Greeks, and know what e'er we feel, tis Jove inflicts the woe. Not Elsatrides could our rage inflame, nor from my arms unwilling force the dame. 
"'Twas Jove's high will alone, or ruling all, "'that doomed our strife, and doomed the Greeks to fall. "'Go then, ye chiefs, indulge the genial right. "'Achilles waits ye, and expects the fight.' The speedy council at his word adjourned. To their black vessels all the Greeks returned. Achilles sought his tent. His train before marched onward, bending with the gifts they bore. Those in the tents the squires industrious spread. The foaming coursers to the stalls they led. To their new seats the female captives move. Briseis, radiant as the queen of love, slow as she passed, beheld with sad survey where, gashed with cruel wounds, Patroclus lay. Prone on the body fell the heavenly fair, Beat her sad breast, and tore her golden hair. All beautiful in grief, her humid eyes Shining with tears she lifts, and thus she cries. Ah, youth forever dear, forever kind, Once tender friend of my distracted mind! I left thee fresh in life, in beauty gay, Now find thee cold, inanimated clay. What woes my wretched race of life attend! Sorrows on sorrows, never doomed to end. The first loved concert of my virgin bed Before these eyes in fatal battle bled. My three brave brothers, in one mournful day, All trod the dark, irremeable way. Thy friendly hand upreared me from the plain, And dried my sorrows for a husband slain. Achilles' care you promised I should prove, The first, the dearest partner of his love. That rites divine should ratify the band, And make me empress in his native land. Accept these grateful tears, for thee they flow, For thee that ever felt another's woe. Her sister captives echoed groan for groan, Nor mourned Patroclus' fortunes but their own. The leaders pressed the chief on every side, Unmoved he heard them, and with sighs denied. If yet Achilles have a friend, whose care is bent to please him, this request forbear. Till yonder sun descend, ah, let me pay to grief and anguish one abstemious day. He spoke, and from the warriors turned his face. Yet still the brother kings of Atreus' race, Nestor, Idomeneus, Ulysses sage, and Phoenix, strive to calm his grief and rage. His rage they calm not, nor his grief control. He groans, he raves, he sorrows from his soul. Thou too, Patroclus, thus his heart events, Once spread the inviting banquet in our tents. Thy sweet society, thy winning care, Once stayed Achilles, rushing to the war. But now, alas, to death's cold arms resigned, What banquet but revenge can glad my mind? What greater sorrow could afflict my breast? What more if hoary Peleus were deceased? Who now, perhaps, in Thea dreads to hear his son's sad fate, and drops a tender tear? What more, should Neoptolemus the brave, my only offspring, sink into the grave? If yet that offspring lives, I, distant far, of all neglectful, wage a hateful war. I could not this, this cruel stroke attend. Fate claimed Achilles, but might spare his friend. I hoped Patroclus might survive, to rear my tender orphan with a parent's care. From Skyros I'll conduct him o'er the main, And glad his eyes with his paternal reign, The lofty palace, and the large domain. For Peleus breathes no more the vital air, Or drags a wretched life of age and care, But till the news of my sad fate Invades his hastening soul, And sinks him to the shades. Sighing he said, His grief the heroes joined, Each stole a tear for what he left behind. Their mingled grief the sire of heaven surveyed, And thus with pity to his blue-eyed maid. Is then Achilles now no more thy care? And dost thou thus desert the great in war? Lo, where yon sails their canvas wings extend, All comfortless he sits, and wails his friend. Ere thirst and want his forces have oppressed, Haste and infuse ambrosia in his breast. He spoke, and sudden, at the word of Jove, Shot the descending goddess from above. So swift through ether the shrill harpy springs, The wide air floating to her ample wings, To great Achilles she her flight addressed, And poured divine ambrosia in his breast, With nectar sweet, refection of the gods, Then, swift ascending, sought the bright abodes. Now issued from the ships the warrior train, And like a deluge poured upon the plain, As when the piercing blasts of Boreas blow, And scatter o'er the fields the driving snow, from dusky clouds the fleecy winter flies, Whose dazzling luster whitens all the skies. 
So helms succeeding helms, so shields from shields, Catch the quick beams, and brighten all the fields. Broad glittering breastplates, spears with pointed rays, Mix in one stream, reflecting blaze on blaze. Thick beats the center as the coursers bound, With splendor flame the skies, and laugh the fields around. Full in the midst, high towering o'er the rest, His limbs in arms divine Achilles dressed arms which the father of the fire bestowed, forged on the eternal anvils of the god. Grief and revenge his furious heart inspire, his glowing eyeballs roll with living fire. He grinds his teeth, and furious with delay, o'erlooks the embattled host, and hopes the bloody day. The silver quishes first his thighs enfold, then o'er his breast was braced the hollow gold. The brazen sword of various baldric tied, that, starred with gems, hung glittering at his side, and like the moon, the broad refulgent shield blazed with long rays, and gleamed athwart the field. So to night wandering sailors, pale with fears, wide o'er the watery waste, a light appears, which on the far seen mountain, blazing high, streams from some lonely watch tower to the sky. With mournful eyes they gaze, and gaze again. Loud howls the storm, and drives them o'er the main. Next his high head the helmet graced. Behind the sweepy crest hung floating in the wind, Like the red star that from his flaming hair Shakes down diseases, pestilence, and war. So streamed the golden honors from his head, Trembled the sparkling plumes, and the loose glories shed. The chief beholds himself with wondering eyes, His arms he poises, and his motions tries, Buoyed by some inward force, he seems to swim, and feels a pinion lifting every limb. And now he shakes his great paternal spear, ponderous and huge, which not a Greek could rear. From Pelion's cloudy top an ash entire old Chiron felled, and shaped it for his sire. A spear which stern Achilles only wields, the death of heroes, and the dread of fields. Automedon and Alchemist prepare the immortal coursers and the radiant car. The silver traces sweeping at their side, Their fiery mouths resplendent bridles tied, The ivory-studded reins returned behind, Waved o'er their backs, and to the chariot joined. The charioteer then whirled the lash around, And swift ascended at one active bound. All bright in heavenly arms, above his squire Achilles mounts, And sets the field on fire. Not brighter Phoebus in the ethereal way Flames from his chariot, and restores the day. High o'er the host, all terrible he stands, And thunders to his steeds these dread commands. Xanthus and Balius, of Pudargy's strain, Unless ye boast that heavenly race in vain, Be swift, be mindful of the load ye bear, And learn to make your master more your care. Through falling squadrons bear my slaughtering sword, Nor, as ye left Patroclus, leave your lord. The generous Xanthus, as the words he said, Seemed sensible of woe, and drooped his head. Trembling he stood before the golden wain, And bowed to dust the honors of his mane. When, strange to tell, so Juno willed, He broke eternal silence, and portentous spoke. Achilles, yes, this day at least we bear thy rage in safety Through the files of war. But come it will, the fatal time must come. Not ours the fault, but God decrees thy doom. Not through our crime, or slowness in the course, Fell thy Patroclus, but by heavenly force. The bright far-shooting god who gilds the day, Confessed we saw him, tore his arms away. No, could our swiftness or the winds prevail, Or beat the pinions of the western gale, All were in vain. The fates thy death demand, Due to a mortal and immortal hand. Then ceased for ever, by the furious tide, His fateful voice. The intrepid chief replied with unabated rage, So let it be! Portents and prodigies are lost on me. I know my fate, to die, to see no more my much-loved parents and my native shore. Enough, when heaven ordains I sink in night. Now perish Troy, he said, and rushed to fight. The, the battle, battle of the, of the gods, gods and, and the, the acts, acts of Achilles. Achilles. Jupiter, upon Achilles' return to the battle, calls a council of the gods, and permits them to assist either party. The terrors of the combat described when the deities are engaged. Apollo encourages Aeneas to meet Achilles. After a long conversation, these two heroes encounter, but Aeneas is preserved by the assistance of Neptune. 
Achilles falls upon the rest of the Trojans and is upon the point of killing Hector, but Apollo conveys him away in a cloud. Achilles pursues the Trojans with a great slaughter. The same day continues. The scene is in the field before Troy. Thus round Pelides, breathing war and blood, Greece, sheathed in arms, beside her vessels stood. While near impending from a neighboring height, Troy's black battalions wait the shock of fight. Then Jove to Themis gives command to call the gods to council in the starry hall. Swift o'er Olympus' hundred hills she flies and summons all the senate of the skies. These shining on, in long procession, come to Jove's eternal adamantine dome. Not one was absent, not a rural power that haunts the verdant gloom or rosy bower. Each fair-haired dryad of the shady wood, each azure sister of the silver flood, all but old ocean, hoary sire, who keeps his ancient seat beneath the sacred deeps. On marble thrones, with lucid columns crowned, the work of Vulcan, sat the powers around. Even he whose trident sways the watery rain, heard the loud summons, and forsook the main, assumed his throne amid the bright abodes, and questioned thus the sire of men and gods. What moves the god who heaven and earth commands, and grasps the thunder in his awful hands, thus to convene the whole ethereal state? Is Greece and Troy the subject in debate? Already met, the lowering hosts appear, and death stands ardent on the edge of war. "'Tis true,' the cloud-compelling power replies. "'This day we call the council of the skies in care of human race. "'Even Jove's own eye sees with regret unhappy mortals die. "'Far on Olympus' top in secret state ourself will sit "'and see the hand of fate work out our will. "'Celestial powers, descend, and as your minds direct, "'your succor lend to either host. "'Troy soon must lie o'erthrown, if uncontrolled Achilles fights alone.' Their troops but lately durst not meet his eyes. What can they now, if in his rage he rise? Assist them, gods, or Ilion's sacred wall may fall this day, though fate forbids the fall. He said, and fired their heavenly breasts with rage. On adverse parts the warring gods engage. Heaven's awful queen, and he whose azure round girds the vast globe, the maiden arms renowned, Hermes of profitable arts the sire and Vulcan, the black sovereign of the fire. These to the fleet repair with instant flight, the vessels tremble as the gods alight. In aid of Troy, Latona, Phoebus came, Mars, fiery-helmed, the laughter-loving dame, Xanthus, whose streams in golden currents flow, and the chaste huntress of the silver bow. Ere yet the gods their various aid employ, each argive bosom swelled with manly joy. While great Achilles, terror of the plain, long lost to battle, shone in arms again. Dreadful he stood in front of all his host, pale Troy beheld, and seemed already lost. Her bravest heroes pant with inward fear, and trembling see another god of war. But when the powers descending swelled the fight, then tumult rose, fierce rage and pale affright varied each face. Then discord sounds alarms, earth echoes, and the nations rush to arms. Now through the trembling shores Minerva calls, and now she thunders from the Grecian walls. Mars hovering o'er his Troy, his terror shrouds in gloomy tempests and a night of clouds. Now through each Trojan heart he fury pours with voice divine from Ilion's topmost towers. Now shouts to Simois from her beauteous hill. The mountain shook, the rapid stream stood still. Above, the sire of gods his thunder rolls, and peals on peals redoubled rend the poles. Beneath, stern Neptune shakes the solid ground, the forests wave, the mountains nod around. Through all their summits tremble Ida's woods, and from their sources boil her hundred floods. Troy's turrets totter on the rocking plain, and the tossed navies beat the heaving main. Deep in the dismal regions of the dead, the infernal monarch reared his horrid head, leaped from his throne, lest Neptune's arm should lay his dark dominions open to the day, and pour in light on Pluto's dread abodes, abhorred by men, and dreadful even to gods. Such war the immortals wage, such horrors rend the world's vast concave, when the gods contend. 
first silver-shafted Phoebus took the plain against blue Neptune, monarch of the main. The god of arms his giant bulk displayed, opposed to Pallas, war's triumphant maid. Against Latona marched the son of May, the quivered Diane, sister of the day, her golden arrows sounding at her side, Saturnia, majesty of heaven, defied. With fiery Vulcan last in battle stands the sacred flood that rolls on golden sands. Xanthus his name with those of heavenly birth, but called Scamander by the sons of earth. While thus the gods in various league engage, Achilles glowed with more than mortal rage. Hector he sought. In search of Hector turned his eyes around, for Hector only burned, and burst like lightning through the ranks, and vowed to glut the god of battles with his blood. Aeneas was the first who dared to stay. Apollo wedged him in the warrior's way, but swelled his bosom with undaunted might, half forced and half persuaded to the fight. Like young Lycaon of the royal line, in voice and aspect seemed the power divine, and bade the chief reflect how late with scorn in distant threats he braved the goddess born. Then thus the hero of Anchises' strain, To meet Pelides you persuade in vain. Already have I met, nor void of fear observed the fury of his flying spear. From Ida's woods he chased us to the field, our force he scattered, and our herds he killed. Lernassus, Pedasus in ashes lay, but, Jove assisting, I survived the day. Else had I sunk oppressed in fatal fight by fierce Achilles and Minerva's might. Where'er he moved, the goddess shone before, and bathed his brazen lance in hostile gore. What mortal man Achilles can sustain? The immortals guard him through the dreadful plain, and suffer not his dart to fall in vain. Were God my aid, this arm should check his power, though strong in battle as a brazen tower. To whom the son of Jove? That God implore, and be what great Achilles was before. From heavenly Venus thou derivedst thy strain, and he but from a sister of the main, an aged sea-god father of his line but Jove himself the sacred source of thine. Then lift thy weapon for a noble blow, nor fear the vaunting of a mortal foe. This said, and spirit breathed into his breast, through the thick troops the emboldened hero pressed. His venturous act the white-armed queen surveyed, and thus, assembling all the powers, she said, Behold an action, gods, that claims your care, lo, great Aeneas rushing to the war. Against Pelides he directs his course, Phoebus impels, and Phoebus gives him force. Restrain his bold career, at least to attend our favored hero, let some power descend. To guard his life, and add to his renown, we, the great armament of heaven, came down. Hereafter let him fall, as fate's design, that spun so short his life's illustrious line. But lest some adverse god now cross his way, Give him to know what powers assist this day. For how shall mortal stand the dire alarms When heaven's refulgent host appear in arms? Thus she, and thus the god whose force Can make the solid globe's eternal bases shake. Against the might of man so feeble known, Why should celestial powers exert their own? Suffice from yonder mount to view the scene, And leave to war the fates of mortal men. But if the armipotent or god of light obstruct Achilles or commence the fight, thence on the gods of Troy we swift descend. Full soon, I doubt not, shall the conflict end, and these, in ruin and confusion hurled, yield to our conquering arms the lower world. Thus having said, the tyrant of the sea, Cerulean Neptune, rose and led the way. Advanced upon the field there stood a mound of earth congested, walled and trenched around. In elder times to guard Alcides made, the work of Trojans with Minerva's aid, what time a vengeful monster of the main swept the wide shore and drove him to the plain. Here Neptune and the gods of Greece repair, with clouds encompassed and a veil of air. The adverse powers around Apollo laid, crown the fair hills that silver Simois shade. In circle close each heavenly party sat, intent to form the future scheme of fate. But mix not yet in fight, though Jove on high gives the loud signal and the heavens reply. Meanwhile the rushing armies hide the ground, the trampled center yields a hollow sound. 
steeds cased in mail, and chiefs in armor bright, the gleaming champagne glows with brazen light. Amid both hosts, a dreadful space, appear, their great Achilles, bold Aeneas here. With towering strides Aeneas first advanced, the nodding plumage on his helmet danced, spread o'er his breast the fencing shield he bore, and, so he moved, his javelin flamed before. Not so Pelides, furious to engage, he rushed impetuous. Such the lion's rage, who viewing first his foes with scornful eyes, though all in arms the peopled city rise, stalks careless on, with unregarding pride, till at the length, by some brave youth defied, to his bold spear the savage turns alone, he murmurs fury with a hollow groan. He grins, he foams, he rolls his eyes around, Lashed by his tail, his heaving sides resound. He calls up all his rage, he grinds his teeth, Resolved on vengeance, or resolved on death. So fierce Achilles on Aeneas flies, So stands Aeneas, and his force defies. Ere yet the stern encounter joined, Begun the seat of Thetis thus to Venus' son. Why comes Aeneas through the ranks so far? Seeks he to meet Achilles' arm in war? in hope the realms of Priam to enjoy, and prove his merits to the throne of Troy? Grant that beneath thy lance Achilles dies, the partial monarch may refuse the prize. Sons he has many, those thy pride make well, and tis his fault to love those sons too well. Or in reward of thy victorious hand, has Troy proposed some spacious tract of land, an ample forest, or a fair domain, of hills for vines, and arable for grain? Even this, perhaps, will hardly prove thy lot. But can Achilles be so soon forgot? Once, as I think, you saw this brandished spear, and then the great Aeneas seemed to fear. With hearty haste from Ida's mount he fled, nor, till he reached Lernessus, turned his head. Her lofty walls not long our progress stayed. Those, Pallas, Jove, and we, in ruins laid. In Grecian chains her captive race were cast. Tis true, the great Aeneas fled too fast. Defrauded of my conquest once before, what then I lost, the gods this day restore. Go, while thou mayst, avoid the threatened fate. Fools stay to feel it, and are wise too late. To this Anchises' son. Such words employ to one that fears thee, some unwarlike boy. Such we disdain. The best may be defied with mean reproaches and unmanly pride. Unworthy the high race from which we came, proclaimed so loudly by the voice of fame. Each from illustrious fathers draws his line, each goddess born, half human, half divine. Thetis this day, or Venus offspring dies, and tears shall trickle from celestial eyes. For when two heroes, thus derived, contend, tis not in words the glorious strife can end. If yet thou further seek to learn my birth, a tale resounded through the spacious earth, hear how the glorious origin we prove from ancient Dardanus, the first from Jove. Dardania's walls he raised. For Ilion then, the city sense of many languaged men, was not. The natives were content to till the shady foot of Ida's fountful hill. From Dardanus, great Erichthonius springs, the richest once of Asia's wealthy kings. Three thousand mares his spacious pastures bred, three thousand foals beside their mothers fed. Boreas, enamored of the sprightly train, concealed his godhead in a flowing mane. With voice dissembled to his loves he neighed, and coursed the dappled beauties o'er the mead. Hence sprung twelve others of unrivaled kind, Swift as their mother mares, and father wind. These lightly skimming, when they swept the plain, Nor plied the grass, nor bent the tender grain. And when along the level seas they flew, Scarce on the surface curled the briny dew. Such Erichthonius was. From him there came the sacred Tros, Of whom the Trojan name. Three sons renowned adorned his nuptial bed, Elis, Aceracus, and Ganymed. The matchless Ganymed, divinely fair, whom heaven, enamoured, snatched to upper air, to bear the cup of Jove, ethereal guest, the grace and glory of the ambrosial feast. The two remaining sons the line defied, first rose Laomedon from Ilus side. From him to Thonis, now in cares grown old, and Priam, blessed with Hector, 
brave and bold. Clytius and Lampus ever honored pair, and Hycateon, thunderbolt of war. From great Assyricus sprung Capis, he begat Anchises, and Anchises me. Such is our race. Tis fortune gives us birth, but Jove alone endues the soul with worth. He, source of power and might, with boundless sway, all human courage gives, or takes away. Long in the field of words we may contend, reproach is infinite, and knows no end, armed or with truth or falsehood, right or wrong, so voluble a weapon is the tongue. Wounded we wound, and neither side can fail, for every man has equal strength to rail. Women alone, when in the streets they jar, perhaps excel us in this wordy war. Like us they stand, encompassed with the crowd, and vent their anger impotent and loud. Cease, then. Our business in the field of fight is not to question, but to prove our might. To all those insults thou hast offered here, receive this answer. Tis my flying spear. He spoke. With all his force the javelin flung, fixed deep and loudly in the buckler rung. Far on his outstretched arm, Pelides held, to meet the thundering lance, his dreadful shield, that trembled as it stuck, nor void of fear saw, ere it fell, the immeasurable spear. His fears were vain. Impenetrable charms secured the temper of the ethereal arms. Through two strong plates the point its passage held, but stopped and rested by the third repelled. Five plates of various metal, various mold, composed the shield, of brass each outward fold, of tin each inward, and the middle gold. There stuck the lance. Then rising ere he threw, the forceful spear of great Achilles flew, and pierced the Dardan shield's extremest bound, where the shrill brass returned a sharper sound. Through the thin verge the Pelian weapon glides, and the slight covering of expanded hides. Aeneas his contracted body bends, and o'er him high the riven targe extends, sees through its parting plates the upper air, and at his back perceives the quivering spear. A fate so near him chills his soul with fright, and swims before his eyes the many-colored light. Achilles, rushing in with dreadful cries, draws his broad blade, and at Aeneas flies. Aeneas, rousing as the foe came on, with force collected, heaves a mighty stone. A mass enormous, which in modern days no two of earth's degenerate sons could raise. But ocean's god, whose earthquakes rock the ground, saw the distress and moved the powers around. Lo, on the brink of fate Aeneas stands, an instant victim to Achilles' hands, by Phoebus urged. But Phoebus has bestowed his aid in vain. The man o'erpowers the god. And can ye see this righteous chief atone with guiltless blood for vices not his own? To all the gods his constant vows were paid. Sure, though he wars for Troy, he claims our aid. Fate wills not this, nor thus can Jove resign the future father of the Dardan line. The first great ancestor obtained his grace, and still his love descends on all the race. For Priam now, and Priam's faithless kind, at length are odious to the all-seeing mind. On great Aeneas shall devolve the reign, and sun succeeding sons the lasting line sustain. The great earth-shaker thus, to whom replies the imperial goddess with the radiant eyes. Good as he is, to immolate or spare the Dardan prince, O Neptune, be thy care. Pallas and I, by all that gods can bind, have sworn destruction to the Trojan kind, not even an instant to protract their fate, or save one member of the sinking state, till her last flame be quenched with her last gore, and even her crumbling ruins are no more. The king of ocean to the fight descends, through all the whistling darts his course he bends, swift interposed between the warrior flies, and casts thick darkness o'er Achilles' eyes. From great Aeneas' shield the spear he drew, and at his master's feet the weapon threw. That done, with force divine he snatched on high the Dardan prince, and bore him through the sky, smooth gliding without step, above the heads of warring heroes and of bounding steeds, till at the battle's utmost verge they light, where the slow cockens close the rear of fight. The godhead there, his heavenly form confessed, with words like these the panting chief addressed. What power, O prince, with force inferior far, 
urged thee to meet Achilles' arm in war. Henceforth beware, nor antedate thy doom, defrauding fate of all thy fame to come. But when the day decreed, for come it must, shall lay this dreadful hero in the dust, let then the furies of that arm be known, secure no Grecian force transcends thy own. With that he left him wondering as he lay, then from Achilles chased the mist away. Sudden, returning with a stream of light, the scene of war came rushing on his sight. Then thus amazed, What wonders strike my mind, my spear that parted on the wings of wind, laid here before me, and the Dardan lord, that fell this instant, vanished from my sword. I thought alone with mortals to contend, but powers celestial sure this foe defend. Great as he is, our arms he scarce will try, content for once, with all his gods, to fly. Now then let others bleed. This said, aloud he vents his fury and inflames the crowd. O Greeks, he cries, and every rank alarms, join battle, man to man, and arms to arms. Tis not in me, though favored by the sky, to mow whole troops and make whole armies fly. No god can singly such a host engage, not Mars himself, nor great Minerva's rage. But whatsoe'er Achilles can inspire, what air of active force or acting fire, what air this heart can prompt or hand obey, all, all Achilles' Greeks, is yours to-day. Through yon wide host this arm shall scatter fear, and thin the squadrons with my single spear. He said, nor less elate with martial joy, the godlike Hector warmed the troops of Troy. Trojans, to war! Think Hector leads you on, nor dread the vaunts of Peleus' haughty son. Deeds must decide our fate. E'en these with words insult the brave, who tremble at their swords. The weakest atheist wretch all heaven defies, but shrinks and shudders when the thunder flies. Nor from yon boaster shall your chief retire, not though his heart were steel, his hands were fire. That fire, that steel, your Hector should withstand, and brave that vengeful heart, that dreadful hand. Thus, breathing rage through all, the hero said, A wood of lances rises round his head, Clamors on clamors tempest all the air, They join, they throng, they thicken to the war. But Phoebus warns him from high heaven To shun the single fight with Thetis' godlike son. More safe to combat in the mingled band, Nor tempt too near the terrors of his hand. He hears, obedient to the god of light, And, plunged within the ranks, awaits the fight. Then fierce Achilles, shouting to the skies, On Troy's whole force with boundless fury flies. First falls Iphitian at his army's head. Brave was the chief, and brave the host he led. From great Otrinteus he derived his blood. His mother was a nace of the flood. Beneath the shades of Thmolus, crowned with snow, from Hyde's walls he ruled the lands below. Fierce as he springs, the sword his head divides. The parted visage falls on equal sides. With loud resounding arms he strikes the plain, while thus Achilles glories o'er the slain. Lie there, O Trinitides, the Trojan earth receives thee dead, though Gyge boasts thy birth, those beauteous fields where Hylas waves are rolled, and plenteous Hermus swells with tides of gold, are thine no more the insulting hero said, and left him sleeping in eternal shade. The rolling wheels of Greece the body tore, and dashed their axles with no vulgar gore. Demolion next, Antenor's offspring, laid breathless in dust the price of rashness paid. The impatient steel with full descending sway forced through his brazen helm its furious way. Resistless drove the battered skull before, and dashed and mingled all the brains with gore. This sees Hippotamus, and seized with fright, deserts his chariot for a swifter flight. The lance arrests him, an ignoble wound the panting Trojan rivets to the ground. He groans away his soul. Not louder roars, at Neptune's shrine on Hellas' high shores, the victim bull. The rocks rebellow round, and ocean listens to the grateful sound. Then fell on Polydor his vengeful rage, the youngest hope of Priam's stooping age whose feet for swiftness in the race surpassed, of all his sons the dearest and the last. To the forbidden field he takes his flight in the first folly of a youthful knight, to vaunt his swiftness wheels around the plain, 
but vaunts not long, with all his swiftness slain. Struck where the crossing belts unite behind, and golden rings the double back-plate joined, forth through the navel burst the thrilling steel, and on his knees with piercing shrieks he fell. The rushing entrails poured upon the ground his hands collect, and darkness wraps him round. When Hector viewed, all ghastly in his gore, thus sadly slain the unhappy Polydor, a cloud of sorrow overcast his sight, his soul no longer brooked the distant fight. Full in Achilles' dreadful front he came, and shook his javelin like a waving flame. The son of Peleus sees, with joy possessed, his heart high bounding in his rising breast. And lo, the man on whom black fates attend, the man that slew Achilles, is his friend. No more shall Hector's and Pelides' spear turn from each other in the walks of war. Then with revengeful eyes he scanned him o'er. Come and receive thy fate. He spake no more. Hector, undaunted, thus. Such words employ to one that dreads thee, some unwarlike boy. Such we could give, defying and defied, mean intercourse of obloquy and pride. I know thy force to mine superior far, but heaven alone confers success in war. Mean as I am, the gods may guide my dart, and give it entrance in a braver heart. Then parts the lance, but Pallas' heavenly breath far from Achilles wafts the winged death. The bidden dart again to Hector flies, and at the feet of its great master lies. Achilles closes with his hated foe, his heart and eyes with flaming fury glow. But present to his aid, Apollo shrouds the favored hero in a veil of clouds. Thrice struck Pelides with indignant heart, thrice in impassive air he plunged the dart. The spear of fourth time buried in the cloud, he foams with fury and exclaims aloud, Wretch, thou hast scaped again. Once more thy flight has saved thee, and the partial god of light. But long thou shalt not thy just fate withstand, if any power assist Achilles' hand. Fly then inglorious, but thy flight this day whole hecatombs of Trojan ghosts shall pay. With that he gluts his rage on numbers slain. Then Dryops tumbled to the ensanguined plain, pierced through the neck, he left him panting there, and stopped Demuchus, great Philetor's heir. Gigantic chief, deep gashed the enormous blade, and for the soul an ample passage made. Laogonus and Dardanus expire, the valiant sons of an unhappy sire. Both in one instant from the chariot hurled, sunk in one instant to the nether world. This difference only their sad fates afford, that one the spear destroyed, and one the sword. Nor less unpitied, young Alastor bleeds. In vain his youth, in vain his beauty pleads. In vain he begs thee, with a suppliant's moan, To spare a form, an age so like thy own. Unhappy boy, no prayer, no moving art, E'er bent that fierce inexorable heart. While yet he trembled at his knees and cried, The ruthless falchion oaked his tender side. The panting liver pours a flood of gore that drowns his bosom till he pants no more. Through Mulius' head then drove the impetuous spear. The warrior falls, transfixed from ear to ear. Thy life, Ikeklus, next the sword bereaves. Deep through the front the ponderous falchion cleaves. Warmed in the brain the smoking weapon lies. The purple death comes floating o'er his eyes. Then brave Bucalion died. The dart was flung where the knit nerves the pliant elbow strung. He dropped his arm, an unassisting weight, and stood all impotent, expecting fate. Full on his neck the falling falchion sped, from his broad shoulders hewed his crested head. Forth from the bone the spinal marrow flies, and, sunk in dust, the corpse extended lies. Regmus, whose race from fruitful Thracia came, the son of Pyrrhus, an illustrious name, Succeeds to fate, the spear his belly rends, Prone from his car the thundering chief descends. The squire, who saw expiring on the ground His prostrate master, reined the steeds around, His back scarce turned the Pelian javelin gored, And stretched the servant o'er his dying lord. As when a flame the winding valley fills, And runs on crackling shrubs between the hills, Then o'er the stubble up the mountain flies, fires the high woods and blazes to the skies, this way and that the spreading torrent roars. 
So sweeps the hero through the wasted shores. Around him wide, immense destruction pours, And earth is deluged with the sanguine showers As with autumnal harvests covered o'er, And thick bestrewn lies Ceres' sacred floor. When round and round, with never wearied pain, The trampling steers beat out the unnumbered grain. So the fierce coursers, as the chariot rolls, Tread down whole ranks, and crush out heroes' souls, Dashed from their hoofs while o'er the dead they fly, Black, bloody drops the smoking chariot dye. The spiky wheels through heaps of carnage tore, And thick the groaning axles dropped with gore. High o'er the scene of death Achilles stood, All grim with dust, all horrible in blood, Yet still insatiate, still with rage on flame. Such is the lust of never-dying fame. The, the battle, battle in the, the river scamander. The Trojans fly before Achilles, some towards the town, others to the river scamander. He falls upon the latter with great slaughter, takes twelve captives alive to sacrifice to the shade of Patroclus, and kills Lycaon and Astropius. Scamander attacks him with all his waves. Neptune and Pallas assist the hero. Samoas joins Scamander. At length Vulcan, by the instigation of Juno, almost dries up the river. This combat ended, the other gods engage each other. Meanwhile Achilles continues the slaughter, drives the rest into Troy. Agenor only makes a stand and is conveyed away in a cloud by Apollo, who, to delude Achilles, takes upon him Agenor's shape, and while he pursues him in that disguise, gives the Trojans an opportunity of retiring into their city. The same day continues. The scene is on the banks and in the stream of Scamander. And now to Xanthus' gliding stream they drove, Xanthus, immortal progeny of Jove. The river here divides the flying train, Part to the town fly diverse o'er the plain, Where late their troops triumphant bore the fight, Now chased and trembling in ignoble flight. These with a gathered mist Saturnia shrouds, And rolls behind the rout a heap of clouds. Part plunge into the stream. Old Xanthus roars, the flashing billows beat the whitened shores. With cries promiscuous all the banks resound, And here and there, in eddies whirling round, The flouncing steeds and shrieking warriors drowned. As the scorched locusts from their fields retire, While fast behind them runs the blaze of fire, Driven from the land before the smoky cloud, The clustering legions rush into the flood. So, plunged in Xanthus by Achilles' force, Roars the resounding surge with men and horse. His bloody lance the hero casts aside, Which spreading tamarisks on the margin hide. Then, like a god, the rapid billows braves, Armed with his sword, high brandished o'er the waves. Now down he plunges, now he whirls it round, Deep groaned the waters with the dying sound. Repeated wounds the reddening river dyed, And the warm purple circled on the tide. Swift through the foamy flood the Trojans fly, And close in rocks or winding caverns lie. So the huge dolphin, tempesting the main, In shoals before him fly the scaly train, Confusedly heaped, they seek their inmost caves, Or pant and heave beneath the floating waves. Now, tired with slaughter, from the Trojan band Twelve chosen youths he drags alive to land. With their rich belts their captive arms restrains, Late their proud ornaments, but now their chains. These his attendants to the ships conveyed, Sad victims destined to Patroclus' shade. Then, as once more he plunged amid the flood, the young Lycaon on his passage stood, the son of Priam, whom the hero's hand but late made captive in his father's land, as from a sycamore his sounding steel lopped the green arms to spoke a chariot wheel. To Lemnus' isle he sold the royal slave, where Jason's son the price demanded gave. But kind Etion, touching on the shore, the ransomed prince to fair Arisbe bore. Ten days were past since in his father's reign he felt the sweets of liberty again. The next, that God whom men in vain withstand, Gives the same youth to the same conquering hand, Now never to return, and doomed to go A sadder journey to the shades below. His well-known face when great Achilles eyed, The helm and visor he had cast aside with wild affright, And dropped upon the field his useless lance and unavailing shield. 
as trembling, panting, from the stream he fled, and knocked his faltering knees, the hero said, Ye mighty gods, what wonders strike my view? Is it in vain our conquering arms subdue? Sure I shall see yon heaps of Trojans killed rise from the shades, and brave me on the field. As now the captive, whom so late I bound and sold to Lemnos, stalks on Trojan ground. Not him the sea's unmeasured deeps detain, that bar such numbers from their native plain. Lo, he returns. Try then, my flying spear, try if the grave can hold the wanderer. If earth, at length, this active prince can seize, earth whose strong grasp has held down Hercules. Thus while he spoke, the Trojan pale with fears approached, and sought his knees with suppliant tears, loath as he was to yield his youthful breath, and his soul shivering at the approach of death. Achilles raised the spear, prepared to wound. He kissed his feet, extended on the ground, and while, above, the spear suspended stood, longing to dip its thirsty point in blood, one hand embraced them close, one stopped the dart, while thus these melting words attempt his heart. Thy well-known captive, great Achilles, see, once more Lycaon trembles at thy knee. Some pity to a suppliant's name afford, who shared the gifts of Ceres at thy board, whom late thy conquering arm to Lemnos bore, far from his father, friends, and native shore. A hundred oxen were his price that day, now sums immense thy mercy shall repay. Scarce respited from woes I yet appear, and scarce twelve morning suns have seen me here. Lo, Jove again submits me to thy hands, again her victim cruel fate demands. I sprang from Priam, and Laothoe fair, old Alta's daughter, and Lelegesia's heir, who held in Pedius his famed abode, and ruled the fields where silver Satnius flowed. Two sons, alas, unhappy sons, she bore, for ah, one spear shall drink each brother's gore, and I succeed to slaughtered Polydore. How from that arm of terror shall I fly? Some demon urges, tis my doom to die. If ever yet soft pity touched thy mind, ah, think not me too much of Hector's kind. Not the same mother gave thy suppliant breath with his, who wrought thy loved Patroclus' death. These words, attended with a shower of tears, the youth addressed to unrelenting ears. Talk not of life, or ransom, he replies. Patroclus dead, whoever meets me dies. In vain a single Trojan sues for grace, but least the sons of Priam's hateful race. Die then, my friend, what boots it to deplore? The great, the good Patroclus is no more. He, far thy better, was foredoomed to die, and thou, dost thou bewail mortality? Seest thou not me, whom nature's gifts adorn? sprung from a hero, from a goddess born? The day shall come, which nothing can avert, when by the spear, the arrow, or the dart, by night or day, by force or by design, impending death and certain fate are mine. Die then, he said, and as the word he spoke, the fainting stripling sank before the stroke. His hand forgot its grasp, and left the spear, while all his trembling frame confessed his fear. Sudden, Achilles his broad sword displayed, and buried in his neck the reeking blade. Prone fell the youth, and panting on the land, the gushing purple dyed the thirsty sand. The victor to the stream the carcass gave, and thus insults him, floating on the wave. Lie there, Lycaon, let the fish surround thy bloated corpse, and suck thy gory wound. There no sad mother shall thy funerals weep, but swift commander roll thee to the deep, whose every wave some watery monster brings, to feast unpunished on the fat of kings. So perish Troy and all the Trojan line, such ruin theirs and such compassion mine. What boots ye now Scamander's worshipped stream, his earthly honours and immortal name? In vain your immolated bulls are slain, your living coursers glut his gulfs in vain. Thus he rewards you with this bitter fate, thus, till the Grecian vengeance is complete. Thus is atoned Patroclus' honoured shade, and the short absence of Achilles paid. These boastful words provoked the raging god. With fury swells the violated flood. What means divine may yet the power employ to check Achilles, and to rescue Troy? Meanwhile the hero springs in arms, to dare the great Asteropeus to mortal war.
the son of Pelagon, whose lofty line flows from the source of Axius, stream divine. Fair Perabeus love the god had crowned, with all his refluent waters circled around. On him Achilles rushed, he fearless stood, and shook two spears, advancing from the flood. The flood impelled him, on Pelides' head, to avenge his waters choked with heaps of dead. Near as they drew, Achilles thus began. What art thou, boldest of the race of man? Who, or from whence? Unhappy is the sire whose son encounters our resistless ire. O son of Peleus, what avails to trace, replied the warrior, our illustrious race? From rich Peonius' valleys I command, armed with protended spears my native band. Now shines the tenth bright morning since I came in aid of Ilion to the fields of fame. Axius, who swells with all the neighboring rills, and wide around the floated region fills, begot my sire, whose spear much glory won. Now lift thy arm, and try that hero's son. Threatening, he said, the hostile chiefs advance. At once Asteropeus discharged each lance, for both his dexterous hands the lance could wield. One struck, but pierced not, the Vulcanian shield. One raised Achilles' hand, the spouting blood spun forth, in earth the fastened weapon stood. Like lightning next the Pelian javelin flies, its erring fury hissed along the skies. Deep in the swelling bank was driven the spear, even to the middle earth, and quivered there. Then from his side the sword Pelides drew, and on his foe with double fury flew. The foe thrice tugged, and shook the rooted wood, repulsive of his might the weapon stood. The fourth, he tries to break the spear in vain. Bent as he stands, he tumbles to the plain. His belly opened with a ghastly wound, the reeking entrails pour upon the ground. Beneath the hero's feet he panting lies, and his eye darkens, and his spirit flies. While the proud victor thus triumphing said, his radiant armor tearing from the dead, so ends thy glory, such the fate they prove who strive presumptuous with the sons of Jove. Sprung from a river, didst thou boast thy line? But great Saturnius is the source of mine. How durst thou vaunt thy watery progeny? Of Peleus, Aeacus, and Jove am I, the race of these superior far to those, as he that thunders to the stream that flows. What rivers can Scamander might have shown? but Jove he dreads, nor wars against his son. Even Achilosus might contend in vain, and all the roaring billows of the main, the eternal ocean, from whose fountains flow the seas, the rivers, and the springs below, the thundering voice of Jove abhors to hear, and in his deep abysses shakes with fear. He said, then from the bank his javelin tore, and left the breathless warrior in his gore. The floating tides the bloody carcass lave, and beat against it, wave succeeding wave, till, rolled between the banks, it lies the food of curling eels and fishes of the flood. All scattered round the stream, their mightiest slain, the amazed Peonian scour along the plain. He vents his fury on the flying crew, Thracius, Astipolis, and Menetius slew, Mydon, Thersilicus, with Aeneas fell and numbers more his lance had plunged to hell, but from the bottom of his gulfs profound, Scamander spoke, the shores returned the sound. O first of mortals, for the gods are thine, in valor matchless and in force divine, if Jove have given thee every Trojan head, tis not on me thy rage should heap the dead. See, my choked streams no more their course can keep, nor roll their wonted tribute to the deep. Turn then, impetuous, from our injured flood, Content thy slaughters could amaze a god. In human form, confessed before his eyes, The river thus, and thus the chief replies, O sacred stream, thy word we shall obey, But not till Troy the destined vengeance pay, Not till within her towers the perjured train shall pant, And tremble at our arms again, Not till proud Hector, guardian of her wall, Or stain this lance, or see Achilles fall. He said, and drove with fury on the foe. Then to the godhead of the silver bow the yellow flood began. O son of Jove, was not the mandate of the sire above, full and express, that Phoebus should employ his sacred arrows in defense of Troy, and make her conquer, till Hyperion's fall in awful darkness hide the face of all? He spoke in vain, 
the chief without dismay ploughs through the boiling surge his desperate way. Then rising in his rage above the shores, from all his deep the bellowing river roars, huge heaps of slain disgorges on the coast, and round the banks the ghastly dead are tossed. While all before, the billows ranged on high, a watery bulwark, screen the bands who fly. Now bursting on his head with thundering sound, the falling deluge whelms the hero round. His loaded shield bends to the rushing tide, his feet, upborne, scarce the strong flood divide, slittering and staggering. On the border stood a spreading elm that overhung the flood. He seized a bending bough, his steps to stay. The plant uprooted to his weight gave way, heaving the bank and undermining all. Loud flashed the waters to the rushing fall of the thick foliage. The large trunk displayed bridged the rough flood across. The hero stayed on this his weight, and raised upon his hand, leaped from the channel, and regained the land. Then blackened the wild waves, the murmur rose, the god pursues, a huger billow throws, and bursts the bank, ambitious to destroy the man whose fury is the fate of Troy. He, like the warlike eagle, speeds his pace, swiftest and strongest of the aerial race. Far as a spear can fly, Achilles springs, at every bound his clanging armor rings. Now here, now there, he turns on every side, and winds his course before the following tide. The waves flow after, wheresoe'er he wheels, and gather fast, and murmur at his heels. So when a peasant to his garden brings soft rills of water from the bubbling springs, and calls the floods from high to bless his bowers, and feed with pregnant streams the plants and flowers, Soon as he clears what air their passage stayed, and marks the future current with his spade, swift o'er the rolling pebbles, down the hills, louder and louder purl the falling rills. Before him scattering they prevent his pains, and shine in mazy wanderings o'er the plains. Still flies Achilles, but before his eyes still swift Scamander rolls where e'er he flies. Not all his speed escapes the rapid floods, the first of men, but not a match for gods. Oft as he turned the torrent to oppose, And bravely try if all the powers were foes, So oft the surge, in watery mountains spread, Beats on his back, or bursts upon his head. Yet dauntless still the adverse flood he braves, And still indignant bounds above the waves. Tired by the tides, his knees relax with toil, Washed from beneath him slides the slimy soil. When thus, his eyes on heaven's expansion thrown, Forth bursts the hero with an angry groan. Is there no god Achilles to befriend, No power to avert his miserable end? Prevent, O Jove, this ignominious date, And make my future life the sport of fate. Of all heaven's oracles believed in vain, But most of Thetis must her son complain. By Phoebus' darts she prophesied my fall, In glorious arms before the Trojan wall. Oh, had I died in fields of battle warm, Stretched like a hero by a hero's arm. Might Hector's spear this dauntless bosom rend, And my swift soul o'ertake my slaughtered friend. Ah, no, Achilles meets a shameful fate. Oh, how unworthy of the brave and great! Like some vile swain, whom on a rainy day, Crossing a ford, the torrent sweeps away, An unregarded carcass to the sea. Neptune and Pallas haste to his relief, And thus in human form addressed the chief. The power of ocean first. Forbear thy fear, O son of Peleus, lo, thy gods appear. Behold, from Jove descending to thy aid, propitious Neptune and the blue eyed maid. Stay, and the furious flood shall cease to rave. Tis not thy fate to glut his angry wave. But thou, the counsel heaven suggests, attend, nor breathe from combat, nor thy sword suspend, till Troy receive her flying sons, till all her routed squadrons pant behind their wall. Hector alone shall stand his fatal chance, and Hector's blood shall smoke upon thy lance. Thine is the glory doomed. Thus spake the gods, then swift ascended to the bright abodes. Stung with new ardor, thus by heaven impelled, he springs impetuous, and invades the field. O'er all the expanded plain the water spread, heaved on the bounding billows danced the dead, floating mid scattered arms, while casks of gold and turned-up bucklers glittered as they rolled. High o'er the surging tide, by leaps and bounds, he wades and mounts. The parted wave resounds. 
Not a whole river stops the hero's course, while Pallas fills him with immortal force. With equal rage, indignant Xanthus roars, and lifts his billows, and o'erwhelms his shores. Then thus to Samoas, Haste, my brother Flood, and check this mortal that controls a god. Our bravest heroes else shall quit the fight, and Ilion tumble from her towery height. Call then thy subject streams, and bid them roar, from all thy fountains swell thy watery store. With broken rocks, and with a load of dead, charge the black surge, and pour it on his head. Mark how resistless through the floods he goes, and boldly bids the warring gods be foes. But nor that force, nor form divine to sight, shall aught avail him, if our rage unite. Whelmed under our dark gulfs those arms shall lie, that blaze so dreadful in each Trojan eye, and deep beneath a sandy mountain hurled, immersed remain this terror of the world. Such ponderous ruin shall confound the place, no Greek shall e'er his perished relics grace, no hand his bones shall gather or inhume, these his cold rites, and this his watery tomb. He said, and on the chief descends a main, increased with gore and swelling with the slain. Then, murmuring from his beds, he boils, he raves, and a foam whitens on the purple waves. At every step, before Achilles stood the crimson surge, and deluged him with blood. Fear touched the queen of heaven. She saw dismayed. She called aloud and summoned Vulcan's aid. Rise to the war! The insulting flood requires thy wasteful arm. Assemble all thy fires, while to their aid by our command enjoined rush the swift eastern and the western wind. These from old ocean at my word shall blow, pour the red torrent on the watery foe, courses and arms to one bright ruin turn, and hissing rivers to their bottom spurn. Go, mighty in thy rage, display thy power, drink the whole flood, the crackling trees devour. Scorch all the banks, and, till our voice reclaim, Exert the unwearied furies of the flame. The power ignopotent her word obeys. Wide o'er the plain he pours the boundless blaze, At once consumes the dead, and dries the soil, And the shrunk waters in their channel boil. As when autumnal Boraa sweeps the sky, And instant blows the watered gardens dry, So looked the field. So whitened was the ground, while Vulcan breathed the fiery blast around. Swift on the sedgy reeds the ruin preys, along the margin winds the running blaze. The trees in flaming rose to ashes turn, the flowering lotus and the tamarisk burn. Broad elm and cypress rising in a spire, the watery willows hiss before the fire. Now glow the waves, the fishes pant for breath, the eels lie twisting in the pangs of death. Now flounce aloft, now dive the scaly fry, or, gasping, turn their bellies to the sky. At length the river reared his languid head, and thus, short panting, to the god he said, O Vulcan, O what power resists thy might? I faint, I sink unequal to the fight. I yield, let Ilion fall. If fate decree, ah, bend no more thy fiery arms on me. He ceased. Wide conflagration blazing round, the bubbling waters yield a hissing sound. As when the flames beneath the cauldron rise, to melt the fat of some rich sacrifice, amid the fierce embrace of circling fires, the waters foam, the heavy smoke aspires. So boils the imprisoned flood, forbid to flow, and choked with vapors feels his bottom glow. To Juno then, imperial queen of air, the burning river sends his earnest prayer. Ah, why, Saturnia, must thy son engage me, only me, with all his wasteful rage? On other gods his dreadful arm employ, for mightier gods assert the cause of Troy. Submissive I desist, if thou command, but ah, withdraw this all-destroying hand. Hear then my solemn oath, to yield to fate unaided Ilion and her destined state, till Greece shall gird her with destructive flame, and in one ruin sink the Trojan name. His warm entreaty touched Saturnia's ear. She bade the ignipotent his rage forbear, recall the flame, nor in a mortal cause infest a god. The obedient flame withdraws. Again the branching streams begin to spread, and soft remurmur in their wonted bed. While these by Juno's will the strife resign, the warring gods in fierce contention join. Rekindling rage each heavenly breast alarms, 
with horrid clangor shock the ethereal arms heaven in loud thunder bids the trumpet sound and wide beneath them groans the rending ground jove as his sport the dreadful scene descries and views contending gods with careless eyes the power of battles lifts his brazen spear and first assaults the radiant queen of war what moved thy madness thus to disunite ethereal minds and mix all heaven in fight what wonder this when in thy frantic mood thou drovest a mortal to insult a god thy impious hand to dides javelin bore and madly bathed it in celestial gore he spoke and smote the long resounding shield which bears jove's thunder on its dreadful field the adamantine aegis of her sire that turns the glancing bolt and forked fire then heaved the goddess in her mighty hand a stone the limit of the neighboring land there fixed from eldest times black craggy vast this at the heavenly homicide she cast thundering he falls a mass of monstrous size and seven broad acres covers as he lies the stunning stroke his stubborn nerves unbound loud o'er the fields his ringing arms resound the scornful dame her conquest views with smiles and glorying thus the prostrate god reviles hast thou not yet insatiate fury known how far minerva's force transcends thy own juno whom thou rebellious darest withstand corrects thy folly thus by pallas hand thus meets thy broken faith with just disgrace and partial aid to troy's perfidious race the goddess spoke and turned her eyes away that beaming round diffused celestial day jove cyprian daughter stooping on the land lent to the wounded god her tender hand slowly he rises scarcely breathes with pain and propped on her fair arm forsakes the plain this the bright empress of the heavens surveyed and scoffing thus to war's victorious maid lo what an aid on mars's side is seen the smiles and love's unconquerable queen mark with what insolence in open view she moves let pallas if she dares pursue minerva smiling heard the pair o'ertook and slightly on her breast the wanton struck she unresisting fell her spirits fled on earth together lay the lovers spread and like these heroes be the fate of all minerva cries who guard the trojan wall to grecian gods such let the phrygian be so dread so fierce as venus is to me then from the lowest stone shall troy be moved thus she and juno with a smile approved meantime to mix in more than mortal fight the god of ocean dares the god of light what sloth has seized us when the fields around ring with conflicting powers and heaven returns the sound shall ignominious we with shame retire no deed performed to our olympian sire come prove thy arm for first the war to wage suits not my greatness or superior age rash as thou art to prop the trojan throne forgetful of my wrongs and of thy own and guard the race of proud laomedon hast thou forgot how at the monarch's prayer we shared the lengthened labors of a year troy walls i raised for such were jove's commands and yon proud bulwarks grew beneath my hands thy task it was to feed the bellowing droves along fair ida's vales and pendant groves but when the circling seasons in their train brought back the grateful day that crowned our pain with menace stern the fraudful king defied our latent godhead and the prize denied mad as he was he threatened servile bands and doomed us exiles far in barbarous lands incensed we heavenward fled with swiftest wing and destined vengeance on the perjured king dost thou for this afford proud aelian grace and not like us infest the faithless race like us their present future sons destroy and from its deep foundations heave their troy apollo thus to combat for mankind ill suits the wisdom of celestial mind for what is man calamitous by birth they owe their life and nourishment to earth like yearly leaves that now with beauty crowned smile on the sun now wither on the ground to their own hands commit the frantic scene nor mix immortals in a cause so mean then turns his face far beaming heavenly fires and from the senior power submiss retires him thus retreating artemis upbraids the quivered huntress of the sylvan shades 
And is it thus the youthful Phoebus flies, And yields to ocean's hoary sire the prize? How vain that martial pomp, And dreadful show of pointed arrows and the silver bow! Now boast no more in yon celestial bower, Thy force can match the great earth-shaking power. Silent he heard the queen of woods upbraid, Not so Saturnia bore the vaunting maid, But furious thus, what insolence has driven thy pride to face the majesty of heaven? What, though by Jove the female plague designed, fierce to the feeble race of womankind, the wretched matron feels thy piercing dart, thy sex's tyrant with the tiger's heart? What, though tremendous in the woodland chase, thy certain arrows pierce the savage race? How dares thy rashness on the powers divine employ those arms, or match thy force with mine? Learn hence, no more unequal war to wage she said, and seized her wrists with eager rage. These in her left hand locked, her right untied the bow, the quiver, and its plumy pride. About her temples flies the busy bow. Now here, now there, she wins her from the blow. The scattering arrows, rattling from the case, drop round and idly mark the dusty place. Swift from the field the baffled huntress flies, and scarce restrains the torrent in her eyes. So, when the falcon wings her way above, To the cleft cavern speeds the gentle dove, Not fated yet to die. There safe retreats, yet still her heart Against the marble beats. To her Latona hastes with tender care, Whom Hermes viewing, thus declines the war. How shall I face the dame who gives delight To him whose thunders blacken heaven with night? Go, matchless goddess, triumph in the skies, and boast my conquest, while I yield the prize. He spoke, and passed. Latona, stooping low, collects the scattered shafts and fallen bow, that, glittering on the dust, lay here and there dishonored relics of Diana's war. Then swift pursued her to her blessed abode, where, all confused, she sought the sovereign god. Weeping, she grasped his knees. The ambrosial vest shook with her sighs, and panted on her breast. The sire superior smiled, and bade her show what heavenly hand had caused his daughter's woe. Abashed, she names his own imperial spouse, and the pale crescent fades upon her brows. Thus they above, while, swiftly gliding down, Apollo enters Ilion's sacred town. The guardian god now trembled for her wall, and feared the Greeks, though fate forbade her fall. Back to Olympus, from the war's alarms, Return the shining bands of gods in arms, Some proud in triumph, some with rage on fire, And take their thrones around the ethereal sire. Through blood, through death, Achilles still proceeds, O'er slaughtered heroes and o'er rolling steeds, As when avenging flames with fury driven, On guilty towns exert the wrath of heaven, The pale inhabitants, some fall, some fly, And the red vapors purple all the sky. So raged Achilles, death and dire dismay, and toils and terrors filled the dreadful day. High on a turret hoary Priam stands, and marks the waste of his destructive hands, views from his arm the Trojan's scattered flight, and the near hero rising on his sight. No stop, no check, no aid. With feeble pace and settled sorrow on his aged face, fast as he could, he sighing quits the walls, and thus descending on the guards he calls. You to whose care our city gates belong, set wide your portals to the flying throng, for though he comes with unresisted sway, he comes and desolation marks his way. But when within the walls our troops take breath, lock fast the brazen bars and shut out death. Thus charged the reverend monarch, wide were flung the opening folds, the sounding hinges rung. Phoebus rushed forth, the flying bands to meet, struck slaughter back, and covered the retreat. On heaps the Trojans crowd to gain the gate, and gladsome see their last escape from fate. Thither, all parched with thirst, a heartless train, hoary with dust, they beat the hollow plain, and gasping, panting, fainting, labor on with heavier strides that lengthen toward the town. Enraged Achilles follows with his spear, wild with revenge, insatiable of war. Then had the Greeks eternal praise acquired, and Troy inglorious to her walls retired, but he, the god who darts ethereal flame, shot down to save her and redeem her fame. To young Agenor force divine he gave, and Tenor's offspring, haughty, bold, and brave. 
In aid of him, beside the beach he sate, And wrapped in clouds, restrained the hand of fate. When now the generous youth Achilles spies, Thick beats his heart, the troubled motions rise. So, ere a storm, the waters heave and roll. He stops, and questions thus his mighty soul. What, shall I fly this terror of the plain, Like others fly, and be like others slain? Vain hope, to shun him by the selfsame road Yon line of slaughtered Trojans lately trod. No, with the common heap I scorn to fall. What if they passed me to the Trojan wall, While I decline to yonder path, That leads to Ida's forests and surrounding shades? So may I reach, concealed, the cooling flood, From my tired body wash the dirt and blood, As soon as night her dusky veil extends, Return in safety to my Trojan friends. What if? But wherefore all this vain debate? Stand I to doubt, within the reach of fate? Even now, perhaps, ere yet I turn the wall, The fierce Achilles sees me, and I fall. Such is his swiftness, tis in vain to fly, And such is valour, that who stands must die. Howe'er tis better, fighting for the state, Here and in public view to meet my fate. Yet sure he too is mortal. He may feel, like all the sons of earth, The force of steel. One only soul informs that dreadful frame, And Jove's sole favour gives him all his fame. He said and stood, collected in his might, And all his beating bosom claimed the fight. So from some deep-grown wood a panther starts, Roused from his thicket by a storm of darts. Untaught to fear or fly, he hears the sounds of shouting hunters and of clamorous hounds. Though struck, though wounded, scarce perceives the pain, and the barbed javelin stings his breast in vain. On their whole war, untamed, the savage flies, and tears his hunter, or beneath him dies. Not less resolved, Antenor's valiant heir confronts Achilles, and awaits the war, disdainful of retreat, high held before his shield. A broad circumference he bore. Then graceful as he stood, In act to throw the lifted javelin, Thus bespoke the foe. How proud Achilles glories in his fame, And hopes this day to sink the Trojan name Beneath her ruins. No, that hope is vain. A thousand woes, a thousand toils remain. Parents and children our just arms employ, And strong and many are the sons of Troy. Great as thou art, even thou may stain with gore these Phrygian fields, and press a foreign shore. He said, with matchless force the javelin flung, smote on his knee, the hollow quishes rung beneath the pointed steel, but safe from harms he stands impassive in the ethereal arms. Then fiercely rushing on the daring foe, his lifted arm prepares the fatal blow. But, jealous of his fame, Apollo shrouds the godlike Trojan in a veil of clouds. Safe from pursuit, and shut from mortal view, Dismissed with fame, the favoured youth withdrew. Meanwhile the god, to cover their escape, Assumes a genor's habit, voice, and shape, Flies from the furious chief in this disguise, The furious chief still follows where he flies. Now o'er the fields they stretch with lengthened strides, Now urge the course where swift Scamander glides. The god, now distant scarce a stride before, Tempts his pursuit, and wheels about the shore, While all the flying troops their speed employ, And pour on heaps into the walls of Troy. No stop, no stay, no thought to ask or tell, Who scaped by flight, or who by battle fell. T'was tumult all, and violence of flight, And sudden joy confused, and mixed affright. Pale Troy against Achilles shuts her gate, and nations breathe, delivered from their fate. The, the death, death of, of Hector. Hector. The Trojans being safe within the walls, Hector only stays to oppose Achilles. Priam is struck at his approach and tries to persuade his son to re-enter the town. Hecuba joins her entreaties, but in vain. Hector consults within himself what measures to take, but at the advance of Achilles, his resolution fails him and he flies. Achilles pursues him thrice round the walls of Troy. The gods debate concerning the fate of Hector. At length Minerva descends to the aid of Achilles. She deludes Hector in the shape of Deiphobus. He stands the combat and is slain. Achilles drags the dead body at his chariot in the sight of Priam and Hecuba. Their lamentations, tears, and despair their cries reach the ears of Andromache, who, ignorant of this, was retired into the inner part of the palace. She mounts up to the walls, and beholds her dead husband. 
She swoons at the spectacle, her excess of grief and lamentation. The thirtieth day still continues. The scene lies under the walls and on the battlements of Troy. Thus to their bulwarks, smit with panic fear, the herded Ilians rush like driven deer. There safe they wipe the briny drops away, and drown in bowls the labors of the day. Close to the walls, advancing o'er the fields beneath one roof of well-compacted shields, march, bending on, the Greeks' embodied powers, far stretching in the shade of Trojan towers. Great Hector singly stayed, chained down by fate there fixed he stood before the Scaean gate. Still his bold arms determined to employ the guardian still of long-defended Troy. Apollo now to tired Achilles turns, the power confessed in all his glory burns. And what, he cries, has Peleus' son in view, with mortal speed a godhead to pursue? For not to thee to know the gods is given, unskilled to trace the latent marks of heaven. What boots thee now that Troy forsook the plain? Vain thy past labor and thy present vain. Safe in their walls are now her troops bestowed, while here thy frantic rage attacks a god. The chief incensed, too partial god of day, to check my conquests in the middle way. How few in Ilion else had refuge found, what gasping numbers now had bit the ground. Thou robst me of a glory justly mine, powerful of godhead and of fraud divine. Mean fame, alas, for one of heavenly strain, to cheat a mortal who repines in vain. Then to the city, terrible and strong, with high and haughty steps he towered along. So the proud courser, victor of the prize, to the near goal with double ardor flies. Him, as he blazing shot across the field, the careful eyes of Priam first beheld. Not half so dreadful rises to the sight, through the thick gloom of some tempestuous night, Orion's dog, the year when autumn weighs, and o'er the feebler stars exerts his rays. Terrific glory, for his burning breath taints the red air with fevers, plagues, and death. So flamed his fiery mail. Then wept the sage. He strikes his reverent head, now white with age. He lifts his withered arms, obtests the skies. He calls his much-loved son with feeble cries. The son, resolved Achilles force to dare, full at the scan gates expects the war, while the sad father on the rampart stands and thus adjures him with extended hands. Ah, stay not, stay not, guardless and alone. Hector, my loved, my dearest, bravest son, methinks already I behold thee slain and stretched beneath that fury of the plain. Implacable Achilles, mightst thou be to all the gods no dearer than to me. Thee, vultures wild should scatter round the shore, and bloody dogs grow fiercer from thy gore. How many valiant sons I late enjoyed, valiant in vain, by thy cursed arm destroyed, or, worse than slaughtered, sold in distant isles to shameful bondage and unworthy toils. Too, while I speak, my eyes in vain explore. Two from one mother sprung, my Polydor, and loved Lycaon, now perhaps no more. Oh, if in yonder hostile camp they live, what heaps of gold, what treasures would I give? Their grandsire's wealth, by right of birth their own, consigned his daughter with Lelegius throne. But if, which heaven forbid, already lost, all pale they wander on the Stygian coast, what sorrows then must their sad mother know? What anguish I, unutterable woe! Yet less that anguish, less to her, to me, less to all Troy, if not deprived of thee. Yet, shun Achilles, enter yet the wall, and spare thyself, thy father, spare us all. Save thy dear life, or, if a soul so brave neglect that thought, thy dearer glory save. Pity, while yet I live, these silver hairs, while yet thy father feels the woes he bears, yet cursed with sense, a wretch whom in his rage, all trembling on the verge of helpless age, great Jove has placed, sad spectacle of pain, the bitter dregs of fortune's cup to drain, to fill with scenes of death his closing eyes, and number all his days by miseries, my heroes slain, my bridal bed o'erturned, my daughters ravished and my city burned, my bleeding infants dashed against the floor. These I have yet to see, perhaps yet more. 
perhaps even I, reserved by angry fate, the last sad relic of my ruined state, dire pomp of sovereign wretchedness, must fall, and stain the pavement of my regal hall, where famished dogs, late guardians of my door, shall lick their mangled master's spattered gore. Yet for my sons I thank ye, gods, tis well, well have they perished, for in fight they fell. Who dies in youth and vigor dies the best, struck through with wounds, all honest on the breast. But when the fates, in fullness of their rage, spurn the hoar head of unresisting age, in dust the reverend lineaments deform, and pour to dogs the lifeblood scarcely warm, this, this is misery, the last, the worst that man can feel, man fated to be cursed. He said, and acting what no words could say, rent from his head the silver locks away. With him the mournful mother bears a part, yet all her sorrows turn not Hector's heart. The zone unbraced, her bosom she displayed, and thus, fast falling the salt tears, she said, Have mercy on me, O my son, revere the words of age, attend a parent's prayer. If ever thee in these fond arms I pressed, or stilled thy infant clamors at this breast, ah, do not thus our helpless years forego, but by our walls secured, repel the foe. Against his rage, if singly thou proceed, shouldst thou, but heaven avert it, shouldst thou bleed, nor must thy course lie honored on the bier, nor spouse nor mother grace thee with a tear. Far from our pious rites those dear remains must feast the vultures on the naked plains. So they, while down their cheeks the torrents roll, but fixed remains the purpose of his soul. Resolved he stands, and with a fiery glance expects the hero's terrible advance. So, rolled up in his den, the swelling snake beholds the traveller approach the break, when fed with noxious herbs his turgid veins have gathered half the poisons of the plains. He burns, he stiffens with collected ire, and his red eyeballs glare with living fire. Beneath a turret, on his shield reclined, he stood, and questioned thus his mighty mind. Where lies my way, to enter in the wall? Honor and shame the ungenerous thought recall. Shall proud Polydamus before the gate proclaim, His counsels are obeyed too late, which timely followed, but the former night, what numbers had been saved by Hector's flight? That wise advice rejected with disdain, I feel my folly in my people slain. Methinks my suffering country's voice I hear, but most her worthless sons insult my ear. On my rash courage charge the chance of war, and blame those virtues which they cannot share. No, if I e'er return, return I must glorious, my country's terror laid in dust. Or if I perish, let her see me fall in field at least, and fighting for her wall. And yet suppose these measures I forego, approach unarmed, and parley with the foe, the warrior shield, the helm, and lance lay down, and treat on terms of peace to save the town, the wife withheld, the treasure ill-detained, cause of the war and grievance of the land, with honorable justice to restore, and add half Ilion's yet remaining store, which Troy shall, sworn, produce that injured Greece may share our wealth and leave our walls in peace. But why this thought? Unarmed if I should go, what hope of mercy from this vengeful foe? But woman like to fall, and fall without a blow. We greet not here, as man conversing man, met at an oak or journeying o'er a plain. No season now for calm familiar talk, like youths and maidens in an evening walk. War is our business, but to whom is given to die, or triumph, that determine heaven. Thus pondering, like a god the Greek drew nigh, his dreadful plumage nodded from on high. The Pelian javelin, in his better hand, shot trembling rays that glittered o'er the land, and on his breast the beamy splendor shone, like Jove's own lightning, or the rising sun. As Hector sees, unusual terrors rise, struck by some god, he fears, recedes, and flies. He leaves the gates, he leaves the wall behind. Achilles follows like the winged wind. Thus at the panting dove a falcon flies, the swiftest racer of the liquid skies. Just when he holds, or thinks he holds his prey, 
obliquely wheeling through the aerial way with open beak and shrilling cries he springs and aims his claws and shoots upon his wings no less for right the rapid chase they held one urged by fury one by fear impelled now circling round the walls their course maintain where the high watch-tower overlooks the plain now where the fig-trees spread their umbrage broad a wider compass smoke along the road next by scamander's double source they bound where two famed fountains burst the parted ground this hot through scorching clefts is seen to rise with exhalations steaming to the skies that the green banks in summer's heat o'erflows like crystal clear and cold as winter snows each gushing fount a marble cistern fills whose polished bed receives the falling rills where trojan dames ere yet alarmed by greece washed their fur garments in the days of peace by these they passed one chasing one in flight the mighty fled pursued by stronger might swift was the course no vulgar prize they play no vulgar victim must reward the day such as in races crown the speedy strife the prize contended was great hector's life as when some hero's funerals are decreed in grateful honor of the mighty dead where high rewards the vigorous youth inflame some golden tripod or some lovely dame the panting coursers swiftly turn the goal and with them turns the raised spectator's soul thus three times round the trojan wall they fly the gazing gods lean forward from the sky to whom while eager on the chase they look the sire of mortals and immortal spoke unworthy sight the man beloved of heaven behold inglorious round yon city driven my heart partakes the generous hector's pain hector whose zeal whole hecatombs has slain whose grateful fumes the gods received with joy from ida's summits and the towers of troy now see him flying to his fears resigned and fate and fierce achilles close behind consult ye powers tis worthy your debate whether to snatch him from impending fate or let him bear by stern polites slain good as he is the lot imposed on man then pallas thus shall he whose vengeance forms the forky bolt and blackens heaven with storms shall he prolong one trojan's forfeit breath a man a mortal preordained to death and will no murmurs fill the courts above no gods indignant blame their partial jove go then returned the sire without delay exert thy will i give the fates their way swift at the mandate pleased tritonia flies and stoops impetuous from the cleaving skies as through the forest or the vale and lawn the well-breathed beagle drives the flying fawn in vain he tries the covert of the brakes or deep beneath the trembling thicket shakes sure of the vapor in the tainted dews the certain hound his various maze pursues thus step by step where e'er the trojan wheeled there swift achilles compassed round the field oft as to reach the darden gates he bends and hopes the assistance of his pitying friends whose showering arrows as he coursed below from the high turrets might oppress the foe so oft achilles turns him to the plain he eyes the city but he eyes in vain as men in slumber seem with speedy pace one to pursue and one to lead the chase their sinking limbs the fancied course forsake nor this can fly nor that can overtake no less the laboring heroes pant and strain while that but flies and this pursues in vain what god o muse assisted hector's force with fate itself so long to hold the course phoebus it was who in his latest hour endued his knees with strength his nerves with power and great achilles lest some greeks advance should snatch the glory from his lifted lance signed to the troops to yield his foe the way and leave untouched the honors of the day jove lifts the golden balances that show the fates of mortal men and things below here each contending hero's lot he tries and weighs with equal hand their destinies lo sinks the scale surcharged with hector's fate heavy with death it sinks and hell receives the weight then phoebus left him fierce minerva flies to stern pelides and triumphing cries o loved of jove 
This day our labors cease, and conquest blazes with full beams on Greece. Great Hector falls, that Hector famed so far, drunk with renown, insatiable of war, falls by thy hand and mine. Nor force nor flight shall more avail him, nor his god of light. See, where in vain he supplicates above, rolled at the feet of unrelenting Jove. Rest here, myself will lead the Trojan on, and urge to meet the fate he cannot shun. Her voice divine the chief with joyful mind obeyed, and rested, on his lance reclined, while like Deiphobus, the martial dame, her face, her gesture, and her arms the same, in show and aid, by hapless Hector's side approached, and greets him thus with voice belied. Too long, O Hector, have I borne the sight of this distress, and sorrowed in thy flight. It fits us now a noble stand to make, and here, as brothers, equal fates partake. Then he, O prince, allied in blood and fame, dearer than all that own a brother's name, of all that Hecuba to Priam bore, long tried, long loved, much loved, but honored more. Since you, of all our numerous race, alone defend my life, regardless of your own. Again the goddess. Much my father's prayer, and much my mother's, pressed me to forbear. My friends embraced my knees, adjured my stay, but stronger love impelled, and I obey. Come then, the glorious conflict let us try. Let the steel sparkle and the javelin fly, or let us stretch Achilles on the field, or to his arm our bloody trophies yield. Fraudful, she said, then swiftly marched before. The Dardan hero shuns his foe no more. Sternly they met. The silence Hector broke, his dreadful plumage nodded as he spoke. Enough, O son of Peleus! Troy has viewed her walls thrice circled, and her chief pursued. But now some god within me bids me try thine, or my fate. I kill thee, or I die. Yet on the verge of battle let us stay, and for a moment's space suspend the day. Let heaven's high powers be called to arbitrate the just conditions of this stern debate, eternal witnesses of all below, and faithful guardians of the treasured vow. To them I swear, if, victor in the strife, Jove by these hands shall shed thy noble life, no vile dishonor shall thy course pursue. Stripped of its arms alone, the conquerors do, the rest to Greece uninjured I'll restore. Now plight thy mutual oath, I ask no more. Talk not of oaths, the dreadful chief replies, while anger flashed from his disdainful eyes. Detested as thou art and ought to be, nor oath nor pact Achilles plights with thee. Such pacts as lambs and rabid wolves combine, such leagues as men and furious lions join. To such I call the gods, one constant state of lasting rancor and eternal hate. No thought but rage, and never-ceasing strife, till death extinguish rage, and thought, and life. Rouse then thy forces this important hour, collect thy soul, and call forth all thy power. No further subterfuge, no further chance. Tis Pallas, Pallas gives thee to my lance. Each Grecian ghost, by thee deprived of breath, now hovers round and calls thee to thy death. He spoke, and launched his javelin at the foe. But Hector shunned the meditated blow. He stooped, while o'er his head the flying spear sang innocent, and spent its force in air. Minerva watched it falling on the land, then drew, and gave to great Achilles' hand, unseen of Hector, who, elate with joy, now shakes his lance and braves the dread of Troy. The life you boasted to that javelin given, prince, you have missed. My fate depends on heaven. To thee, presumptuous as thou art, unknown, or what must prove my fortune or thy own. Boasting is but an art, our fears to blind, and with false terrors sink another's mind. But no, whatever fate I am to try, by no dishonest wound shall Hector die. I shall not fall a fugitive at least. My soul shall bravely issue from my breast. But first, try thou my arm. And may this dart end all my country's woes, deep buried in thy heart. The weapon flew, its course unerring held, unerring, but the heavenly shield repelled the mortal dart. 
resulting with a bounce from off the ringing orb it struck the ground hector beheld his javelin fall in vain nor other lance nor other hope remain he calls deiphobus demands a spear in vain for no deiphobus was there all comfortless he stands then with a sigh tis so heaven wills it and my hour is nigh I deemed Deiphobus had heard my call, but he secure lies guarded in the wall. A god deceived me, Pallas, t'was thy deed. Death and black fate approach, tis I must bleed. No refuge now, no succor from above. Great Jove deserts me, and the son of Jove, propitious once, and kind. Then welcome fate, tis true I perish, yet I perish great. Yet in a mighty deed I shall expire. Let future ages hear it and admire. Fierce at the word, his weighty sword he drew, And, all collected, on Achilles flew. So Jove's bold bird, high balanced in the air, Stoops from the clouds to truss the quivering hair. Nor less Achilles his fierce soul prepares. Before his breast the flaming shield he bears, Refulgent orb. Above his fourfold cone the gilded horsehair sparkled in the sun, nodding at every step, Vulcanian frame, and as he moved his figure seemed on flame. As radiant Hesper shines with keener light, far beaming o'er the silver host of night, when all the starry train emblaze the sphere, so shone the point of great Achilles' spear. In his right hand he waves the weapon round, eyes the whole man and meditates the wound but the rich mail patroclus lately wore securely cased the warrior's body o'er one space at length he spies to let in fate where twixt the neck and throat the jointed plate gave entrance through that penetrable part furious he drove the well-directed dart nor pierced the windpipe yet nor took the power of speech unhappy from thy dying hour Prone on the field the bleeding warrior lies, While thus triumphing stern Achilles cries, At last is Hector stretched upon the plain, Who feared no vengeance for Patroclus slain. Then, prince, you should have feared what now you feel. Achilles absent was Achilles still, Yet a short space the great avenger stayed, Then low in dust thy strength and glory laid. Peaceful he sleeps, with all our rites adorned, For ever honored and for ever mourned, While cast to all the rage of hostile power, Thee birds shall mangle, and the gods devour. Then Hector, fainting at the approach of death, By thy own soul, by those who gave thee breath, By all the sacred prevalence of prayer, Ah, leave me not for Grecian dogs to tear. The common rites of sepulture bestow To soothe a father's and a mother's woe. Let their large gifts procure an urn at least, And Hector's ashes in his country rest. No, wretch accursed, relentless he replies, Flames as he spoke shot flashing from his eyes. Not those who gave me breath should bid me spare, Nor all the sacred prevalence of prayer. Could I myself the bloody banquet join? No, to the dogs that carcass I resign. Should Troy, to bribe me, bring forth all her store, And giving thousands offer thousands more, Should Darden Priam and his weeping dame Drain their whole realm to buy one funeral flame, Their Hector on the pile they should not see, Nor rob the vultures of one limb of thee. Then thus the chief his dying accents drew. Thy rage implacable too well I knew. The furies that relentless breast have steeled, And cursed thee with a heart that cannot yield. Yet think, a day will come, When fate's decree and angry gods Shall wreak this wrong on thee. Phoebus and Paris shall avenge my fate, And stretch thee here before the Scaean gate. He ceased. The fates suppressed his laboring breath, And his eyes stiffened at the hand of death. To the dark realm the spirit wings its way, The manly body left a load of clay, And plaintive glides along the dreary coast, A naked, wandering, melancholy ghost. Achilles, musing as he rolled his eyes o'er the dead hero, Thus unheard, replies, 
die thou the first. When Jove in heaven ordain, I follow thee, he said, and stripped the slain. Then forcing backward from the gaping wound the reeking javelin, cast it on the ground. The thronging Greeks behold with wondering eyes his manly beauty and superior size, while some, ignobler, the great dead deface with wounds ungenerous or with taunts disgrace. How changed that Hector who, like Jove of late, sent lightning on our fleets and scattered fate! High o'er the slain the great Achilles stands, begirt with heroes and surrounding bands, and thus aloud, while all the host attends, Princes and leaders, countrymen and friends, since now at length the powerful will of heaven the dire destroyer to our arm has given, is not Troy fallen already? Haste, ye powers! See, if already their deserted towers are left unmanned, or if they yet retain the souls of heroes, their great Hector slain. But what is Troy, or glory what to me? Or why reflects my mind on aught but thee, divine Patroclus? Death hath sealed his eyes. Unwept, unhonored, uninterred he lies. Can his dear image from my soul depart, long as the vital spirit moves my heart? If in the melancholy shades below the flames of friends and lovers cease to glow, yet mine shall sacred last. Mine, undecayed, burn on through death and animate my shade. Meanwhile, ye sons of Greece, in triumph bring the corpse of Hector, and your paean sing. Be this the song, slow moving toward the shore, Hector is dead, and Aeolian is no more. Then his fell soul a thought of vengeance bred, unworthy of himself and of the dead. The nervous ankles bored, his feet he bound with thongs inserted through the double wound. These fixed up high behind the rolling wain, his graceful head was trailed along the plain. Proud on his car the insulting victor stood, and bore aloft his arms, distilling blood. He smites the steeds, the rapid chariot flies, the sudden clouds of circling dust arise. Now lost is all that formidable air, the face divine and long descending hair purple the ground, and streak the sable sand. Deformed, dishonored, in his native land, given to the rage of an insulting throng, and in his parents' sight now dragged along. The mother first beheld with sad survey. She rent her tresses, venerable gray, and cast, far off, the regal veils away. With piercing shrieks his bitter fate she moans, while the sad father answers groans with groans, tears after tears his mournful cheeks o'erflow, and the whole city wears one face of woe. No less than if the rage of hostile fires from her foundations curling to her spires, or the proud citadel at length should rise, and the last blaze send Aelian to the skies. The wretched monarch of the falling state, distracted, presses to the Darden gate. Scarce the whole people stop his desperate course, while strong affliction gives the feeble force. Grief tears his heart and drives him to and fro in all the raging impotence of woe. At length he rolled in dust and thus begun, imploring all and naming one by one. Ah, let me, let me go where sorrow calls. I, only I, will issue from your walls. Guide or companion, friends, I ask ye none, and bow before the murder of my son. My grief perhaps his pity may engage. Perhaps at least he may respect my age. He has a father, too, a man like me, one not exempt from age and misery, vigorous no more, as when his young embrace begot this pest of me and all my race. How many valiant sons, in early bloom, has that cursed hand sent headlong to the tomb? Thee, Hector, last, thy loss, divinely brave, sinks my sad soul with sorrow to the grave. O oh, had thy gentle spirit passed in peace, the sun expiring in the sire's embrace, while both thy parents wept the fatal hour, and bending o'er thee mixed the tender shower. Some comfort that had been, some sad relief, to melt in full satiety of grief. Thus wailed the father, groveling on the ground, and all the eyes of Aelian streamed around. Amidst her matrons Hecuba appears, a mourning princess, and a train in tears. 
Ah, why has heaven prolonged this hated breath, patient of horrors, to behold thy death? O Hector, late thy parents' pride and joy, the boast of nations, the defense of Troy, to whom her safety and her fame she owed, her chief, her hero, and almost her god. O oh, fatal change, become in one sad day a senseless corse, inanimated clay. But not as yet the fatal news had spread to fair Andromache of Hector dead. As yet no messenger had told his fate, not e'en his stay without the scan gate. Far in the close recesses of the dome, pensive she plied the melancholy loom. A growing work employed her secret hours, confusedly gay with intermingled flowers. Her fair-haired handmaids heat the brazen urn, the bath preparing for her lord's return, in vain. Alas, her lord returns no more. Unbathed he lies, and bleeds along the shore. Now from the walls the clamors reach her ear, and all her members shake with sudden fear. Forth from her ivory hand the shuttle falls, and thus, astonished, to her maids she calls. Ah, follow me, she cried. What plaintive noise invades my ear? Tis sure my mother's voice. My faltering knees their trembling frame desert. A pulse unusual flutters at my heart. Some strange disaster, some reverse of fate, ye gods avert it, threats the Trojan state. Far be the omen which my thoughts suggest. But much I fear my Hector's dauntless breast confronts Achilles, chased along the plain, shot from our walls. I fear, I fear him slain. Safe in the crowd he ever scorned to wait, and sought for glory in the jaws of fate. Perhaps that noble heat has cost his breath, now quenched for ever in the arms of death. She spoke, and furious with distracted pace, fears in her heart and anguish in her face, flies through the dome. The maids her steps pursue, and mounts the walls, and sends around her view. Too soon her eyes the killing object found, the godlike Hector dragged along the ground. A sudden darkness shades her swimming eyes. She faints, she falls, her breath, her color flies. Her hair's fair ornaments, the braids that bound, the net that held them, and the wreath that crowned, the veil and diadem flew far away, the gift of Venus on her bridal day. Around a train of weeping sisters stands to raise her sinking with assistant hands. Scarce from the verge of death recalled, again she faints, or but recovers to complain. O oh, wretched husband of a wretched wife, born with one fate to one unhappy life, for sure one star its baneful beam displayed on Priam's roof and Hippoplacia's shade. From different parents, different climes we came, at different periods, yet our fate the same. Why was my birth to great Atian owed, and why was all that tender care bestowed? Would I had never been! O oh, thou, the ghost of my dead husband, miserably lost! Thou to the dismal realms for ever gone, and I abandoned, desolate, alone, an only child, once comfort of my pains, sad product now of hapless love remains. No more to smile upon his sire, no friends to help him now, no father to defend. For should he escape the sword, the common doom, what wrongs attend him and what griefs to come? Even from his own paternal roof expelled, some stranger ploughs his patrimonial field. The day that to the shades the father sends robs the sad orphan of his father's friends. He, wretched outcast of mankind, appears for ever sad, for ever bathed in tears. Amongst the happy, unregarded, he hangs on the robe or trembles at the knee, while those his father's former bounty fed, nor reach the goblet, nor divide the bread. The kindest but his present wants allay, to leave him wretched the succeeding day. Frugal compassion, heedless, they who boast both parents still, nor feel what he has lost, shall cry, Be gone! Thy father feasts not here! The wretch obeys, retiring with a tear. Thus wretched, thus retiring all in tears, to my sad soul, Eustyanix, appears, forced by repeated insults to return, and to his widowed mother vainly mourn. 
he who with tender delicacy bred with princes sported and on dainties fed and when still evening gave him up to rest sunk soft and down upon the nurse's breast must ah what must he not whom Ilion calls a Styanax, from her well-guarded walls, is now that name no more, unhappy boy, since now no more thy father guards his Troy. But thou, my Hector, liest exposed in air, far from thy parents and thy consort's care, whose hand in vain, directed by her love, the martial scarf and robe of triumph wove. Now to devouring flames be these a prey, useless to thee from this accursed day yet let the sacrifice at least be paid an honour to the living not the dead so spake the mournful dame her matrons hear sigh back her sighs and answer tear with tear funeral games in honour of patroclus achilles and the myrmidons do honours to the body of patroclus after the funeral feast he retires to the seashore where falling asleep the ghost of his friend appears to him and demands the rites of burial the next morning the soldiers are sent with mules and wagons to fetch wood for the pyre, the funeral procession, and the offering their hair to the dead. Achilles sacrifices several animals, and lastly twelve Trojan captives at the pile, then sets fire to it. He pays libations to the winds, which, at the instance of Iris, rise and raise the flames. When the pile has burned all night, they gather the bones, place them in an urn of gold, and raise the tomb. Achilles institutes the funeral games, the chariot race, the fight of the cestus, the wrestling, the foot race, the single combat, the discus, the shooting with arrows, the darting the javelin, the various descriptions of which, and the various success of the several antagonists, make the greatest part of the book. In this book ends the thirtieth day. The night following, the ghost of Patroclus appears to Achilles. The one and thirtieth day is employed in felling the timber for the pile the two and thirtieth in burning it, and the three and thirtieth in the games. The scene is generally on the seashore. Thus humbled in the dust, the pensive train through the sad city mourned her hero slain. The body soiled with dust and black with gore lies on broad Hellespont's resounding shore. The Grecians seek their ships and clear the strand, all but the martial Myrmidonian band. These yet assembled great Achilles holds, and the stern purpose of his mind unfolds. Not yet, my brave companions of the war, release your smoking coursers from the car, but, with his chariot each in order led, perform due honors to Patroclus dead. Ere yet from rest or food we seek relief, some rites remain to glut our rage of grief. The troops obeyed, and thrice in order led, Achilles first, their coursers round the dead and thrice their sorrows and laments renew, tears bathe their arms and tears the sands bedew. For such a warrior Thetis aids their woe, melts their strong hearts, and bids their eyes to flow. But chief, Pelides, thick succeeding sighs burst from his heart and torrents from his eyes. His slaughtering hands, yet red with blood, he laid on his dead friend's cold breast, and thus he said, All hail, Patroclus! Let thy honored ghost hear and rejoice on Pluto's dreary coast. Behold, Achilles' promise is complete, the bloody Hector stretched before thy feet. Lo, to the dogs his carcass I resign, and twelve sad victims of the Trojan line, sacred to vengeance, instant shall expire, their lives effused around thy funeral pyre. Gloomy, he said, and, horrible to view, before the bier the bleeding Hector threw, prone on the dust. The Myrmidons around unbraced their armor and the steeds unbound. All to Achilles' sable ship repair, frequent and full, the genial feast to share. Now from the well-fed swine black smokes aspire, the bristly victims hissing o'er the fire. The huge ox bellowing falls, with feebler cries expires the goat, the sheep in silence dies. Around the hero's prostrate body flowed, in one promiscuous stream, the reeking blood. And now a band of Argive monarchs brings the glorious victor to the king of kings. From his dead friend the pensive warrior went, with steps unwilling, to the regal tent. The attending heralds, as by office bound, with kindled flames the tripod vase surround. To cleanse his conquering hands from hostile gore they urged in vain. The chief refused and swore. No drop shall touch me by almighty Jove. 
the first and greatest of the gods above, till on the pyre I place thee, till I rear the grassy mound and clip thy sacred hair. Some ease at least those pious rites may give, and soothe my sorrows while I bear to live. Howe'er, reluctant as I am, I stay and share your feast, but with the dawn of day, O king of men, it claims thy royal care, that Greece the warrior's funeral pile prepare, and bid the forests fall. Such rites are paid to heroes slumbering in eternal shade. Then, when his earthly part shall mount in fire, let the leagued squadrons to their posts retire. He spoke, they hear him and the word obey. The rage of hunger and of thirst allay, then ease in sleep the labors of the day. But great Pelides, stretched along the shore, where, dashed on rocks, the broken billows roar, lies inly groaning, while on either hand the martial Myrmidons confusedly stand. Along the grass his languid members fall, tired with his chase around the Trojan wall. Hushed by the murmurs of the rolling deep, at length he sinks in the soft arms of sleep. When, lo, the shade, before his closing eyes, of sad Patroclus rose, or seemed to rise, in the same robe he living wore, he came, in stature, voice, and pleasing look the same. The form familiar hovered o'er his head. And sleeps Achilles? Thus the phantom said. Sleeps my Achilles, his Patroclus dead? Living, I seemed his dearest, tenderest care, but now forgot, I wander in the air. Let my pale course the rites of burial know, and give me entrance in the realms below. Till then the spirit finds no resting place, but here and there the unbodied spectres chase the vagrant dead around the dark abode, forbid to cross the irremeable flood. Now give thy hand, for to the farther shore, when once we pass, the soul returns no more. When once the last funereal flames ascend, no more shall meet Achilles and his friend, no more our thoughts to those we loved make known, or quit the dearest to converse alone. Me fate has severed from the sons of earth, the fate foredoomed that waited from my birth. Thee too it waits, before the Trojan wall even great and godlike thou art doomed to fall. Here then, and as in fate and love we join, ah, suffer that my bones may rest with thine. Together have we lived, together bred, one house received us, and one table fed. That golden urn thy goddess mother gave, may mix our ashes in one common grave. And is it thou, he answers, to my sight once more returnst thou from the realms of night? Oh, more than brother, think each office paid, what e'er can rest a discontented shade, but grant one last embrace, unhappy boy, afford at least that melancholy joy. He said, and with his longing arms essayed in vain to grasp the visionary shade. Like a thin smoke he sees the spirit fly, and hears a feeble lamentable cry. Confused he wakes. Amazement breaks the bands of golden sleep, and starting from the sands, pensive he muses with uplifted hands. Tis true, tis certain. Man, though dead, retains part of himself. The immortal mind remains. The form subsists without the body's aid aerial semblance, and an empty shade. This night, my friend, so late in battle lost, stood at my side, a pensive, plaintive ghost, even now familiar, as in life he came. Alas, how different, yet how like the same! Thus while he spoke, each eye grew big with tears, and now the rosy-fingered morn appears, shows every mournful face with tears o'erspread, and glares on the pale visage of the dead. But Agamemnon, as the rites demand, with mules and wagons sends a chosen band to load the timber and the pile to rear, a charge consigned to Merion's faithful care. With proper instruments they take the road, axes to cut and ropes to sling the load. First march the heavy mules, securely slow, o'er hills, o'er dales, o'er crags, o'er rocks they go. Jumping high o'er the shrubs of the rough ground, rattle the clattering cars, and the shocked axles bound. But when arrived at Ida's spreading woods, fair Ida, watered with descending floods, loud sounds the axe, redoubling strokes on strokes, on all sides round the forest hurls her oaks headlong. Deep echoing groan the thickets brown, then rustling, crackling, crashing, thunder down. The wood the Grecians cleave, prepared to burn, and the slow mules the same rough road return. The sturdy woodmen equal burdens bore, such charge was given them, to the sandy shore. 
There on the spot which great Achilles showed, they eased their shoulders and disposed the load, circling around the place where times to come shall view Patroclus and Achilles' tomb. The hero bids his martial troops appear high on their cars in all the pomp of war. Each in refulgent arms his limbs attires, all mount their chariots, combatants, and squires. The chariots first proceed, a shining train, then clouds of foot that smoke along the plain. Next these the melancholy band appear, amidst lay dead Patroclus on the bier. O'er all the course their scattered locks they throw, Achilles next, oppressed with mighty woe, supporting with his hands the hero's head, bends o'er the extended body of the dead. Patroclus decent on the appointed ground they place, and heap the sylvan pile around. But great Achilles stands apart in prayer, and from his head divides the yellow hair. Those curling locks which from his youth he vowed, and sacred grew, to Spurcius honored flood. Then sighing, to the deep his locks he cast, and rolled his eyes around the watery waste. Spurcius, whose waves in mazy errors lost delightful roll along my native coast, to whom we vainly vowed, at our return, these locks to fall, and hecatombs to burn, full fifty rams to bleed in sacrifice, where to the day thy silver fountains rise, and where in shade of consecrated bowers thy altars stand, perfumed with native flowers. So vowed my father, but he vowed in vain. No more Achilles sees his native plain. In that vain hope these hairs no longer grow. Patroclus bears them to the shades below. Thus o'er Patroclus while the hero prayed, on his cold hand the sacred lock he laid. Once more afresh the Grecian sorrows flow, and now the sun had set up on their woe. But to the king of men thus spoke the chief, Enough, Atrides, give the troops relief. Permit the mourning legions to retire, and let the chiefs alone attend the pyre. The pious care be ours, the dead to burn. He said. The people to their ships return while those deputed to inter the slain heap with a rising pyramid the plain. A hundred foot in length, a hundred wide, the growing structure spreads on every side. High on the top the manly course they lay, and well-fed sheep and sable oxen slay. Achilles covered with their fat the dead, and the piled victims round the body spread. Then jars of honey and of fragrant oil suspends around, low bending o'er the pile. Four sprightly coursers with a deadly groan pour forth their lives, and on the pyre are thrown. Of nine large dogs, domestic at his board, fall two, selected to attend their lord. Then last of all, and horrible to tell, sad sacrifice, twelve Trojan captives fell. On these the rage of fire victorious praise involves and joins them in one common blaze. Smeared with the bloody rites, he stands on high, and calls the spirit with a dreadful cry. All hail, Patroclus! Let thy vengeful ghost hear, and exult on Pluto's dreary coast. Behold Achilles' promise fully paid, twelve Trojan heroes offered to thy shade, but heavier fates on Hector's course attend, saved from the flames for hungry dogs to rend. So spake he, threatening, but the gods made vain his threat, and guard inviolate the slain. Celestial Venus hovered o'er his head, and roseate unguents, heavenly fragrance, shed. She watched him all the night and all the day, and drove the bloodhounds from their destined prey. Nor sacred Phoebus less employed his care. He poured around a veil of gathered air, and kept the nerves undried, the flesh entire, against the solar beam and Syrian fire. Nor yet the pile, where dead Patroclus lies, smokes, nor as yet the sullen flames arise. But, fast beside, Achilles stood in prayer, invoked the gods whose spirit moves the air, and victims promised, and libations cast, to gentle Zephyr and the boreal blast. He called the aerial powers, along the skies to breathe, and whisper to the fires to rise. The winged Iris heard the hero's call, and instant hastened to their airy hall where in old Zephyr's open courts on high sat all the blustering brethren of the sky. She shone amidst them on her painted bow, the rocky pavement glittered with the show. All from the banquet rise, and each invites the various goddess to partake the rites. Not so, the dame replied, I haste to go to sacred ocean and the floods below. Even now our solemn hecatombs attend, and heaven is feasting on the world's green end with righteous Ethiop's uncorrupted train.
far on the extremest limits of the main. But Peleus' son entreats, with sacrifice, the western spirit and the north to rise. Let on Patroclus' pile your blast be driven, and bear the blazing honors high to heaven. Swift as the word she vanished from their view, swift as the word the winds tumultuous flew, forth burst the stormy band with thundering roar, and heaps on heaps the clouds are tossed before. To the wide main then, stooping from the skies, the heaving deeps in watery mountains rise. Troy feels the blast along her shaking walls, till on the pile the gathered tempest falls. The structure crackles in the roaring fires, and all the night the plenteous flame aspires. All night Achilles hails Patroclus' soul with large libations from the golden bowl. As a poor father, helpless and undone, mourns o'er the ashes of an only son, takes a sad pleasure the last bones to burn, and pours in tears ere yet they close the urn. So stayed Achilles, circling round the shore, so watched the flames, till now they flame no more. Twas when, emerging through the shades of night, the morning planet told the approach of light, and, fast behind, Aurora's warmer ray o'er the broad ocean poured the golden day. Then sank the blaze, the pile no longer burned, and to their caves the whistling winds returned. Across the Thracian seas their course they bore, the ruffled seas beneath their passage roar. Then parting from the pile he ceased to weep, and sank to quiet in the embrace of sleep, exhausted with his grief. Meanwhile the crowd of thronging Grecians round Achilles stood. The tumult waked him. From his eyes he shook unwilling slumber, and the chiefs bespoke. Ye kings and princes of the Achaean name, first let us quench the yet remaining flame with sable wine. Then, as the rites direct, the hero's bones with careful view select. Apart and easy to be known they lie amidst the heap, and obvious to the eye. The rest around the margin will be seen promiscuous, steeds and emulated men. These wrapped in double calls of fat prepare, and in the golden vase dispose with care. There let them rest with decent honor laid, till I shall follow to the infernal shade. Meantime erect the tomb with pious hands, a common structure on the humble sands. Hereafter Greece some nobler work may raise, and late posterity record our praise. The Greeks obey. Where yet the embers glow, wide o'er the pile the sable wine they throw, and deep subsides the ashy heap below. Next the white bones his sad companions place, with tears collected, in the golden vase. The sacred relics to the tent they bore, the urn a veil of linen covered o'er. That done, they bid the sepulchre aspire, and cast the deep foundations round the pyre. High in the midst they heap the swelling bed of rising earth, memorial of the dead. The swarming populace the chief detains, and leads amidst a wide extent of plains. There placed them round. Then from the ships proceeds a train of oxen, mules, and stately steeds, vases and tripods for the funeral games, resplendent brass, and more resplendent dames. First stood the prizes to reward the force of rapid racers in the dusty course. A woman for the first, in beauty's bloom, skilled in the needle and the laboring loom, and a large vase where two bright handles rise of twenty measures its capacious size. The second victor claims a mare unbroke, big with a mule, unknowing of the yoke. The third a charger yet untouched by flame. Four ample measures held the shining frame. Two golden talents for the fourth were placed. An ample double bowl contents the last. These in fair order ranged upon the plain, the hero rising thus addressed the train. Behold the prizes, valiant Greeks, decreed to the brave rulers of the racing steed. Prizes which none beside ourself could gain, should our immortal coursers take the plain. A race unrivaled, which from ocean's god Peleus received, and on his son bestowed. But this no time our vigor to display, nor suit with them the games of this sad day. Lost is Patroclus now, that won't to deck their flowing manes, and sleek their glossy neck. Sad, as they shared in human grief, they stand, and trail those graceful honors on the sand. Let others for the noble task prepare, who trust the courser and the flying car. Fired at his word, the rival racers rise, but for the first Eumelus hopes the prize, famed through Pieria for the fleetest breed, and skilled to manage the high-bounding steed. With equal ardor bold Tydides swelled, 
the steeds of trolls beneath his yoke compelled, which late obeyed the Dardan chief's command, when scarce a god redeemed him from his hand. Then Menelaus his Pudargis brings, and the famed courser of the king of kings, whom rich Ecapolis, more rich than brave, to scape the wars to Agamemnon gave, Athe her name, at home to end his days, base wealth preferring to eternal praise. Next him Antilochus demands the course, with beating heart, and cheers his Pylian horse. Experienced Nestor gives his son the reins, directs his judgment, and his heat restrains, nor idly warns the hoary sire, nor hears the prudent son with unattending ears. My son, though youthful ardor fire thy breast, the gods have loved thee, and with arts have blessed. Neptune and Jove on thee conferred the skill, swift round the goal, to turn the flying wheel. To guide thy conduct little precept needs, but slow and past their vigor are my steeds. Fear not thy rivals, though for swiftness known. Compare those rivals' judgment and thy own. It is not strength but art obtains the prize, and to be swift is less than to be wise. Tis more by art than force of numerous strokes the dexterous woodman shapes the stubborn oaks. By art the pilot, through the boiling deep and howling tempest, steers the fearless ship and tis the artist wins the glorious course, not those who trust in chariots and in horse. In vain, unskilful to the goal they strive, and short or wide the ungoverned courser drive, while with sure skill, though with inferior steeds, the knowing racer to his end proceeds. Fixed on the goal his eye foreruns the course, his hand unerring steers the steady horse, and now contracts or now extends the rein, observing still the foremost on the plain. Mark then the goal, tis easy to be found, yon aged trunk, a cubit from the ground. Of some once stately oak the last remains, or hardy fir, unperished with the rains, enclosed with stones, conspicuous from afar, and round, a circle for the wheeling car, some tomb perhaps of old, the dead to grace, or then, as now, the limit of a race. Bear close to this, and warily proceed, a little bending to the left-hand steed, but urge the right, and give him all the reins, while thy strict hand his fellow's head restrains, and turns him short, till, doubling as they roll, the wheel's round knaves appear to brush the goal. Yet, not to break the car or lame the horse, clear of the stony heap direct the course, lest through incaution failing thou mayst be a joy to others, a reproach to me. So shalt thou pass the goal, secure of mind, and leave unskilful swiftness far behind. Though thy fierce rival drove the matchless steed which bore Adrastus of celestial breed, or the famed race, through all the regions known, that whirled the car of proud Laomedon. Thus, not unsaid, the much-advising sage concludes, then sat, stiff with unwieldy age. Next bold Meriones was seen to rise, the last but not least ardent for the prize. They mount their seats, the lots their place dispose, rolled in his helmet, these Achilles throws. Young Nestor leads the race, Eumelus then, and next the brother of the king of men. Thy lot, Meriones, the fourth was cast, and, far the bravest, Diomede was last. They stand in order, an impatient train. Polites points the barrier on the plain, and sends before old Phoenix to the place, to mark the racers, and to judge the race. At once the coursers from the barrier bound, the lifted scourges all at once resound. Their heart, their eyes, their voice, they send before, and up the champagne thunder from the shore. Thick where they drive, the dusty clouds arise, and the lost courser in the whirlwind flies. Loose on their shoulders the long manes reclined, float in their speed, and dance upon the wind. The smoking chariots, rapid as they bound, now seem to touch the sky, and now the ground. While hot for fame and conquest all their care, each o'er his flying courser hung in air, erect with ardor, poised upon the rein, they pant, they stretch, they shout along the plain. Now the last compass fetched around the goal, at the near prize each gathers all his soul, each burns with double hope, with double pain, tears up the shore and thunders toward the main. First flew Eumelus on Phoretian steeds, with those of trolls bold Diomede succeeds. Close on Eumelus' back they puff the wind, and seem just mounting on his car behind. Full on his neck he feels the sultry breeze, and, hovering o'er, their stretching shadows sees. Then had he lost, or left a doubtful prize, 
but angry Phoebus to Tydides flies, strikes from his hand the scourge, and renders vain his matchless horse's labor on the plain. Rage fills his eye with anguish, to survey snatched from his hope the glories of the day. The fraud celestial palace sees with pain, springs to her knight, and gives the scourge again, and fills his steeds with vigor. At a stroke she breaks his rival's chariot from the yoke, no more their way the startled horses held. The car reversed came rattling on the field. Shot headlong from his seat, beside the wheel, prone on the dust the unhappy master fell. His battered face and elbows strike the ground, nose, mouth, and front, one undistinguished wound. Grief stops his voice, a torrent drowns his eyes, before him far the glad Tydides flies. Minerva's spirit drives his matchless pace, and crowns him victor of the labored race. The next, though distant, Menelaus succeeds, while thus young Nestor animates his steeds. Now, now, my generous pair, exert your force, not that we hope to match Tydides' horse, since great Minerva wings their rapid way, and gives their lord the honors of the day. But reach Atrides, shall his mare outgo your swiftness, vanquished by a female foe? Through your neglect, if lagging on the plain the last ignoble gift be all we gain, no more shall Nestor's hand your food supply. The old man's fury rises, and ye die. Haste, then, yon narrow road before our sight presents the occasion, could we use it right. Thus he, the coursers at their master's threat, with quicker steps the sounding champagne beat. And now Antilochus with nice survey observes the compass of the hollow way. Twas where, by force of wintry torrents torn, fast by the road a precipice was worn. Here, where but one could pass, to shun the throng the Spartan hero's chariot smoked along. Close up the venturous youth resolves to keep, still edging near, and bears him toward the steep. Atrides, trembling, casts his eye below, and wonders at the rashness of his foe. Hold, stay your steeds, what madness thus to ride this narrow way! Take larger field, he cried, or both must fall. Atrides cried in vain. He flies more fast and throws up all the rain. Far as an able arm the disc can send, when youthful rivals their full force extend, so far, Antilochus, thy chariot flew before the king. He, cautious, backward drew his horse compelled, foreboding in his fears the rattling ruin of the clashing cars, the floundering coursers rolling on the plain, and conquests lost through frantic haste to gain. But thus upbraids his rival as he flies. Go, furious youth, ungenerous and unwise. Go, but expect not I'll the prize resign. Add perjury to fraud and make it thine. Then to his steeds with all his force he cries, Be swift, be vigorous, and regain the prize. Your rivals, destitute of youthful force, with fainting knees shall labor in the course, and yield the glory yours. The steeds obey. Already at their heels they wing their way, and seem already to retrieve the day. Meantime the Grecians in a ring beheld the coursers bounding o'er the dusty field. The first who marked them was the Cretan king. High on a rising ground, above the ring, the monarch sat. From whence with sure survey he well observed the chief who led the way, and heard from far his animating cries, and saw the foremost steed with sharpened eyes, on whose broad front a blaze of shining white, like the full moon, stood obvious to the sight. He saw, and rising, to the Greeks begun. Are yonder horse discerned by me alone? Or can ye all another chief survey, and other steeds then lately led the way? Those, though the swiftest, by some god withheld, lie sure disabled in the middle field. For since the goal they doubled, round the plain I search to find them, but I search in vain. Perchance the reins forsook the driver's hand, and, turned too short, he tumbled on the strand, shot from the chariot, while his coursers stray with frantic fury from the destined way. Rise then some other, and inform my sight, for these dim eyes perhaps discern not right. Yet sure he seems, to judge by shape and air, the great Aetolian chief, renowned in war. Old man, O Ilius rashly thus replies, thy tongue too hastily confers the prize. Of those who view the course, nor sharpest eyed, nor youngest, yet the readiest to decide, Eumelus steeds, high bounding in the chase, still as at first unrivaled lead the race. I well discern him as he shakes the rein, and hear his shouts victorious o'er the plain.
Thus he. Idomeneus, incensed, rejoined, Barbarous of words, and arrogant of mind, Contentious prince, of all the Greeks beside the last in merit, as the first in pride. To vile reproach what answer can we make? A goblet or a tripod let us stake, and be the king the judge. The most unwise will learn their rashness when they pay the price. He said, and Ajax, by mad passion born, stern had replied, fierce scorn enhancing scorn to fell extremes. But Thetis' godlike son awful amidst them rose and thus begun. Forbear, ye chiefs, reproachful to contend. Much would ye blame, should others thus offend. And lo, the approaching steeds your contest end. No sooner had he spoke, but thundering near, Drives, through a stream of dust, the charioteer. High o'er his head the circling lash he wields, His bounding horses scarcely touch the fields, His car amidst the dusty whirlwind rolled, Bright with the mingled blaze of tin and gold, Refulgent through the cloud. No eye could find the track his flying wheels had left behind, And the fierce coursers urged their rapid pace so swift, It seemed a flight, and not a race. Now victor at the goal Tydides stands, quits his bright car, and springs upon the sands. From the hot steeds the sweaty torrents stream, the well-plied whip is hung athwart the beam. With joy brave Sthenelus receives the prize, the tripod vase, and dame with radiant eyes. These to the ships his train triumphant leads, the chief himself unyokes the panting steeds. Young Nestor follows who, by art, not force, or past Atrides second in the course. Behind, Atrides urged the race, more near than to the courser in his swift career, the following car, just touching with his heel, and brushing with his tail the whirling wheel. Such, and so narrow now the space between the rivals, late so distant on the green. So soon swift Athe, her lost ground regained, one length, one moment had the race obtained. Merion pursued at greater distance still, with tardier coursers and inferior skill. Last came Admetus, thy unhappy son, slow dragged the steeds his battered chariot on. Achilles saw, and pitying thus begun. Behold, the man whose matchless art surpassed the sons of Greece, the ablest, yet the last. Fortune denies, but justice bids us pay, since great Tydides bears the first away, to him the second honors of the day. The Greeks consent with loud applauding cries, and then Eumelus had received the prize, but youthful Nestor, jealous of his fame, the award opposes and asserts his claim. Think not, he cries, I tamely will resign, O Peleus' son, the mare so justly mine. What if the gods, the skillful to confound, have thrown the horse and horsemen to the ground? Perhaps he sought not heaven by sacrifice, and vows omitted forfeited the prize. If yet distinction to thy friend to show, and please a soul desirous to bestow, some gift must grace Eumelus, view thy store of beauteous handmaids, steeds, and shining ore. An ample present let him thence receive, and Greece shall praise thy generous thirst to give. But this my prize I never shall forego, this, who but touches warriors, is my foe. Thus spake the youth, nor did his words offend. Pleased with the well-turned flattery of a friend, Achilles smiled. The gift proposed, he cried, Antilochus, we shall ourselves provide. With plates of brass the corslet covered o'er, the same renowned Asteropeus wore, whose glittering margins raised with silver shine, no vulgar gift, Eumelus shall be thine. He said, Automedon at his command the corslet brought and gave it to his hand. Distinguished by his friend, his bosom glows with generous joy. Then Menelaus rose. The herald placed the scepter in his hands, and stilled the clamor of the shouting bands. Not without cause incensed at Nestor's son, and inly grieving, thus the king begun. The praise of wisdom, in thy youth obtained, an act so rash, Antilochus, has stained. Robbed of my glory and my just reward, to you, O Grecians, be my wrong declared. So not a leader shall our conduct blame, or judge me envious of a rival's fame. But shall not we— ourselves the truth maintain? What needs appealing in a fact so plain? What Greek shall blame me if I bid thee rise, and vindicate by oath the ill-gotten prize? Rise if thou darest, before thy chariot stand, the driving scourge high lifted in thy hand, and touch thy steeds, and swear thy whole intent was but to conquer, not to circumvent. Swear by that God whose liquid arms surround the globe, and whose dread earthquakes heave the ground. 
the prudent chief with calm attention heard, then mildly thus, Excuse if youth have erred, superior as thou art, forgive the offence, nor I thy equal or in years or since. Thou know'st the errors of unripened age, weak are its counsels, headlong is its rage. The prize I quit, if thou thy wrath resign. The mare, or aught thou asked, be freely thine, ere I become, from thy dear friendship torn, hateful to thee, and to the gods forsworn. So spoke Antilochus, and at the word the mare contested to the king restored. Joy swells his soul, as when the vernal grain lifts the green ear above the springing plain, the fields their vegetable life renew, and laugh and glitter with the morning dew, such joy the Spartan's shining face o'erspread, and lifted his gay heart, while thus he said, Still may our souls, O generous youth, agree tis now Atrides' turn to yield to thee. Rash heat perhaps a moment might control, not break, the subtle temper of thy soul. Not but, my friend, tis still the wiser way to waive contention with superior sway. For, ah, how few, who should like thee offend, like thee have talents to regain the friend, to plead indulgence and thy fault atone, suffice thy father's merit and thy own. Generous alike, for me, the sire and son have greatly suffered, and have greatly done. I yield, that all may know, my soul can bend, nor is my pride preferred before my friend. He said, and pleased his passion to command, resigned the courser to Noemon's hand, friend of the youthful chief, himself content, the shining charger to his vessel sent. The golden talents Merion next obtained, the fifth reward, the double bowl, remained. Achilles this to reverend Nestor bears, and thus the purpose of his gift declares. Accept thou this, O sacred sire, he said, in dear memorial of Patroclus dead. Dead and for ever lost Patroclus lies, for ever snatched from our desiring eyes. Take thou this token of a grateful heart, though tis not thine to hurl the distant dart, the quite to toss, the ponderous mace to wield, or urge the race, or wrestle on the field. Thy pristine vigor age has overthrown, but left the glory of the past thy own. He said, and placed the goblet at his side. With joy the venerable king replied, Wisely and well, my son, thy words have proved a senior honored and a friend beloved. Too true it is, deserted of my strength, these withered arms and limbs have failed at length. Oh, had I now that force I felt of yore, known through Buprasium and the Pylian shore, Victorious then in every solemn game, ordained to Amarinth's mighty name, the brave Epeans gave my glory way, Aetolians, Pylians, all resigned the day. I quelled Clytomedes in fights of hand, and backward hurled Ancaeus on the sand, surpassed Iphiclus in the swift career, Phileus and Polydorus with the spear. The sons of Actor won the prize of horse, but won by numbers, not by art or force, for the famed twins, Impatient to survey prize after prize by Nestor borne away, sprung to their car, and with united pains one lashed the coursers while one ruled the reins. Such once I was. Now to these tasks succeeds a younger race that emulate our deeds. I yield, alas, to age who must not yield, though once the foremost hero of the field. Go thou, my son, by generous friendship led, with martial honors decorate the dead. While pleased I take the gift thy hands present, pledge of benevolence and kind intent, rejoiced of all the numerous Greeks, to see not one but honors sacred age and me. Those due distinctions thou so well canst pay, may the just gods return another day. Proud of the gift, thus spake the full of days. Achilles heard him, prouder of the praise. The prizes next are ordered to the field, for the bold champions who the cestus wield. A stately mule, as yet by toils unbroke, of six years' age, unconscious of the yoke, is to the circus led, and firmly bound. Next stands a goblet, massy, large, and round. Achilles rising thus. Let Greek excite two heroes equal to this hardy fight. Who dare the foe with lifted arms provoke, and rush beneath the long descending stroke? On whom Apollo shall the palm bestow, and whom the Greeks supreme by conquest know, this mule his dauntless labor shall repay, the vanquished bear the massy bowl away. This dreadful combat great Epeus chose. High o'er the crowd, enormous bulk, he rose, and seized the beast, and thus began to say, Stand forth some man to bear the bowl away, price of his ruin, for who dares deny, this mule my right, the undoubted victor I. 
Others, tis owned, in fields of battle shine, but the first honours of this fight are mine, for who excels in all? Then let my foe draw near, but first his certain fortune know. Secure this hand shall his whole frame confound, mash all his bones, and all his body pound. So let his friends be nigh a needful train, to heave the battered carcass off the plain. The giant spoke, and in a stupid gaze the host beheld him, silent with amaze. "'Twas thou, Euryalus, who durst aspire to meet his might, and emulate thy sire, the great Mecistius, who in days of yore, in Theban games the noblest trophy bore, the games ordained dead Oedipus to grace, and singly vanquished the Cadmian race. Him great Tydides urges to contend, warm with the hopes of conquest for his friend. Officious with the cincture girds him round, and to his wrist the gloves of death are bound. Amid the circle now each champion stands, and poises high in air his iron hands. With clashing gauntlets now they fiercely close, their crackling jaws re-echo to the blows, and painful sweat from all their members flows. At length Epeus dealt a weighty blow full on the cheek of his unwary foe. Beneath that ponderous arm's resistless sway down dropped he, nerveless and extended lay. As a large fish, when winds and waters roar, by some huge billow dashed against the shore, lies panting. Not less battered with his wound, the bleeding hero pants upon the ground. To rear his fallen foe, the victor lends, scornful, his hand, and gives him to his friends, whose arms support him, reeling through the throng, and dragging his disabled legs along. Nodding, his head hangs down his shoulder o'er, his mouth and nostrils pour the clotted gore. Wrapped round in mists he lies, and lost to thought. His friends receive the bowl, too dearly bought. The third bold game Achilles next demands, and calls the wrestlers to the level sands. A massy tripod for the victor lies, of twice six oxen its reputed price. And next, the loser's spirits to restore, a female captive, valued but at four. Scarce did the chief the vigorous strife propose when tower-like Ajax and Ulysses rose. Amid the ring each nervous rival stands, embracing rigid with implicit hands. Close locked above, their heads and arms are mixed. Below, their planted feet at distance fixed. Like two strong rafters which the builder forms, proof to the wintry winds and howling storms, their tops connected, but at wider space fixed on the center, stands their solid base. Now to the grasp each manly body bends, the humid sweat from every pore descends, their bones resound with blows, sides, shoulders, thighs swell to each gripe, and bloody tumors rise. Nor could Ulysses, for his art renowned, or turn the strength of Ajax on the ground, nor could the strength of Ajax overthrow the watchful caution of his artful foe. While the long strife even tired the lookers on, thus to Ulysses spoke great Telamon. Or let me lift thee, chief, or lift thou me. Prove we our force, and Jove the rest decree. He said, and straining, heaved him off the ground with matchless strength. That time Ulysses found the strength to evade, and where the nerves combine his ankle struck, the giant fell supine. Ulysses following on his bosom lies, shouts of applause run rattling through the skies. Ajax to lift Ulysses next essays, he barely stirred him, but he could not raise. His knee locked fast, the foe's attempt denied, and grappling close, they tumbled side by side. Defiled with honorable dust they roll, still breathing strife and unsubdued of soul. Again they rage, again to combat rise, when great Achilles thus divides the prize. Your noble vigor, O oh my friends, restrain, nor weary out your generous strength in vain. Ye both have won. Let others who excel now prove that prowess you have proved so well. The hero's words the willing chiefs obey, from their tired bodies wipe the dust away, and, clothed anew, the following games survey. And now succeed the gifts ordained to grace the youths contending in the rapid race, a silver urn that full six measures held, by none in weight or workmanship excelled. Sidonian artists taught the frame to shine, elaborate, with artifice divine. Whence Tyrian sailors did the prize transport, and gave to Thoas at the Lemnian port. From him descended, good Aeneas heired the glorious gift, and for Lycaon spared, to brave Patroclus gave the rich reward. Now the same hero's funeral rites to grace, it stands the prize of swiftness in the race. A well-fed ox was for the second placed, and half a talent must content the last. 
Achilles rising then bespoke the train. Who hope the palm of swiftness to obtain, stand forth, and bear these prizes from the plain. The hero said, and starting from his place, Oilean Ajax rises to the race. Ulysses next, and he whose speed surpassed his youthful equals, Nestor's son, the last. Ranged in a line, the ready racers stand. Pelides points the barrier with his hand. All start at once. O Ilius led the race, the next Ulysses, measuring pace with pace. Behind him, diligently close he sped, as closely following as the running thread the spindle follows, and displays the charms of the fair spinster's breast and moving arms. Graceful in motion thus, his foe he plies, and treads each footstep ere the dust can rise. His glowing breath upon his shoulders plays, the admiring Greeks loud acclamations raise. To him they give their wishes, hearts, and eyes, and send their souls before him as he flies. Now three times turned in prospect of the goal, the panting chief to Pallas lifts his soul. Assist, O goddess! Thus in thought he prayed, and present at his thought descends the maid. Buoyed by her heavenly force, he seems to swim, and feels a pinion lifting every limb. All fierce and ready now the prize to gain, unhappy Ajax stumbles on the plain, or turned by Pallas, where the slippery shore was clogged with slimy dung and mingled gore. The selfsame place beside Patroclus' pyre, where late the slaughtered victims fed the fire. Besmeared with filth and blotted o'er with clay, obscene to sight, the rueful racer lay. The well-fed bull, the second prize, he shared, and left the urn Ulysses' rich reward. Then, grasping by the horn the mighty beast, the baffled hero thus the Greeks addressed. Accursed fate, the conquest I forgo, a mortal I, a goddess was my foe. She urged her favorite on the rapid way, and Pallas, not Ulysses, won the day. Thus sourly wailed he, sputtering dirt and gore. A burst of laughter echoed through the shore. Antilochus, more humorous than the rest, takes the last prize, and takes it with a jest. Why with our wiser elders should we strive? The gods still love them, and they always thrive. You see, to Ajax I must yield the prize, he to Ulysses, still more aged and wise a green old age unconscious of decays, that proves the hero born in better days. Behold his vigor in this act of race. Achilles only boasts a swifter pace. For who can match Achilles? He who can must yet be more than hero, more than man. The effect succeeds the speech. Pelides cries, Thy artful praise deserves a better prize. Nor Greece in vain shall hear thy friend extolled. Receive a talent of the purest gold. The youth departs content. The host admire the son of Nestor, worthy of his sire. Next these, a buckler, spear, and helm he brings. Cast on the plain, the brazen burden rings. Arms which of late divine Sarpedon wore, and great Patroclus in short triumph bore. Stand forth the bravest of our host, he cries. Whoever dares deserve so rich a prize, now grace the lists before our army's sight, and sheathed in steel, provoke his foe to fight. Who first the jointed armor shall explore, and stain his rival's mail with issuing gore, the sword Astropius possessed of old, a Thracian blade, distinct with studs of gold, shall pay the stroke, and grace the striker's side. These arms in common let the chiefs divide, for each brave champion, when the combat ends, a sumptuous banquet at our tents attends. Fierce at the word uprose great Tydeus' son, and the huge bulk of Ajax Telamon, Clad in refulgent steel, on either hand, the dreadful chiefs amid the circle stand. Lowering they meet, tremendous to the sight, each argive bosom beats with fierce delight. Opposed in arms not long they idly stood, but thrice they closed, and thrice the charge renewed. A furious pass the spear of Ajax made through the broad shield, but at the corslet stayed. Not thus the foe, his javelin aimed above the buckler's margin, at the neck he drove. But Greece, now trembling for her hero's life, bade share the honors and surcease the strife. Yet still the victor's due to Dides gains. With him the sword and studded belt remains. Then hurled the hero, thundering on the ground, a mass of iron, an enormous round, whose weight and size the circling Greeks admire, rude from the furnace and but shaped by fire. This mighty quite Etion wont to rear, and from his whirling arm dismiss in air. The giant by Achilles slain, he stowed among his spoils this memorable load. 
For this, he bids those nervous artists buy, that teach the disc to sound along the sky. Let him, whose might can hurl this bowl, arise. Who farthest hurls it, take it as his prize. If he be one enriched with large domain of downs for flocks and arable for grain, small stock of iron needs that man provide. His hinds and swains whole years shall be supplied from hence, nor ask the neighboring city's aid for plowshares, wheels, and all the rural trade. Stern Polypetes stepped before the throng, and great Leontius, more than mortal strong, whose force with rival forces to oppose, up rose great Ajax, up Epeus rose. Each stood in order, first Epeus threw. High o'er the wondering crowds the whirling circle flew. Leontius next a little space surpassed, and third the strength of godlike Ajax cast. O'er both their marks it flew, till fiercely flung from Polypetes' arm the discus sung. Far as a swain his whirling sheep hook throws, that distant falls among the grazing cows, so past them all the rapid circle flies. His friends, while loud applauses shake the skies, with force conjoined heave off the weighty prize. Those, who in skilful archery contend, he next invites the twanging bow to bend, and twice ten axes casts amidst the round, ten double-edged, and ten that singly wound the mast, which late a first-rate galley bore, the hero fixes in the sandy shore. To the tall top a milk-white dove they tie, the trembling mark at which their arrows fly. Whose weapon strikes yon fluttering bird shall bear these two-edged axes terrible in war, the single he whose shaft divides the cord. He said, Experienced Merion took the word, and skilful Teucer. In the helm they threw their lots inscribed, and forth the latter flew. Swift from the string the sounding arrow flies, but flies unblessed. No grateful sacrifice, no firstling lambs, unheedful, didst thou vow to Phoebus, patron of the shaft and bow. For this thy well-aimed arrow turned aside, urged from the dove, yet cut the cord that tied. Adown the mainmast fell the parted string, and the free bird to heaven displays her wing. Sea, shores, and skies, with loud applause resound, and Merion eager meditates the wound. He takes the bow, directs the shaft above, and following with his eye the soaring dove, implores the god to speed it through the skies, with vows of firstling lambs and grateful sacrifice. The dove, in airy circles as she wheels, amid the clouds the piercing arrow feels. Quite through and through the point its passage found, and at his feet fell bloody to the ground. The wounded bird, ere yet she breathed her last, with flagging wings alighted on the mast, a moment hung, and spread her pinions there, then sudden dropped, and left her life in air. From the pleased crowd new peals of thunder rise, and to the ship's brave Merion bears the prize. To close the funeral games, Achilles last a massy spear amid the circle placed and ample charger of unsullied frame, with flowers high wrought, not blackened yet by flame. For these he bids the heroes prove their art, whose dexterous skill directs the flying dart. Here too great Merion hopes the noble prize, nor here disdained the king of men to rise. With joy Pelides saw the honor paid, rose to the monarch, and respectful said, Thee first in virtue, as in power supreme, O king of nations, all thy Greeks proclaim. In every martial game thy worth attest, And know thee both their greatest and their best. Take then the prize, but let brave Merion Bear this beamy javelin in thy brother's war. Pleased from the hero's lips his praise to hear, The king to Merion gives the brazen spear, But, set apart for sacred use, Commands the glittering charger to Talthebius' hands. The Redemption, the redemption of, of the, the Body, body of, of Hector. Hector The gods deliberate about the redemption of Hector's body. Jupiter sends Thetis to Achilles, to dispose him for the restoring it, and Iris to Priam, to encourage him to go in person and treat for it. The old king, notwithstanding the remonstrances of his queen, makes ready for the journey, to which he is encouraged by an omen from Jupiter. He sets forth in his chariot, with a wagon loaded with presents, under the charge of Ideas, the herald. Mercury descends in the shape of a young man, and conducts him to the pavilion of Achilles. Their conversation on the way. Priam finds Achilles at his table, casts himself at his feet, and begs for the body of his son. Achilles, moved with compassion, grants his request, detains him one night in his tent, and the next morning sends him home with the body. The Trojans run out to meet him. 
the lamentations of Andromache, Hecuba, and Helen, with the solemnities of the funeral. The time of twelve days is employed in this book, while the body of Hector lies in the tent of Achilles, and as many more are spent in the truce allowed for his interment. The scene is partly in Achilles' camp, and partly in Troy. Now from the finished games the Grecian band seek their black ships and clear the crowded strand, all stretched at ease, the genial banquet share, and pleasing slumbers quiet all their care. Not so Achilles, he to grief resigned, his friend's dear image present to his mind, takes his sad couch, more unobserved to weep, nor tastes the gifts of all composing sleep. Restless he rolled around his weary bed, and all his soul on his Patroclus fed, the form so pleasing and the heart so kind, that youthful vigor and that manly mind, what toils they shared, what martial works they wrought, what seas they measured, and what fields they fought. All passed before him in remembrance dear, thought follows thought, and tear succeeds to tear. And now supine, now prone the hero lay, now shifts his side, impatient for the day. Then starting up, disconsolate, he goes wide on the lonely beach to vent his woes. There, as the solitary mourner raves, the ruddy morning rises o'er the waves. Soon as it rose, his furious steeds he joined. The chariot flies, and Hector trails behind. And thrice, Patroclus, round thy monument was Hector dragged, then hurried to the tent. There sleep at last o'ercomes the hero's eyes, while foul in dust the unhonored carcass lies, but not deserted by the pitying skies. For Phoebus watched it with superior care, preserved from gaping wounds and tainting air and, ignominious as it swept the field, spread o'er the sacred course his golden shield. All heaven was moved, and Hermes willed to go by stealth to snatch him from the insulting foe. But Neptune this, and Pallas this denies, and the unrelenting empress of the skies, e'er since that day implacable to Troy, what time young Paris, simple shepherd boy, won by destructive lust, reward obscene, their charms rejected for the Cyprian queen. But when the tenth celestial morning broke, to heaven assembled, thus Apollo spoke. Unpitying powers, how oft each holy fane has Hector tinged with blood of victims slain! And can ye still his cold remains pursue? Still grudge his body to the Trojans' view? Deny to consort, mother, son, and sire, the last sad honors of a funeral fire? Is then the dire Achilles all your care? That iron heart! inflexibly severe. A lion, not a man, who slaughters wide, in strength of rage and impotence of pride, who hastes to murder with a savage joy, invades around and breathes but to destroy. Shame is not of his soul, nor understood the greatest evil and the greatest good. Still for one loss he rages unresigned, repugnant to the lot of all mankind. To lose a friend, a brother, or a son, heaven dooms each mortal, and its will is done. A while they sorrow, then dismiss their care. Fate gives the wound, and man is born to bear. But this insatiate, the commission given by fate exceeds, and tempts the wrath of heaven. Lo, how his rage dishonest drags along Hector's dead earth, insensible of wrong. Brave though he be, yet by no reason awed, he violates the laws of man and God. If equal honors by the partial skies are doomed both heroes, Juno thus replies, If that a son must no distinction know, then hear, ye gods, the patron of the bow. But Hector only boasts a mortal claim, his birth deriving from a mortal dame. Achilles, of your own ethereal race, springs from a goddess by a man's embrace, a goddess by ourself to Peleus given, a man divine, and chosen friend of heaven. To grace those nuptials, from the bright abode yourselves were present, where this minstrel god, well pleased to share the feast, amid the choir stood proud to him, and tune his youthful lyre. Then thus the thunderer checks the imperial dame, Let not thy wrath the court of heaven inflame, their merits nor their honors are the same. But mine, and every god's peculiar grace, Hector deserves, of all the Trojan race. Still on our shrines his grateful offerings lay, The only honors men to gods can pay. 
nor ever from our smoking altar ceased the pure libation and the holy feast. Howe'er by stealth to snatch the course away, we will not. Thetis guards it night and day. But haste, and summon to our courts above the azure queen. Let her persuasion move her furious son from Priam to receive the proffered ransom, and the course to leave. He added not, and Iris from the skies, swift as a whirlwind, on the message flies, meteorous the face of ocean sweeps, refulgent gliding o'er the sable deeps. Between where Samos wide his forest spreads, and rocky Imbrus lifts its pointed heads, down plunged the maid, the parted waves resound. She plunged, and instant shot the dark profound. As bearing death in the fallacious bait, from the bent angle sinks the leaden weight. So passed the goddess through the closing wave, where Thetis sorrowed in her secret cave. There placed amidst her melancholy train, the blue-haired sisters of the sacred main, pensive she sat, revolving fates to come, and wept her godlike son's approaching doom. Then thus the goddess of the painted bow, Arise, O Thetis, from thy seats below, tis Jove that calls. And why, the dame replies, calls Jove his Thetis to the hated skies? Sad object as I am for heavenly sight. Ah, may my sorrows ever shun the light. Howe'er, be heaven's almighty sire obeyed. She spake, and veiled her head in sable shade, which, flowing long, her graceful person clad, and forth she paced, majestically sad. Then through the world of waters they repair, the wayfarer Iris led, to upper air. The deeps dividing, o'er the coast they rise, and touch with momentary flight the skies. There in the lightning's blaze the sire they found, and all the gods in shining synod round. Thetis approached with anguish in her face, Minerva rising gave the mourner place. Even Juno sought her sorrows to console, and offered from her hand the nectar bowl. She tasted and resigned it, then began the sacred sire of gods and mortal man. Thou comest, fair Thetis, but with grief o'ercast. Maternal sorrows, long, ah, long to last. Suffice, we know and we partake thy cares. But yield to fate, and hear what Jove declares. Nine days are past since all the court above in Hector's cause have moved the ear of Jove. Twas voted Hermes from his godlike foe by stealth should bear him. But we willed not so. We will, thy son himself the course restore, And to his conquest add this glory more. Then hie thee to him, and our mandate bear. Tell him he tempts the wrath of heaven too far. Nor let him more, our anger if he dread, Vent his mad vengeance on the sacred dead. But yield to ransom and the father's prayer. The mournful father, Iris, shall prepare with gifts to sue and offer to his hands whate'er his honor asks or heart demands. His word the silver-footed queen attends, and from Olympus' snowy tops descends. Arrived, she heard the voice of loud lament and echoing groans that shook the lofty tent. His friends prepare the victim, and dispose repast unheeded while he vents his woes. The goddess seats her by her pensive son, and pressed his hand, and tender thus begun. How long unhappy shall thy sorrows flow, and thy heart waste with life-consuming woe, mindless of food or love, whose pleasing rain soothes weary life, and softens human pain. O oh, snatch the moments yet within thy power, not long to live, indulge the amorous hour. Lo, Jove himself, for Jove's command I bear, forbids to tempt the wrath of heaven too far. No longer then, his fury, if thou dread, detain the relics of great Hector dead. Nor vent on senseless earth thy vengeance vain, but yield to ransom, and restore the slain. To whom Achilles? Be the ransom given, and we submit, since such the will of heaven. While thus they communed, from the Olympian bowers, Jove orders Iris to the Trojan towers. Haste, winged goddess, to the sacred town, and urge her monarch to redeem his son. Alone the Aelian ramparts let him leave, and bear what stern Achilles may receive. Alone, for so we will. No Trojan near except, to place the dead with decent care, some aged herald, who with gentle hand may the slow mules and funeral car command. Nor let him death, nor let him danger dread, safe through the foe by our protection led. Him Hermes to Achilles shall convey, guard of his life and partner of his way. 
Fierce as he is, Achilles' self shall spare his age, nor touch one venerable hair. Some thought there must be in a soul so brave, some sense of duty, some desire to save. Then down her bow the winged iris drives, and swift at Priam's mournful court arrives, where the sad sons beside their father's throne sat bathed in tears, and answered groan with groan. And all amidst them lay the hoary sire, sad scene of woe, his face, his rapt attire, concealed from sight. With frantic hands he spread a shower of ashes o'er his neck and head. From room to room his pensive daughters roam, whose shrieks and clamors fill the vaulted dome. Mindful of those who late their pride and joy, lie pale and breathless round the fields of Troy. Before the king Jove's messenger appears, and thus in whispers greets his trembling ears. Fear not, O oh father, no ill news I bear. From Jove I come, Jove makes thee still his care. For Hector's sake these walls he bids thee leave, and bear what stern Achilles may receive. Alone, for so he wills, no Trojan near except, to place the dead with decent care, some aged herald, who with gentle hand may the slow mules and funeral car command. Nor shalt thou death, nor shalt thou danger dread, safe through the foe by his protection led. Thee Hermes to Pelides shall convey, guard of thy life, and partner of thy way. Fierce as he is, Achilles' self shall spare thy age, nor touch one venerable hair. Some thought there must be in a soul so brave, some sense of duty, some desire to save. She spoke and vanished. Priam bids prepare his gentle mules and harness to the car. There, for the gifts, a polished casket lay. His pious sons the king's command obey. Then passed the monarch to his bridal room, where cedar beams the lofty roof's perfume, and where the treasures of his empire lay. Then called his queen, and thus began to say, Unhappy consort of a king distressed, partake the troubles of thy husband's breast. I saw descend the messenger of Jove, who bids me try Achilles' mind to move. Forsake these ramparts, and with gifts obtain the course of Hector at yon navy slain. Tell me thy thought. My heart impels to go through hostile camps, and bears me to the foe. The hoary monarch thus. Her piercing cries sad Hecuba renews, and then replies, Ah, whither wanders thy distempered mind, and where the prudence now that odd mankind? Through Phrygia once and foreign regions known, now all confused, distracted, overthrown. Singly to pass through hosts of foes, to face, O oh heart of steel, the murderer of thy race, to view that dreadful eye, and wander o'er those hands yet red with Hector's noble gore. Alas, my lord, he knows not how to spare, and what his mercy thy slain sons declare, so brave, so many fallen, to claim his rage vain were thy dignity, and vain thy age. No, pent in this sad palace, let us give to grief the wretched days we have to live. Still, still for Hector let our sorrows flow, born to his own and to his parents' woe. Doomed from the hour his luckless life begun, to dogs, to vultures, and to Peleus' son. Oh, in his dearest blood might I allay my rage, and these barbarities repay. For, ah, could Hector merit thus, whose breath expired not meanly, in unactive death? He poured his latest blood in manly fight, and fell a hero in his country's right. Seek not to stay me, nor my soul affright with words of omen, like a bird of night, replied unmoved the venerable man. Tis heaven commands me, and you urge in vain. Had any mortal voice the injunction laid, nor augur, priest, nor seer had been obeyed. A present goddess brought the high command, I saw, I heard her, and the word shall stand. I go, ye gods, obedient to your call. If in yon camp your powers have doomed my fall, content. By the same hand let me expire. Add to the slaughtered son the wretched sire. One cold embrace at least may be allowed, and my last tears flow mingled with his blood. From forth his open stores, this said, he drew twelve costly carpets of refulgent hue, as many vests, as many mantles told, and twelve fair veils, and garments stiff with gold. Two tripods next, and twice two chargers shine, with ten pure talents from the richest mine. And last, a large well-labored bowl had place, the pledge of treaties once with friendly thrace. 
seemed all too mean the stores he could employ for one last look to buy him back to Troy. Lo, the sad father, frantic with his pain, around him furious drives his menial train. In vain each slave with duteous care attends, each office hurts him and each face offends. What make ye here, officious crowds? he cries. Hence, nor obtrude your anguish on my eyes. Have ye no griefs at home to fix ye there? Am I the only object of despair? Am I become my people's common show, set up by Jove your spectacle of woe? No, you must feel him too, yourselves must fall. The same stern God to ruin gives you all. Nor is great Hector lost by me alone. Your sole defense, your guardian power is gone. I see your blood the fields of frigid drown. I see the ruins of your smoking town. Oh, send me, gods, ere that sad day shall come, a willing ghost to Pluto's dreary dome. He said, and feebly drives his friends away. The sorrowing friends his frantic rage obey. Next on his sons his erring fury falls. Polites, Paris, Agathon he calls. His threats to Ephubus and Dias hear. Hippothous, Paimon, Helenes the seer, and generous Antiphon, for yet these nine survived, sad relics of his numerous line. Inglorious sons of an unhappy sire, why did not all in Hector's cause expire? Wretch that I am, my bravest offspring slain. You, the disgrace of Priam's house, remain. Mester the brave, renowned in ranks of war, with Troilus, dreadful on his rushing car, and last great Hector, more than man divine, for sure he seemed not of terrestrial line. All those relentless Mars untimely slew, and left me these, a soft and servile crew, whose days the feast and wanton dance employ, gluttons and flatterers, the contempt of Troy. Why teach ye not my rapid wheels to run, and speed my journey to redeem my son? The sons their father's wretched age revere, forgive his anger, and produce the car. High on the seat the cabinet they bind, the new-made car with solid beauty shined. Box was the yoke, embossed with costly pains, and hung with ringlets to receive the reins. Nine cubits long, the traces swept the ground, these to the chariot's polished pole they bound. Then fixed a ring the running reins to guide, and close beneath the gathered ends were tied. Next, with the gifts, the price of Hector slain, the sad attendants load the groaning wain. Last to the yoke the well-matched mules they bring, the gift of Mesia to the Trojan king. But the fair horses, long his darling care, himself received, and harnessed to his car. Grieved as he was, he not this task denied, the hoary herald helped him at his side. While careful these the gentle coursers joined, sad Hecuba approached with anxious mind, a golden bowl that foamed with fragrant wine, libation destined to the power divine, held in her right, before the steed she stands, and thus consigns it to the monarch's hands. Take this, and pour to Jove, that safe from harms his grace restore thee to our roof and arms. Since victor of thy fears and slighting mine, heaven or thy soul inspires this bold design, Pray to that God, who high on Ida's brow surveys thy desolated realms below, his winged messenger to send from high and lead thy way with heavenly augury. Let the strong sovereign of the plumy race tower on the right of yon ethereal space. That sign be held, and strengthened from above, boldly pursue the journey marked by Jove. But if the God his augury denies, suppress thy impulse, nor reject advice. Tis just, said Priam, to the sire above to raise our hands, for who so good as Jove? He spoke, and bade the attendant handmaid bring the purest water of the living spring. Her ready hands the ewer and basin held, then took the golden cup his queen had filled. On the mid-pavement pours the rosy wine, uplifts his eyes, and calls the power divine. O first and greatest, heaven's imperial lord, on lofty Ida's holy hill adored, to stern Achilles now direct my ways, and teach him mercy when a father prays. If such thy will, dispatch from yonder sky thy sacred bird, celestial augury. Let the strong sovereign of the plumy race tower on the right of yon ethereal space. So shall thy suppliant, strengthened from above, fearless pursue the journey marked by Jove. Jove heard his prayer, and from the throne on high dispatched his bird, celestial augury. The swift-winged chaser of the feathered game, and known to gods by Prochnos' lofty name, 
wide as appears some palace gate displayed so broad his pinions stretched their ample shade as stooping dexter with resounding wings the imperial bird descends in airy rings a dawn of joy in every face appears the morning matron dries her timorous tears swift on his car the impatient monarch sprung the brazen portal in his passage rung the mules preceding draw the loaded wain charged with the gifts Ideus holds the rein the king himself his gentle steeds controls and through surrounding friends the chariot rolls on his slow wheels the following people wait mourn at each step and give him up to fate with hands uplifted eye him as he passed and gaze upon him as they gazed their last now forward fares the father on his way through the lone fields and back to Ilion they great jove beheld him as he crossed the plain and felt the woes of miserable man then thus to hermes thou whose constant cares still succor mortals and attend their prayers behold an object to thy charge consigned if ever pity touched thee for mankind go guard the sire the observing foe prevent and safe conduct him to achilles tent the god obeys his golden pinions binds and mounts incumbent on the wings of winds that high through fields of air his flight sustain o'er the wide earth and o'er the boundless main then grasps the wand that causes sleep to fly or in soft slumber seals the wakeful eye thus armed swift hermes steers his airy way and stoops on hellespont's resounding sea a beauteous youth majestic and divine he seemed fair offspring of some princely line now twilight veiled the glaring face of day and clad the dusky fields in sober gray what time the herald and the hoary king their chariots stopping at the silver spring that circling Ilus ancient marble flows allowed their mules and steeds a short repose through the dim shade the herald first espies a man's approach and thus to priam cries i mark some foe's advance o king beware this hard adventure claims thy utmost care for much i fear destruction hovers nigh our state asks counsel is it best to fly or old and helpless at his feet to fall two wretched suppliants and for mercy call the afflicted monarch shivered with despair pale grew his face and upright stood his hair sunk was his heart his color went and came a sudden trembling shook his aged frame when hermes greeting touched his royal hand and gentle thus accosts with kind demand say whither father when each mortal sight is sealed in sleep thou wanderest through the night why roam thy mules and steeds the plains along through grecian foes so numerous and so strong what couldst thou hope should these thy treasures view these who with endless hate thy race pursue for what defence alas couldst thou provide thyself not young a weak old man thy guide yet suffer not thy soul to sink with dread from me no harm shall touch thy reverend head from greece i'll guard thee too for in those lines the living image of my father shines thy words that speak benevolence of mind are true my son the godlike sire rejoined great are my hazards but the gods survey my steps and send thee guardian of my way hail and be blessed for scarce of mortal kind appear thy form thy feature and thy mind nor true are all thy words nor erring wide the sacred messenger of heaven replied but say conveyst thou through the lonely plains what yet most precious of thy store remains to lodge in safety with some friendly hand prepared perchance to leave thy native land or fliest thou now what hopes can troy retain thy matchless son her guard and glory slain the king alarmed say what and whence thou art who search the sorrows of a parent's heart and know so well how godlike hector died thus priam spoke and hermes thus replied you tempt me father and with pity touch on this sad subject you inquire too much oft have these eyes that godlike hector viewed in glorious fight with grecian blood imbrued i saw him when like jove his flames he tossed on thousand ships and withered half a host i saw but helped not stern achilles ire forbade assistance and enjoyed the fire for him i serve of myrmidonian race one ship conveyed us from our native place polyctor is my sire an honoured name old like thyself and not unknown to fame of seven his sons by whom the lot was cast to serve our prince it fell on me the last to watch this quarter my adventure falls for with the morn the greeks attack your walls 
Sleepless they sit, impatient to engage, and scarce their rulers check their martial rage. If then thou art of stern Pelides' train, the mournful monarch thus rejoined again, Ah, tell me truly where, oh, where are laid my son's dear relics, what befalls him dead? Have dogs dismembered, on the naked plains, or yet unmangled rest his cold remains? O oh, favoured of the skies, thus answered then the power that mediates between God and men. Nor dogs nor vultures have thy Hector rent, but whole he lies, neglected in the tent. This the twelfth evening since he rested there, untouched by worms, untainted by the air. Still as Aurora's ruddy beam is spread, round his friend's tomb Achilles drags the dead. Yet undisfigured, or in limb or face, all fresh he lies, with every living grace, majestical in death. No stains are found o'er all the course, and closed is every wound, though many a wound they gave. Some heavenly care, some hand divine, preserves him ever fair. O'er all the host of heaven, to whom he led a life so grateful, still regard him dead. Thus spoke to Priam the celestial guide, and joyful thus the royal sire replied. Blessed is the man who pays the gods above the constant tribute of respect and love. Those who inhabit the Olympian bower my son forgot not, in exalted power, and heaven, that every virtue bears in mind, even to the ashes of the just is kind. But thou, O generous youth, this goblet take, a pledge of gratitude for Hector's sake. And while the favoring gods our steps survey, safe to Polites' tent conduct my way. To whom the latent god. O king, forbear to tempt my youth, for apt is youth to err. But can I, absent from my prince's sight, take gifts in secret that must shun the light? What from our master's interest thus we draw, is but a licensed theft that scapes the law. Respecting him, my soul abjures the offence, and as the crime I dread the consequence. Thee, far as Argos, pleased I could convey, guard of thy life and partner of thy way. On thee attend, thy safety to maintain, or pathless forests, or the roaring main. He said, then took the chariot at a bound, and snatched the reins, and whirled the lash around. Before the inspiring god that urged them on, the coursers fly with spirit not their own. And now they reached the naval walls, and found the guards repasting, while the bowls go round. On these the virtue of his wand he tries, and pours deep slumber on their watchful eyes. Then heaved the massy gates, removed the bars, and o'er the trenches led the rolling cars. Unseen, through all the hostile camp they went, and now approached Polites' lofty tent. On firs the roof was raised, and covered o'er, with reeds collected from the marshy shore, and fenced with palisades, a hall of state, the work of soldiers, where the hero sat. Large was the door, whose well-compacted strength a solid pine-tree barred of wondrous length. Scarce three strong Greeks could lift its mighty weight, but great Achilles singly closed the gate. This Hermes, such the power of gods, set wide, then swift alighted the celestial guide, and thus revealed, Hear, prince, and understand, thou owest thy guidance to no mortal hand. Hermes I am, descended from above, the king of arts, the messenger of Jove. Farewell, to shun Achilles' sight I fly. Uncommon are such favors of the sky, nor stand confessed to frail mortality. Now fearless enter, and prefer thy prayers. Adjure him by his father's silver hairs, his son, his mother. Urge him to bestow whatever pity that stern heart can know. Thus having said, he vanished from his eyes, and in a moment shot into the skies. The king, confirmed from heaven, alighted there, and left his aged herald on the car. With solemn pace through various rooms he went, and found Achilles in his inner tent. There sat the hero, Alchemus the brave, and great Automedon, attendance gave. These served his person at the royal feast. Around, at awful distance, stood the rest. Unseen by these, the king his entry made, and prostrate now before Achilles laid, sudden, a venerable sight, appears, embraced his knees, and bathed his hands in tears. Those direful hands his kisses pressed, imbrued even with the best, the dearest of his blood. As when a wretch, who conscious of his crime, pursued for murder, flies his native clime, just gains some frontier, breathless, pale, amazed, all gaze, all wonder. Thus Achilles gazed. Thus stood the attendants stupid with surprise, all mute, yet seemed to question with their eyes. Each looked on other, none the silence broke, till thus at last the kingly suppliant spoke. 
Ah, think thou favoured of the powers divine, Think of thy father's age and pity mine. In me that father's reverend image trace, Those silver hairs, that venerable face, His trembling limbs, his helpless person see, In all my equal but in misery. Yet now, perhaps, some turn of human fate Expels him helpless from his peaceful state. Think, from some powerful foe thou seest him fly, And beg protection with a feeble cry. Yet still one comfort in his soul may rise, he hears his son still lives to glad his eyes, and, hearing, still may hope a better day may send him thee to chase that foe away. No comfort to my griefs, no hopes remain, the best, the bravest of my sons are slain. Yet what a race, ere Greece to Ilion came, the pledge of many a loved and loving dame. Nineteen one mother bore, dead, all are dead. How oft, alas, has wretched Priam bled! Still one was left their loss to recompense, His father's hope, his country's last defense. Him too thy rage has slain. Beneath thy steel unhappy in his country's cause he fell. For him through hostile camps I bent my way, For him thus prostrate at thy feet I lay. Large gifts proportioned to thy wrath I bear. O oh, hear the wretched and the gods revere. Think of thy father, and this face behold, See him in me as helpless and as old. Though not so wretched, there he yields to me, The first of men in sovereign misery. Thus forced to kneel, thus groveling to embrace The scourge and ruin of my realm and race, Suppliant my children's murderer to implore, And kiss those hands yet reeking with their gore. These words soft pity in the chief inspire, Touched with the dear remembrance of his sire. Then with his hand, as prostrate still he lay, The old man's cheek he gently turned away. Now each by turns indulged the gush of woe, And now the mingled tides together flow, This low on earth, that gently bending o'er, A father one, and one a son deplore. But great Achilles' different passions rend, And now his sire he mourns, and now his friend. The infectious softness through the heroes ran, One universal solemn shower began. They bore as heroes, but they felt as man. Satiate at length with unavailing woes, From the high throne divine Achilles rose, The reverend monarch by the hand he raised, On his white beard and form majestic gazed, Not unrelenting. Then serene began with words to soothe the miserable man. Alas, what weight of anguish hast thou known, unhappy prince, Thus guardless and alone to pass through foes, And thus undaunted face the man whose fury Has destroyed thy race. Heaven sure has armed thee with a heart of steel, A strength proportioned to the woes you feel. Rise then, let reason mitigate your care, To mourn avails not, man is born to bear. Such is, alas, the God's severe decree. They, only they are blessed and only free. Two urns by Jove's high throne have ever stood, the source of evil one, and one of good. From thence the cup of mortal man he fills, Blessings to these, to those distributes ill. To most he mingles both. The wretch decreed to taste the bad unmixed, Is cursed indeed. Pursued by wrongs, by meagre famine driven, He wanders, outcast both of earth and heaven. The happiest tastes not happiness sincere, But find the cordial draught is dashed with care. Who more than Peleus shone in wealth and power? What stars concurring blessed his natal hour? A realm, a goddess, to his wishes given, Graced by the gods with all the gifts of heaven. One evil yet o'ertakes his latest day, No race succeeding to imperial sway, An only son, and he, alas, Ordained to fall untimely in a foreign land. See him, in Troy, the pious care decline Of his weak age, to live the curse of thine. Thou too, old man, hast happier days beheld, In riches once, in children once excelled. Extended Phrygia owned thy ample reign, And all fair Lesbos' blissful seats contain, And all wide Hellespont's unmeasured main. But since the god his hand has pleased to turn, And fill thy measure from his bitter urn, What sees the sun but hapless heroes falls? War and the blood of men surround thy walls. What must be must be. Bear thy lot, nor shed these unavailing sorrows o'er the dead. Thou canst not call him from the Stygian shore, But thou, alas, mayst live to suffer more. To whom the king, O favoured of the skies, 
Here let me grow to earth, since Hector lies on the bare beach deprived of obsequies. O oh, give me Hector, till my eyes restore his course, and take the gifts. I ask no more. Thou, as thou mayst, these boundless stores enjoy. Safe mayst thou sail, and turn thy wrath from Troy. So shall thy pity and forbearance give a weak old man to see the light and live. Move me no more, Achilles thus replies, while kindling anger sparkled in his eyes. Nor seek by tears my steady soul to bend, to yield thy Hector I myself intend. For know, from Jove my goddess mother came, old Ocean's daughter, silver-footed dame, nor comest thou but by heaven, nor comest alone, some god impels with courage not thy own. No human hand the way to gates unbarred, nor could the boldest of our youth have dared to pass our outworks, or elude the guard. Cease, lest, neglectful of high Jove's command, I show thee, king, thou treadst on hostile land. Release my knees, thy suppliant arts give o'er, and shake the purpose of my soul no more. The sire obeyed him, trembling and o'er-awed. Achilles, like a lion, rushed abroad. Automedon and Alchemus attend, whom most he honored since he lost his friend. These to unyoke the mules and horses went, and led the hoary herald to the tent. Next, heaped on high, the numerous presents bear, great Hector's ransom, from the polished car. Two splendid mantles and a carpet spread they leave, to cover and enwrap the dead. Then call the handmaids, with assistant toil, to wash the body and anoint with oil, apart from Priam, lest the unhappy sire provoked to passion once more rouse to ire the stern Pelides, and nor sacred age nor Jove's command should check the rising rage. This done, the garments o'er the course they spread, Achilles lifts it to the funeral bed. Then, while the body on the car they laid, he groans and calls on loved Patroclus' shade. If in that gloom which never light must know, the deeds of mortals touch the ghosts below, O oh friend, forgive me that I thus fulfill, restoring Hector, heaven's unquestioned will. The gifts the father gave be ever thine, to grace thy manes and adorn thy shrine. He said, and entering, took his seat of state, where full before him reverend Priam sate, to whom, composed, the godlike chief begun. Lo, to thy prayer restored thy breathless son. Extended on the funeral couch he lies, and soon as morning paints the eastern skies, the sight is granted to thy longing eyes. But now the peaceful hours of sacred night demand reflection, and to rest invite. Nor thou, O father, thus consumed with woe, the common cares that nourish life forego. Not thus did Niobe, a form divine, a parent once, whose sorrow equaled thine, six youthful sons, as many blooming maids, in one sad day beheld the Stygian shades. Those by Apollo's silver bow were slain. These, Cynthia's arrows stretched upon the plain. So was her pride chastised by wrath divine, who matched her own with bright Latona's line. But to the goddess, twelve the queen enjoyed. Those boasted twelve, the avenging two destroyed. Steeped in their blood, and in the dust outspread, nine days, neglected, lay exposed to the dead. None by to weep them, to inhume them none for Jove had turned the nation all to stone. The gods themselves, at length relenting, gave the unhappy race the honors of a grave. Herself a rock, for such was heaven's high will, through deserts wild now pours a weeping rill, where round the bed whence Achilois springs, the watery fairies dance in mazy rings. There high on Sipylus' shaggy brow she stands, her own sad monument of woe. The rock for ever lasts, the tears for ever flow. Such griefs, O king, have other parents known. Remember theirs, and mitigate thy own. The care of heaven thy Hector has appeared, nor shall he lie unwept and uninterred. Soon may thy aged cheeks in tears be drowned, and all the eyes of Ilion stream around. He said, and rising, chose the victim you with silver fleece, which his attendants slew. The limbs they sever from the reeking hide, with skill prepare them, and in parts divide. Each on the coals the separate morsels lays, and hasty snatches from the rising blaze. With bread the glittering canisters they load, which round the board Atomidon bestowed. The chief himself to each his portion placed, and each indulging shared in sweet repast. When now the rage of hunger was repressed, the wondering hero eyes his royal guest. No less the royal guest the hero eyes, his godlike aspect and majestic size. Here youthful grace and noble fire engage. 
and there the mild benevolence of age. Thus gazing long, the silence neither broke, a solemn scene, at length the father spoke. Permit me now, beloved of Jove, to steep my careful temples in the dew of sleep, for, since the day that numbered with the dead my hapless son, the dust has been my bed, soft sleep a stranger to my weeping eyes, my only food, my sorrows, and my sighs. Till now, encouraged by the grace you give, I share thy banquet and consent to live. With that, Achilles bade prepare the bed, with purple soft and shaggy carpets spread. Forth, by the flaming lights, they bend their way, and place the couches and the coverings lay. Then he, Now, father, sleep, but sleep not here. Consult thy safety and forgive my fear, lest any Argive at this hour awake to ask our counsel or our orders take, approaching sudden to our opened tent, perchance behold thee and our grace prevent. Should such report thy honoured person here, the king of men the ransom might defer. But say with speed, if aught of thy desire remains unasked, what time the rites require to inter thy Hector. For so long we stay our slaughtering arm, and bid the hosts obey. If then thy will permit, the monarch said, to finish all due honours to the dead, this of thy grace accord. To thee are known the fears of Ilion, closed within her town, and at what distance from our walls aspire the hills of Ide and forests for the fire. Nine days to vent our sorrows I request. The tenth shall see the funeral and the feast. The next, to raise his monument be given. The twelfth we war, if war be doomed by heaven. This thy request, replied the chief, enjoy. Till then our arms suspend the fall of Troy. Then gave his hand at parting, to prevent the old man's fears, and turned within the tent, where fair Briseis, bright in blooming charms, expects her hero with desiring arms. But in the porch the king and herald rest, sad dreams of care yet wandering in their breast. Now gods and men the gifts of sleep partake, industrious Hermes only was awake, the king's return revolving in his mind, to pass the ramparts and the watch to blind. The power descending hovered o'er his head. And sleep'st thou, father? thus the vision said. Now dost thou sleep, when Hector is restored? Nor fear the Grecian foes or Grecian lord? Thy presence here should stern Atrides see, thy still surviving sons may sue for thee, may offer all thy treasures yet contain, to spare thy age, and offer all in vain. Waked with the word, the trembling sire arose, and raised his friend. The god before him goes. He joins the mules, directs them with his hand, and moves in silence through the hostile land. When now to Xanthus' yellow stream they drove, Xanthus, immortal progeny of Jove, the winged deity forsook their view, and in a moment to Olympus flew. Now shed Aurora round her saffron ray, sprang through the gates of light, and gave the day. Charged with the mournful load, to Ilion go the sage and king, majestically slow. Cassandra first beholds from Ilion's spire the sad procession of her hoary sire. Then, as the pensive pomp advanced more near, her breathless brother stretched upon the bier, a shower of tears o'erflows her beauteous eyes, alarming thus all Ilion with her cries. Turn here your steps, and here your eyes employ, ye wretched daughters and ye sons of Troy, if e'er ye rushed in crowds with vast delight to hail your hero glorious from the fight, now meet him dead, and let your sorrows flow, your common triumph and your common woe. In thronging crowds they issue to the plains, nor man nor woman in the walls remains. In every face the selfsame grief is shown, and Troy sends forth one universal groan. At Skea's gates they meet the morning wane, hang on the wheels and grovel round the slain. The wife and mother, frantic with despair, kiss his pale cheek and rend their scattered hair. Thus wildly wailing, at the gates they lay, and there had sighed and sorrowed out the day, but godlike Priam from the chariot rose. Forbear, he cried, this violence of woes. First to the palace let the car proceed, then pour your boundless sorrows o'er the dead. The waves of people at his word divide. Slow rolls the chariot through the following tide. Even to the palace the sad pomp they wait. They weep and place him on the bed of state. A melancholy choir attend around, with plaintive sighs and music's solemn sound. Alternately they sing, alternate flow the obedient tears, melodious in their woe, while deeper sorrows groan from each full heart, and nature speaks at every pause of art. First to the course the weeping consort flew, 
Around his neck her milk-white arms she threw. And, O oh my Hector, O oh my lord, she cries, Snatched in thy bloom from these desiring eyes, Thou to the dismal realms forever gone, And I abandoned, desolate, alone, An only son, once comfort of our pains, Sad product now of hapless love, remains. Never to manly age that sun shall rise, Or with increasing graces glad my eyes, For Ilion now, her great defender slain, Shall sink a smoking ruin on the plain. Who now protects her wives with guardian care? Who saves her infants from the rage of war? Now hostile fleets must waft those infants o'er, Those wives must wait them, to a foreign shore. Thou too, my son, to barbarous climes shall go, The sad companion of thy mother's woe. Driven hence a slave before the victor's sword, Condemned to toil for some inhuman lord, Or else some Greek whose father pressed the plain, Or son or brother by great Hector slain, In Hector's blood his vengeance shall enjoy, And hurl thee headlong from the towers of Troy. For thy stern father never spared a foe. Thence all these tears, and all this scene of woe. Thence many evils his sad parents bore, His parents many, but his consort more. Why gavest thou not to me thy dying hand, And why received not I thy last command? Some word thou wouldst have spoke, Which, sadly dear, my soul might keep, Or utter with a tear, Which never, never could be lost in air, Fixed in my heart, and oft repeated there. Thus to her weeping maids she makes her moan, Her weeping handmaids echo groan for groan. The mournful mother next sustains her part. O oh, thou the best, the dearest to my heart! Of all my race thou most by heaven approved, And by the immortals even in death beloved, While all my other sons in barbarous bands Achilles bound, and sold to foreign lands, This felt no chains, but went a glorious ghost, Free and a hero to the Stygian coast. Sentenced, tis true, by his inhuman doom, Thy noble course was dragged around the tomb, The tomb of him thy warlike arm had slain, Ungenerous insult, impotent and vain. Yet glowst thou fresh with every living grace, No mark of pain or violence of face, Rosy and fair, as Phoebus' silver bow Dismissed thee gently to the shades below. Thus spoke the dame, and melted into tears. Sad Helen next in pomp of grief appears, Fast from the shining sluices of her eyes Fall the round crystal drops, while thus she cries, Ah, dearest friend, in whom the gods had joined The mildest manners with the bravest mind, Now twice ten years, unhappy years, are o'er, Since Paris brought me to the Trojan shore, Oh, had I perished ere that form divine Seduced this soft, this easy heart of mine. Yet was it ne'er my fate, from thee to find a deed ungentle, or a word unkind. When others cursed the authoress of their woe, thy pity checked my sorrows in their flow. If some proud brother eyed me with disdain, or scornful sister with her sweeping train, thy gentle accents softened all my pain. For thee I mourn, and mourn myself in thee, the wretched source of all this misery. The fate I caused, for ever I bemoan. Sad Helen has no friend, now thou art gone. Through Troy's wide streets abandoned shall I roam, In Troy deserted as a port at home. So spoke the fair, with sorrow streaming eye. Distressful beauty melts each stander by. On all around the infectious sorrow grows, But Priam checked the torrent as it rose. Perform, ye Trojans, what the rites require, And fell the forests for a funeral pyre. Twelve days, nor foes nor secret ambush dread, Achilles grants these honors to the dead. He spoke, and at his word, the Trojan trained their mules and oxen harness to the wain, pour through the gates, and felled from Ida's crown, roll back the gathered forests to the town. These toils continue nine succeeding days, and high in air a sylvan structure raise. But when the tenth fair morn began to shine, forth to the pile was borne the man divine, and placed aloft, while all, with streaming eyes, beheld the flames and rolling smokes arise. Soon as Aurora, daughter of the dawn, with rosy luster streaked the dewy lawn, again the mournful crowd surround the pyre, and quench with wine the yet remaining fire. The snowy bones his friends and brothers place, with tears collected, in a golden vase. The golden vase in purple pals they rolled, of softest texture, and inwrought with gold. Last o'er the urn the sacred earth they spread, and raised the tomb, memorial of the dead. 
strong guards and spies till all the rites were done watched from the rising to the setting sun all troy then moves to priam's court again a solemn silent melancholy train assembled there from pious toil they rest and sadly shared the last sepulchral feast such honours ilion to her hero paid and peaceful slept the mighty hector's shade concluding note we have now passed through the Iliad, and seen the anger of Achilles, and the terrible effects of it at an end. As that only was the subject of the poem, and the nature of epic poetry would not permit our author to proceed to the event of the war, it perhaps may be acceptable to the common reader to give a short account of what happened to Troy, and the chief actors in this poem, after the conclusion of it. I need not mention that Troy was taken soon after the death of Hector by the stratagem of the wooden horse, the particulars of which are described by Virgil in the second book of the Aeneid. Achilles fell before Troy by the hand of Paris, by the shot of an arrow in his heel, as Hector had prophesied at his death. The unfortunate Priam was killed by Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles. Ajax, after the death of Achilles, had a contest with Ulysses for the armor of Vulcan, but being defeated in his aim, he slew himself through indignation. Helen, after the death of Paris, married Deiphobus his brother, and at the taking of Troy betrayed him, in order to reconcile herself to Menelaus, her first husband, who received her again into favor. Agamemnon at his return was barbarously murdered by Aegisthus, at the instigation of Clytemnestra his wife, who in his absence had dishonored his bed with Aegisthus. Diomede, after the fall of Troy, was expelled his own country, and scarce escaped with his life from his adulterous wife, Aegealia, but at last was received by Donus in Apulia, and shared his kingdom. It is uncertain how he died. Nestor lived in peace with his children in Pylos, his native country. Ulysses also, after innumerable troubles by sea and land, at last returned in safety to Ithaca, which is the subject of Homer's Odyssey. For what remains, I beg to be excused from the ceremonies of taking leave at the end of my work, and from embarrassing myself or others with any defenses or apologies about it. But instead of endeavoring to raise a vain monument to myself, of the merits or difficulties of it, which must be left to the world, to truth, and to posterity, let me leave behind me a memorial of my friendship with one of the most valuable of men, as well as finest writers of my age and country, one who has tried and known by his own experience how hard an undertaking it is to do justice to Homer, and one whom, I am sure, sincerely rejoices with me at the period of my labors. To him, therefore, having brought this long work to a conclusion, I desire to dedicate it, and to have the honor and satisfaction of placing together in this manner the names of Mr. Congreve and of A. Pope, March 25, 1720. End of the Iliad by Homer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.